Rattle some bolters and pepper them with plasma. Hold the line against the heaving miasma of plague-ridden pox-bearers and maddened cravens, the great enemy intent to crush the blood ravens. But behold the horizon, a neon green flash. It's the ominous necrons come to render all to ash. In the name of the Emperor, Phoenix! Dawn of War was a real-time strategy game released in 2004 by Relic Studios. It is considered by many people to be the best Warhammer 40,000 video game ever made. As time goes on and Warhammer 40,000 and regular Warhammer both continue to get absurd numbers of video games published every year, Dawn of War being the best of them becomes less and less true just based on plain old objective math, not even getting into subjective opinions on the matter. The point is that this may be a very old game, but this is a very loved, very well received, very influential game series. It doesn't need to be the best game, but I know there are lots of people whose journey with Warhammer started with Dawn of War. It has always been one of my favourite games, and I've played at least one campaign from one of the games in this series from start to finish at least once a year since 2004. That's thousands of hours and nearly 20 years straight of pure, solid video game pleasure that this particular series has given me, and unless this video so thoroughly nails down what I love about it that I never want to play it again, I suspect it will continue to deliver for many years to come. I think any devs involved in these games have a hell of a lot to be proud of. This video series is going to be a massive love letter to something I adore, but in the interest of making something that I can actually hope to finish in a reasonable time frame, I need to set some limits and define what the title of the video refers to. I'm just some guy on the internet, so by the canon of Dawn of War, I mean my canon of Dawn of War. So why use the instead of my? because I really like the way it sounds, okay? So with that said, these videos won't cover every Dawn of War game ever released. Just most of them. Perhaps if they are popular, I'll renege on that and make more covering the ones that I miss. But there's actually more reasons for why I'm doing it this way than just time management. And I think anyone already familiar and in love with Dawn of War will get why already. For everyone else, allow me to explain. There are three major Dawn of War titles. They are all real-time strategy games set in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, and they are called Dawn of War 1, 2, and 3. And I bought every single one of these games on release, probably with a pre-purchase in the days when that meant getting some real-life bonus goodies in a store. None of them are straight takes on the RTS genre. All of them have original mechanics and twists when it comes to the gameplay, but you can safely say none of them are turn-based, and all of them involve strategy, so RTS is what I'm calling them although some are more hybrids than others. The first game, more than the others, is closest to what is traditionally called an RTS. The Dawn of War games were mostly very successful and received expansions and DLC, so as follows is a brief timeline of release order and dates of all major Dawn of War titles and expansions. In 2004, we had the original Dawn of War. The first expansion called Winter Assault came in 2005, followed by Dark Crusade in 2006 and Soulstorm in 2008. Then came Dawn of War 2 in 2009, which had two expansions, Chaos Rising in 2010 and Retribution in 2011. Finally, there came Dawn of War 3, released in 2017 as an attempt at reviving the much-loved series. Worth mentioning as well, although I'm definitely not going to discuss it, is the other Warhammer 40,000 game developed by Relic of the same era, Space Marine, released in 2011, which has become super relevant because it's getting a sequel. It's not a Dawn of War game, or even remotely in the same genre, it's kind of a cousin and definitely feels a part of the same zeitgeist and is of a similar quality and vibe. I'm not going to mention it again, although given it is getting this much-deserved sequel, I'll probably cover both of them at some time in the near future. And by near future, I mean sometime in the next couple of years. For this video series, I will only be talking about the run of games from Dawn of War Dark Crusade in 2006 
up to Dawn of War 2 Retribution in 2011. For those that are confused by this, it pretty much boils down to the games I'm leaving out being in no way to me personally enticing as eminently replayable titles that I'll enjoy recording, talking about and picking apart. As said earlier, if there's demand for it I'll make them, but this project is massive even leaving them out, so it's got to be successful if I'm going to in include them, so I can afford to go back to them if that eventuates. With that said, I'll spare some words here as to why I'm doing it this way. Let's just get Dawn of War 3 out of the way. I don't want to waste much time talking about it. It just didn't really nail what made the rest of the game so good. I think a lot of good intentions and ideas went into it, but it missed the mark. I don't personally think it's as bad as some Dawn of War fans decry it for, but it definitely ain't a part of my holy canon of fantastic Dawn of War titles. It's worth playing as a curiosity if you've played the rest of the games and love them, but don't expect to love it as much. As for the original game from 2004 and its expansion Winter Assault, well, these are good games, groundbreaking at their time, the sort of thing I'd fall over myself to cover normally, and if you play the title I'm going to talk about, Dark Crusade, and enjoy it, going back to these first games and playing them is a good idea. The truth is that what those games start gets perfected by Dark Crusade, and as Dark Crusade is a standalone expansion pack, there's no need to play the original Dawn of War and Winter Assault unless you want to experience their campaigns or the difference in the way the factions are balanced and presented. I feel these earliest of games are that little bit more archaic, they don't play quite as well or look quite as good. They have small differences in balance, pace and economy, like how many certain types of units can be built and how much stuff costs, and not to mention new factions and units or lack of if you're going back like I recommend. The jury has always been out on which title nails these kind of changes the best. It's kind of down to personal preference, with consensus leaning to Dark Crusade as the top dog. The crux of it is, though, that their campaigns are a one-off story that once you've played through once, you know and have to forget before replaying it again is interesting. This isn't as true for the more modular campaign of Dark Crusade and the other expansion, Soulstorm. Since the rest of their features, like Skirmishes and the Army Painter, are present in the later standalone expansions that feature more factions and content, it makes that campaign the only draw card to the earlier games, from a 2023 context anyway. I'm not saying I don't recommend playing the campaign through the first two releases, just that if you're new to Dawn of War, or haven't played it since you were a kid and have forgotten most of it, it isn't really the best starting point to get into or back into the game. Although there's no problem if you do wish to play chronologically, and if you do choose to start with OG 04 Dawn of War, it's got a tutorial you can start with even. But I think I'm far from the only Dawn of War fan fanatic that recommends you start with Dark Crusade, even if it doesn't have a tutorial, and revisit the earlier titles if you're hooked and curious. If you aren't invested, they just aren't the series' best shot at wowing you. What you need to know about them for this video is that the original game introduced like 90% of the fundamentals of the game engine, presentation, gameplay and features. As such, whenever I'm talking about that kind of stuff, especially in comparison to other games at the time, keep in mind that most of it first appeared on the scene in 2004 with Dawn of War and not in 2006 with Dark Crusade. Dark Crusade just kind of polishes and perfects it all. The original game also introduces four factions, Space Marine, Orc, Chaos and Eldar. Winter Assault introduced a fifth faction, the Imperial Guard, and teases the Necron faction introduced in Dark Crusade. There's some story stuff, but it doesn't matter. There is connecting lore and characters across the games, but it's hardly crucial to experience any of it in chronological order. It's just not that kind of a game. The story and lore content is great, but the gameplay is king in this series. In other words, if you smash out the campaign map in Dark Crusade and then go play through as Gabrielle Angelos in OG Dawn of War, you aren't going to be confused and you might be more motivated to care about Gabrielle because you really enjoy the game. The plot of the original story is referenced in Dark Crusade, but it doesn't affect the reality of its fun campaign that amounts to painting every territory on the map your faction's colour. 
the only thing you shouldn't do is not play the first two releases at all if you've never played them. Because the events in them do matter overall in terms of the story of the games. But you could do it last if you wanted. Personally, if I wanted to play them all and I wasn't making a video on it, I wouldn't even play Dark Crusade first. I'd play them in reverse chronological order. But that's just me. To reiterate, I've only replayed Dawn of War and Winter Assault like three or four times in my life, whereas I've replayed Dark Crusade and Soulstorm like 20 times each or something. So take that as the basis on what's included in my canon and what's not. Another thing I have to mention before I get properly started is the mods, because I'm not covering them either. As I said before, this is a very popular game series and it has a lot of people making a lot of great content for and around it. There are incredible mods for this game with dedicated scenes and a huge community and multiplayer scene. All of that is outside the scope of this particular video as well. Not only am I not especially engaged with it and thus not the right person to talk about it, it's also already all over YouTube and if you are interested in the mods you are one very short search away from an overwhelming amount of knowledge and exposure for them. So with a few very brief exceptions I won't be talking, talking about the mods much but it is important that you know they exist as for some players they make the game and it is truly remarkable the spectacles of gameplay some mods for this game have achieved. So despite the scope of my own video I do give a big recommendation to go check out the mods, they are a great time. A final major point to cover before we really kick off is to canvas Warhammer 40,000 itself. This is the second video I'm making on a Warhammer 40,000 game and I didn't really give a caveat about this in the last one but I just want to say that I really love Warhammer as a setting but I'm not one of those serious serious fans, I'm one of those casual fans. I know where I fall with Warhammer, like someone who didn't know Warhammer at all would think I'm a massive 40k nerd with vast knowledge of it if they spoke to me about it, but someone who's played the tabletop or read the novels would think I'm a poser who has no idea what I'm talking about. I've played Warhammer video games my whole life, but the last time I had anything to do with a tabletop game, it was still the 90s and my birthdays were counted in single digits. The only codexes and novels I've ever read date from the second edition of the game and I think we're on the 10th edition at the time of writing um, and the, I'm not really the person to quote about the editions of the game as I'm kind of pointing out. See the Dawn of War games in this video series take place concurrent to the 4th and 5th editions of the game I believe. While I've watched plenty of YouTube content on Warhammer like text-to-speech device, snipe and web or lore recap videos, I am no expert on the lore, story, settings or characters. All of my knowledge is secondhand from summaries people who actually bothered to read and play for themselves produced, and I preemptively apologise and submit to those who are more knowledgeable. If I get any of that wrong, feel free to comment, Warhammer nerds. I love you and want to be graced by your disgust at my ignorance. Anyway... The Dawn of War games, I don't believe even at the time they were made, were 100% spot on when it came to the lore and setting, and one thing's for sure, they are massively out of date in terms of what's going on in the 40k setting in 2023. In general though, I think even the most rabid 40k lore master agrees that they absolutely nail the general vibe of the setting. Even if they're missing on some specifics. And if you get your first impressions of the whole gigantic Goliath that is 40k from these games, while it might not be correct in a technical sense, it'll be correct enough in a vibe sense that it'll be a great launching point to get into it, and it always has been. Just don't commit the sin of thinking you actually know anything about it just because you played these games. I think they're more snapshots of representations of 40k than gospel canon depictions of the setting. The really big bold points that make something 40k are correct, with the developers not really sweating the small, or sometimes even the medium stuff. I'll talk more about this angle on the games as we go through them, because I think a lot of people out there owe their initial fascination for 40k to, Dawn of, to a Dawn of War game, and it's interesting to talk about why, why that is. So. 
good news is it shouldn't matter much if you've never encountered anything Warhammer 40k related before, but even if you aren't into Warhammer and it repulses you and you don't want to be into Warhammer, these games are still more than good enough in terms of their gameplay that they're worth playing anyway. But be warned, they are, to a degree, inseparably bound up with their setting and lore to the point where if 40k really does rub you the wrong way, there's like a 20% chance you might not be able to stand playing them, even though the gameplay rules. Also, obviously, there'll be spoilers ahead, if you care about that kind of thing for such an old series. So, to summarise the intro and repeat one last time, this video series is only covering the main single player campaigns of the games from Dawn of War Dark Crusade in 2006 up to Dawn of War 2 Retribution in 2011, as well as the usual dusting of context, comparison and analysis. There's oodles of multiplayer goodness to be had with these games and their mods, but I assume if you're that hooked you won't need me to figure that part out. And finally, I love Warhammer 40k in a casual sense only, and I'm not an expert, so don't quote me on matters to do with the story setting and fluff. All that behind us, on to part one, Dark Crusade. First up, this isn't a hard game to get running in 2023. Something I've always loved about this game is how reliable and easy it has been to play on pretty much every system I've ever tried it on. It isn't, however, like, say, Red Alert 3, for example, an old game that just works out of the box with no effort. You do need to address a few little things first. And don't worry, it's only a couple of tweaks and not a whole process like some games. First thing is the camera zoom mod. I've used this since like 1080p became a standard resolution, and if you play multiplayer, you might want to tell people you're using it as it's not playing the game vanilla, and it would convey an advantage. But to me, it is essential. More of a fix than a mod. I honestly find the default zoom level unplayable. This mod used to be on ModDB and was just a quick Google away, but this time around I found it harder to find than usual. So I'll put a link in the description to the Steam community guide that hosted the Dropbox link that I found it on. And also as a way of crediting the person who is hosting it now. And you know, it's a useful guide on that Steam community page. You should probably read it anyway. All of Dawn of War 1 and 2 and their expansions would be awesome candidates to package in reasonably priced remasters. And by that, I mean remasters where all relevant expansions and DLC are inclusive for one cheap price and not released separately and extortively, and where they just fix a few things and make it run on modern systems and change basically nothing else. The only big change this game strictly needs is support for a modern resolution and zoom level out of the box, or download as it were. Speaking of the resolution, being from 06 it's obviously not been made to deal with modern resolutions. As a result, if you have a 4K screen and want to use a 4K resolution you might have some problems in regards to text size. I'm going to tell you a little story now. I personally wanted to play this game for a video because I was going on holidays with my laptop and I don't have a chunky gaming laptop with a separate GPU but one of those slim portable multifunction integrated graphics hybrid laptops. I thought being such an old game but one I love, Dawn of War would be a perfect game to play on holiday that my graphically underpowered laptop could handle. Crucially though, it has a 4K screen. It's actually my only device with a 4K screen because I'm too poor to prioritise one for my desktop PC. Go figure. I mean, I really want one, don't get me wrong, and you probably noticed that all my recordings are in 1080p already, but it's still a little out of my reach for the moment. Suffice to say, the 4K screen introduces an issue where all of the fonts in the game are suddenly tiny and unreadable. Upon Googling, there is a way, way less information and people fixing this than I had hoped. Much like the zoom level mod, it seems this game is finally waning enough in people's interest that these kind of basic fixes are no longer abundant. So, fingers crossed for a competent remaster. Anyway, I've put another link in the description to a different Steam community page that goes into how to fix this on 4K screens. A little bit more involved than the Zoom mod, but nothing trickier than extracting some files and editing some numbers in Notepad. 
Anyway, I did play some of Dark Crusade on that holiday, but decided not to use that footage, and I abandoned the gameplay footage from my holiday, as fun as it was. One more mod I'm using is Increase Fog Distance and Sky Radius, which I've linked to in the description, hosted on Nexus Mods. This one addresses a bug that the Zoom Out mod introduces that makes the Fog of War make stuff it shouldn't disappear at max zoom out. I've actually never used this mod before and always just put up with it by keeping my zoom level that one notch under where the bug kicks in. So that's an option for you too, but hey, it works and is a welcome fix to something that's annoyed me forever. And it has a real cool bonus where you can basically see the whole map rendered from any angle. I enjoyed using it so much, I would go so far as to say it is an essential mod for me now. Highly recommended. And uh, that's it for all you have to do to get this game up and running. Dark Crusade introduces two new factions to Dawn of War. To the previous five already mentioned, Space Marine, Chaos, Orc, Eldar and Imperial Guard. The new factions are the creepy undead Terminator-esque Necrons and the blue space alien Pew Pew Laser anime robot piloting Tau. I can tell you, in 2006, an RTS with seven distinct factions that all played differently from each other, but cohesively fit into the same game setting, with, I mean, not perfect balance, but balance enough, and was multiplayer, was just mind-blowing. It was incredible. We used to play it at LAN parties all the time for years, and I think it's a big reason why the game is still so beloved to this day. Having three distinct asymmetrical factions at the time had become the StarCraft certified gold standard for an RTS, with the two other common approaches having just two huge opposing factions like Command and Conquer or Warcraft, or having heaps of factions that mostly drew from the same giant tech tree with small variations like Age of Empires. Dark Crusade has seven distinct asymmetrical factions, and while they do have underlying patterns and systems that govern them all, they still feel in their gameplay, aesthetic and presentation distinct and individual from one another. It's a huge draw card for this game and lies at the core of its replayability, and we'll learn later they very wisely developed the campaign around this draw card. In this way, Relic was genius in their handling of the strengths of the Warhammer 40k IP. 40k has so many video games. Even when OG Dawn of War came out in 04 and I was 15 years old, I'd already played a half dozen other Warhammer games on PC. And generally, they weren't great games, with Fire Warrior in 2003 being a particular disaster. Warhammer 40k games generally had low expectations and a bad reputation at the time, even though I think anyone who was aware of the setting could see the potential success of a marriage between video games and 40k. 40k is just so ridiculously video game-esque in the first place. Why did most 40k games kinda suck? Dawn of War blew everybody away, and Relic was so smart to take advantage of some of the things 40k just naturally already has as advantages. One of those big things is heaps of different customizable factions that represent heaps of different styles, emotions, moods, and ideas. So long as you're down with the future being grim, dark, and full of war, there's something for everybody. From spooky zombie robots to pew pew aliens, cockney Mad Max mushrooms, or zealous genocidal space knights. Before you even start making your game, you already have a setting and many other games to draw on with a vast variety of competing ideas and factions in a cohesive framework. And on top of that, you are encouraged fundamentally to paint and make up your own and continue to invent and twist it to suit yourself. This is surely one of the strongest appeals of Warhammer in general. While I understand why in the limited time, budget and scope of most video games, you might just focus on one or two of the pre-written factions, like the amazing turn-based 40k game Mechanicus, for example. But for the occasional developer that goes big with the setting and does indeed take advantage of the enormity of factions and interests being juggled there, well, when they nail it, it's amazing. Cough, cough, total war, cough, cough. It's all right there to be taken advantage of. Relic has just pulled it off with Dawn of War. 
They started with four factions and managed to introduce another three in the two subsequent years in expansions. Then another two popped up later with Soulstorm, but we'll get to that in another video. In combination with the Army Painter, you even got a taste of being able to customise your own factions. And while all it's good for is multiplayer and custom skirmishes, when I was a kid, I used to love coming up with my own armies, painting them in the Army Painter and downloading custom badges, symbols and banners for them from the internet, naming them and using them to kill my friends at the LAN party. It is one of those kind of old school extras that I really miss being default with games. So in order to make seven factions work in an RTS campaign, Relic went with a turn-based board game style overworld campaign map. It had been done before, but it wasn't exactly common at the time for an RTS either. It's far from the most complex example of one of these style of turn-based overworld maps, but it's got a few things going on that add a sprinkle of depth and strategy to it. It's not very big either, but nor does it represent a small amount of content. Each territory does only correspond to a single RTS map, so that part is deeply repetitive. But fortunately, the interaction between all the different factions provides all the unpredictable spice I've ever needed to make the game interesting, so I don't mind the repetitive maps. Also, on the harder difficulty, map knowledge is kind of essential, but it's a hard difficulty. It's intended for people who beat the game on normal difficulty, so map knowledge is assumed. There are heaps more maps in the skirmish and multiplayer mode, and heaps of third-party ones available to download, but they aren't a part of the campaign, and in general with all the Dawn of War games in this video series, extremely repetitive maps is a central part of how the game's campaign works. Kind of like how map knowledge is essential to playing Counter-Strike, but with AI orcs calling you a zoggin git instead of actual 12 year olds calling you a noob. Don't worry, the campaigns are always designed in such a way that if you don't have the map knowledge already, you get the opportunity to play the maps in context where you don't need it yet, or it'll be offset in some other way. To an extent, at least. After a certain amount of time playing any given campaign, any advantage around this will evaporate. So if you've never played before, maybe start on an easier difficulty at first and then try hard later. I will be playing on hard, of course. I can't remember how to play any other way, and there is much about this choice that will influence the meta on how I approach this game, and thus may pass on to you. I'd like to make an aside right now, and make a typical YouTube disclaimer about my video game skill. I've played these games a lot, but outside of lands when I was a teen, I've never really played the multiplayer much, and I'm not across the meta in that sense, nor have I ever really engaged with guides or the wider community on those points. All advice I give in regards to how to play this game are conclusions and strategies I came to myself based on my own experience. I'm trying my best, but if I'm an unaware noob giving bad advice, please feel free to roast and correct me in the comments. But here the strats I outlined always worked for me, so I pass them on hoping they'll also work for you. Anyway, back to the map. It is indeed not a gigantic overworld map, but it is a tightly designed little map, and every faction, including yourself, has a stronghold that, if conquered, knocks them out of the game. And let me tell you, these stronghold maps can take a while each, depending on your own will to cheese them, of course. If you dawdle and turtle, a stronghold map can take two plus hours each. I personally probably would rarely finish one in under an hour, with an hour and a half to two and a half hours being typical for me but I do love to waste time building point pointless impractical turtle defense lines in this game, so your mileage may vary. Nevertheless, to knock out all your enemy strongholds and win the game, I reckon takes around 15 hours per faction. Times that by 7 and Dark Crusade can net you a good 105 hours of content and is highly replayable provided you can handle the repetition of the maps. To navigate the overworld map, you get a hero unit who waltzes about conquering and defending territories. Each territory brings you an income you can use for a variety of advantages, and allows you to unlock for purchase an honor guard unit that joins your hero in combat. Some territories or provinces, instead of an honor guard unit, have a super special extra advantage that makes them valuable to contest. Also, your hero unit earns war gear items for achieving various milestones in relation to your campaign. 
that make they make your hero unit far more dangerous and deadly, as well as often blinging them up good and proper. There's basically no plot to any of this aside from an opening cinematic explaining that all seven factions want control of this planet called Cronus for various extremely thinly contrived reasons. This being 40k, none of these factions have ever put more thought into conquering a planet than they have given to the average fart, so it's nice that they try to put reasons in at all. Aside from this, the plot is in your actions and how the game plays out. You do get a nice little bit of colourful, fluffy explanation every time you conquer an enemy or attempt to attack an interesting territory. And when you win, you get a cool little conclusion cinematic, wrapping up your faction's endgame for Cronus. As mentioned before, the plot and lore elements are fun and are delivered and presented well, but gameplay is king here and this game revolves around it. I can't not mention the guy who narrates all the ex exposition in this game. He just delivers it with this voice that might be the most 40k narration of all time. It is extremely fun to imitate. Have a listen. For others' claims, and sowing destruction in its wake. The Eldar, ancient enemies of the Necrons, emerged from their webway to pursue their own agenda on Cronus. And last came the Space Marines. Finest and most uncompromising of the Imperium soldiers. Seeing a world beset by aliens and heretics, they undertook a great purge. A dark crusade had begun. It could only end with the total victory of one of these factions and the total defeat of all others. I think that's all you need to know about how the campaign world map works for the moment. There's a bit more to wrap your head around, but we'll get to that in just a moment as we start on the blow-by-blow. Blow. So, it's going to work like this. I will start with the Space Marine campaign and use it to explain how the rest of the game works and how I go about beating the game. I will then do a run-through with all the other factions. You can play through with whatever faction you like in any order. I'll just be up front and say the Imperial Guard are my overall favourite faction to play in Dawn of War, but I find the Eldar to be the finest faction to beat the campaign with. As such, I'll be saving their runs for last. I'll start with the Space Marines because they are kind of the ultimate intended middle ground, post the child, learn the game standard to which the other factions are compared. If you've never played before, I recommend you also start with the Space Marine and on one of the easier difficulties. But by all means, whatever order is the most fun for you is the right one. Like all factions, it starts with a faction-specific opening cinematic, touching on the motivation and context for that particular faction's presence on Cronus. That's what you can see playing right now for the Space Marines. They are brief and few, so enjoy them while they last. I think it's neat the way they're made with the in-game footage, jank and all. And uh, just note, this game had some popular machinima back in the day. So one tip, other than getting rid of these tool tips immediately, is to hit this button in the bottom left-hand corner and make the map a whole bunch more digestible because of the colour coding of the factions. I never play without this option on. You can see from this footage from before the very first move of the Space Marine campaign that when you attack a territory, you are presented with a few options and screens. It will all become a bit clearer soon, but there is an archive button, which gives you a little bit of, a little bit of fluffy lore text to read. Just an optional extra tidbit I thought I'd point out. By all means, ignore it. I'm going to. When you attack, you are presented with a loading screen that takes you into the RTS portion of the game. From the moment you hear that deep brass blasting, if you are on hard, you have got to be producing units and building and issuing orders from the get-go. Dawn of War, rather than use resources like gold from a gold mine or wood from trees or credits from a power structure or something like that, streamlines the resource system in a way that has always held great appeal for me. It has only two resources. Up in the left-hand corner in blue you have requisition, and in green you have power. The other two boxes and numbers display population caps on your infantry and vehicles respectively. I love the name requisition. 
I think it's a really clever way to do things. In order to get requisition, you must capture strategic points around the map. There, there are these weird mini missile silo looking things that open up and you plant a flag in them and like a computer console raises out of them and they are ostensibly about communication or something. Anyway, despite the visuals, it is really clever because rather than have a specific resource like credits or gold, Requisition just skips the whole fake economy concept altogether and says, this blue number is just straight up how much you can actually deploy on the battlefield, on the battlefield right this instant. You're a cohesive army with supply lines. When your frontline commander wants something, you try to get them in. But obviously it takes X amount of time to hustle a squad into combat readiness and then into a dropship, or to configure and transport your tank and so on. Requisition rams this concept into the concept of an RTS co economy and it's awesome. So, because you get more requisition, and more requisition faster by capturing and then fortifying strategic points around the map, it both encourages you to be aggressive in your map exploration as an RTS player, but in terms of the setting, it also makes sense because you can afford to requisition more in total and faster as you acquire more territory and infrastructure and your command structure and supply lines are then able to more effectively prioritize deploying resources for you. This is great. It simplifies the whole concept of RTS economies and ties it into a really fun gameplay loop. Do you risk overcommitting your forces too early to nab those extra points near your enemy? Do you turtle a bit and risk your enemy getting those extra points and completely outscaling your economy? When you take a strategic point, you aren't just expanding and fortifying your army and increasing your own economic power, you are also actively denying your enemies both economic power and territory. You can use them to create defensive lines you can fall back on, or to choose choke points or create forward bases. It really is a very graceful little scheme that cuts to the heart of what makes RTS a fun style of game to play. There are also three types of strategic point. Regular points are worth the least requisition but the most common, and they can be fortified with upgradable defensive and reconnaissance structures called listening posts that also increase the amount of requisition you receive but can be expensive and time consuming to invest in. Then there are critical points, which you can't build listening points on, but are worth more requisition than standard points, and are usually placed in critical points of any given map, hence the name. Sometimes they might relate to a mission objective, like capturing and holding three critical points for a few minutes wins you that map, but not in the Dark Crusade campaign. Finally, there are relic points, which tend to be a little bit out of the way on the map, and you can fortify relic points with listening points. But they are major strategic assets because you can only access your super units called relic units when you possess one. As a result, capturing one from an enemy may become a self-directed priority objective. The same for defending your own one. Another great little feature that binds map expansion to your progression up your tech tree. The other resource, power, is a bit more straightforward. Of the two, it's the more late game resource that helps you get more powerful heavy infantry vehicles and buildings. You get it from building power plants, which always cost no power, but some requisition. They tend not to be cheap, but also not expensive, and ignoring power is a great way to lose. But over-investing in it too early can be a great way to completely blow the early game as well. It does mean that crippling your enemy's power grid can be an option, but since power is almost always built in the enemy's base right by their HQ, and destroying your enemy's HQ is the win condition in the campaign, if you are in that situation you often may as well just destroy your enemy's HQ and ignore the power plants. But it can have its uses. Every faction in this game has its own cool animations and flavour. Every faction has its own styling on the UI and a different way of constructing buildings. Space Marines literally design their buildings to be shot into the ground from orbit and assembled on site by their builder unit servitors. All of the buildings and models, animations, effects and so on in this game are absolutely incredible. 
No detail has been overlooked or spared. And even though the graphics are well and truly in the category of quite primitive 3D these days, it doesn't matter. I still think it looks amazing because so much passion, care and love has gone into every tiny little detail of the presentation of this game. The maximum potential of its ancient engine has been milked dry to incredible effect. As you will see throughout this video, the spectacle this game produces is still enthralling. I especially love the way infantry gets blown all over the place and gets back up and runs into the fight. Speaking of infantry, unlike many other RTS of its era, Dawn of War produces infantry in squads that you can then reinforce with additional members and leaders, attach heroes to, which I admit I rarely do, and upgrade the weapons of. This combined with the focus on detailed fluffy animations gives Dawn of War a bit of a slower pace than many RTS in terms of its battles. A squadron of any unit can have longevity and while certain members of the squadron are being executed in cool sink kill animations or you are dropping models from intense heavy bolt of fire or similar, you get a lot of chances to fall back and reinforce. If just one model from your squadron survives any particular clash, you can retreat them to a safe spot and slowly build the squadron back. Not for free, of course, and reinforcing too many squadrons simultaneously can be the number one reason you can tank your requisition for ages. By bringing this tabletop-inspired format to RTS results in gameplay that encourages fun, multi-stage spectacular battles that leave the land littered with bodies and smoking craters as your forces collide, take a little ground, pull back, regroup and collide again in ever more intense and desperate sorties. Combine this with strategic points and some games become waves back and forth as you slowly crawl your territory forward, reinforcing strategic points into forward bases until your slogging match finally tips your economy over the edge and you can overwhelm your enemy. Those kind of slogging matches are the, both the best and worst of this game. At its best it almost feels like World War I is described sometimes, clawing forward, forward an inch at a time against mud, blood and bodies while your men snatch glory and victory from the enemy. At its worst, it's a frustrating, boring, never-ending stalemate against an overwhelming swarm of AI drones. Fortunately, the latter only happens if you screw up and put yourself in a highly unfavourable scenario, or let the AI get into a position where it has outmaneuvered and out-economied you past the point of no return. So, I don't really hold those moments against the game, as that's just what losing looks like here. A clever player will rarely find themselves in that mire. Like older RTS, this game is designed to be played from an isometric point of view, but is fully 3D and can be played and viewed from any angle and zoom distance in real time. Although there is some particular jank clipping issues with units shooting through cliffs and hills and similar scenarios that reveal the limitations around this method at the time. It is a fully 3D RTS, but it plays like an isometric one, kind of kind of giving it that tight, snappy gameplay edge of classic RTS with all the cinematic splendour of the later 3D ones. One thing to note about Dark Crusade's campaign in particular is that it is the only Dawn of War campaign with persistent buildings. So if you conquer a territory, any structure you build will stay there. And if you have to later defend this territory, you can use this fact to skip to near the top of your tech tree instantly. On hard, you have to do this, as if the enemy has even a mildly substantial army, and especially if they have a big one, they will rush you immediately, and I mean opening 30 seconds of the game immediately, and you can be caught entirely without a defensive army, should your commander be off on the other side of the continent. So, I thoroughly recommend not following through and destroying your enemy HQ as fast as you can. Rather, cripple them economically early and then fall back to a, to a bottleneck outside their base and keep them in check while you turtle around building yourself substantial infrastructure and fortifications. I consider a double HQ with all 12 maximum building cap power plants the bare minimum and would in general recommend at the very least two sets of every structure. Each H HQ usually grants you six power plants and I think six turrets. 
So if you've got two HQs, you can have 12 power plants and 12 turrets. You don't have to do this. And if you don't do this, the game is still good and sort of has this cool incremental picking up where you left off feeling to it. And it might even save you a bunch of time and cut down those hours. But if you never want to have to lose a province, going all out on the turtle the first time you conquer it is the way. On the other hand, if you take a province and you know for certain that you'll never have to defend it, you can just rush the enemy HQ and take them out straight away, sometimes letting you knock over a map in two to five minutes. Turtling like this early is also a very good way to take your time getting to know your faction. You can read what every research option does, deploy one of each squad, check out all your hero's abilities, and in general, begin to get an idea of, an idea of how you are going to go about using the options available to you to destroy your enemies. Also, highly recommend downloading the manual for this too. A fundamental thing to wrap your head around is damage types. There are four damage types in this game that everything has at least one type of each, if not multiple. Those damage ta type tags are infantry, heavy infantry, vehicle and building. Certain weapons are effective or ineffective against certain damage types. Because of the inherently durable squad base system, this game is all about concentrated fire. If you can successfully direct the appropriate damage type in a sufficiently concentrated hit toward the appropriate unit, you can completely negate their durability and wipe them out fast. The enemy can do this to you as well. For example, plasma guns. They are excellent against heavy infantry. Space marines, being power armoured super soldiers, are heavy infantry. Having three or four squads fully loaded out with plasma guns and concentrating their fire on a single space marine squad will absolutely melt them in seconds. But even if you end up in that situation, you have options. A melee squadron, if it gets into melee range, can tie up a squadron in close quarters combat, preventing them from firing. Or a heavy support weapon like an artillery piece can disrupt squadrons and send them flying. Or well, some units might have a special ability that could help. Or you charge a heavily armoured vehicle, hero or relic unit in first to draw fire while the rest of your army gets into place. And there are more ways than that too. This is a game that builds its factions around and rewards synergistic tactics and it never stops feeling good pulling them off. And every faction is different in the way it approaches these scenarios. There's also morale, which almost all infantry and heavy infantry have, but buildings and vehicles don't. If a squadron loses morale, they become ineffective and falling back or using an ability will often be required to regain their effectiveness. Some weapons like flamers also damage morale fast and can be used to great effect to break up enemy armies. There are also stealth mechanics with some units able to go invisible, which is referred to as infiltration in this game except for those units specially marked as detector units. So make sure you always know which of your faction's detector units, otherwise infiltrated units can ruin your day. This goes double if you're facing Eldar who can infiltrate their buildings as well. The Space Marines are the middle children. They are tough, durable units that have good mobility options and versatile access to damage types, although middling speed. The regular Space Marine Squadron can get weapons to deal with any damage type and as a result they are kind of the most generalist army in the game. One little aside to note with them, more on the lore side of things, is the depiction of bolters in this game just kind of has them firing and sounding like they are regular machine guns. I wouldn't want to ever change that. It fits this particular game perfectly and I have a feeling the engine probably couldn't do any better, so I respect whoever at Relic made the call to make them that way, but you kind of have to forget everything you've ever heard about bolters, so sorry 40k fans, that's one of the bits of this game where being a video game mattered more than being Warhammer. Incidentally, they knocked it out of the park for Dawn of War 2, so Relic really did care. 
I also want to take this diversion to, in general, praise the sound effects and music and voice work in this game. I think when I speak about this game being influential to the 40k fandom, I think that sound is where it is at its strongest. Judging by how often Dawn of War voice clips, music and sound effects are remixed in memes and YouTube videos, I'd be willing to wager with a few notable exceptions this game series is the singularity moment for 40k in terms of what the setting sounds like, especially for the faction's characters. It wasn't the first game, far from the last, but I think it's the one that hangs over the head of every other 40k game, and the one that the most fans hear in their own heads when they read and play 40k stuff. The sound team on this game have pulled off a masterwork, and it is honestly worth playing just to hear Squad Broken, or Thank you, Machine Spirit, for our safe arrival, or Orcs, 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 Orcs. I know they didn't necessarily come up with all of the material in the first place, but their renditions of it, I think, are just iconic and defining in the public consciousness. So, taking our attention to the footage in the here and now, based on that, bottleneck and turtle strategy that I outlined to take advantage of the persistent building, you can see me doing it here. I locked the Eldar into their base while I checked out most of what the Space Marine faction had to offer. It was a very epic turtle session, and you'll get used to seeing those, where I made sure to build lots of Ford production facilities and lay lots of mines and turrets so that when I had to defend later, I would have an easy time even against the big honor guard opening game rushes. Once satisfied with my fortifications, I will then choose to wipe my enemy's HQ and get booted to the victory screen, where it informs me of the spoils of victory, a piece of war gear and an honor guard unit. If you mouse over them, you get more information, such as what other conditions earn you war gear, and both fluff and tactical details about the Honor Guard unit. Honor Guard are units, squads, and vehicles that start with your commander and HQ on an RTS map. Choosing your war gear is heaps of fun and an excellent hook to keep you conquering. You get to play Grim Dark Dress Up and grant your hero huge buffs and stat boosts through overpowered equipment. I tend to go for stuff that makes your hero a detector first if it's available, followed by big HP and mobility buffs, and then big damage buffs at the end. Obviously, go whatever order you please, but in this case, I go with the teleporter first, because I know it will be the most immediate help for my strategy. So... If you would be so kind as to allow me to bring the teleporter war gear up in a few paragraphs time, that would be much appreciated. Next, we are back on the planetary map. You also have planetary requisition up in the top left hand corner, used to purchase honor guard units and other buildings, and units for, poten for a potential upper hand in the opening minutes on the RTS map. You can also buy extra defensive squadrons you start with upon having your territory attacked, allowing you to defend the inevitable honor guard rush from your opponent. You earn more planetary requisition every turn by having more provinces. Each province has a planetary requisition income associated with it, so having more provinces is more planetary requisition every turn. Your enemies can also buy defences and honor guard units, but it doesn't seem to be so tied to the amount of territories and planetary re requisition they have. It seems to be more tied to time and how well you, the player, are doing. In all my years playing this game, I have never had my own stronghold even attacked by the AI, and I've never lost the game entirely. I'm very curious, in fact, what even happens when you are on the defensive in a stronghold map of your own. Because of this, I suspect the developers of aiming the AI here to simulate a difficulty curve as you overcome each faction and conquer the planet. You get a board game type thing with structure and rules and the AI gets modified to present you with increasing challenges as your army becomes more and more powerful. 
So, in the late game, even if your enemy has almost no territories, they tend to still get giant honor guard armies, and are able to replenish them fast. So, watch out for that. I don't know if it's true for certain, or the specific mechanics of how it all works, but it it, if it is as I suspect, maybe it's one of the reasons I find this game so replayable. The right amount of challenge with the least amount of frustration. So provinces all have a defensive value on them, between 1 and 10. The larger, the more resistance when you attack. Most important is to pay attention to when they go from 5 defense to 6 defense. This is the difference between facing an RTS map with one opponent, or facing it with two opponents. This means you are in a 2v1 scenario where the enemy can level literally double your unit cap and it is imperative that on hard difficulty you do not let a situation like that get out of hand because it is literally impossible to win against double your unit cap without help. Hence tactics if you need to attack a province with a score greater than 6 that involve rushing your honor guard to annihilate one of the two opponents in the opening minutes of the game so that you are free to tussle with the other one at your leisure. Also, it is important on the global map to employ strategy where you try and prior prioritize territories so that you fight as few 6 plus defense scores on key provinces as possible. Now, because I'm not about to find out what happens when you lose, there's a strategy I use to ensure victory in this game. There are several territories on the map that don't net you on a guard when you beat them, but instead get you a special ability. These maps even get their own special fluffy flavor text when you attack them. There are six of these territories. Most of them are good and worth getting, but some of them are worth getting more than others. There are two that are worth grabbing as fast as possible, no matter which faction you are or where you start, and are basically the pivotal crux to winning the game. The abilities you want first are the Spaceport and Fury. The Spaceport lets you move to or attack any territory on the map from any other territory. They don't have to be adjacent if you have the Spaceport with the exception of strongholds, which you have to move to the adjacent territory first before you can attack. And then there's Fury, which, let, which lets you move or attack twice in a turn. As I'm sure you can tell already, these two in combination are incredibly effective. It also just so happens that each of these two territories has a win condition that you can cheese no matter what faction versus faction or your honor guard situation. Well, at least in the early game, and you are always going to get these territories early. While we're talking about the special ability territories, there's one which is super special and weird, and its win condition is a very particular outlier. It's a mountain region called the Hyperion Peaks, and it's so mountainous that you have to attack with a single armoured column and no reinforcements or support, which makes no sense in a game where you have spaceships and orbital delivery of buildings, but here's another point where being a video game is more important than making sense. I think it's better they give you this spicy level and half us an excuse as to why it's here than not give it to you. The territory is clearly here for variety, and it adds an interesting arrhythmic section to the campaign. It can be brutally difficult, or a complete walk in the park, depending on your faction. I recommend either attacking it very early at its lowest defensive strength of 7, or attacking it right at the end when it inevitably has 10 defense, but you have your whole honor guard. And it is almost always held by the orcs unless you're playing as the orcs although very occasionally another faction will take it before you get to attack it it has the special ability of forward bases which is a good special ability that can help you win the game but also it isn't a particularly necessary special ability and sometimes the difficulty of the Hyperion Peaks outweighs the necessity of grabbing forward bases. So it's kind of your call. 
there are three other special abilities. I would always recommend leaving the territory that has a bulwark as the special ability till towards the end. The reason for this is if you turtle in good defenses like I recommend, the bulwark defensive bonus is basically useless. And quite frankly, you could even skip it if you wanted to. But also, it's a hard territory to beat at the start of the game, where as a large map that starts with a minimum 6 defense score, it'll have you in a 2v1 you can't win because you don't have much honor guard right at the start of the game to rush them. So by the time you've rushed one enemy, even if you've defeated them fast, the other will already be attacking your base with an army you do, your depleted forces couldn't beat or hope to cross the map to get near. You would need an honor guard to simultaneously rush and defend in that scenario, so it's best left till a bit later at the earliest. Although, like I said, I almost always do it last just for completionist's sake, but you could absolutely skip it. The final two abilities I also recommend getting early, although you can afford to sleep on them just a little bit. Increased manpower ups your squadron and vehicle cap, and the industrial production gives you a bonus starting resources. These are both huge advantages and can be pivotal to winning on the RTS map. And both of these territories are tiny maps that are easy wins, even if you let the defense score go from 5 to 6 and it becomes a 2v1 scenario. The macro strat is to grab Fury and the spaceport so you can move and attack anywhere and do two things every turn. Then grab your most essential honor guard at territories while they still have a low defensive score. Then get industrial production and increased manpower. Then concentrate on wiping out strongholds and filling out your honor guard roster. I don't keep exactly to this, and neither should you, but it's the big washy general idea. Most strongholds are doable no matter your honor guard or forward base situation, and more so in the early game while their defense score is low, so often sniping them very early is viable. There is a general vague order I also like to do the strongholds in, but it of course doesn't really matter, and I'll get to that later. So, following that strategy, next turn I attack the spaceport. We get our cool, well-narrated, fluffy little introduction here, which I'll skip for our convenience. The win condition for the spaceport is to collect a certain amount of na neutral servitors from around the map. If a unit walks near one, it heads to the respective base of that unit's faction. So all you have to do to win is to know where all the servitors are and get them as soon as possible. I've replayed this game a million times, I know exactly where they all are, but it wouldn't be hard to save the game first and just scout them out for yourself once you know you know. You could probably risk playing fair on an easier difficulty, but on hard, this is the way. The AI outnumbers you 3v1 on this map, so attempting to out economy or brute force all three of them is not recommended unless your honor guard game is strong. And since I always attack this province so early, I'm always going to be doing this level when I have only one or two honor guard units. I will always do it fast, so I never get time to dig in and make defending this map later easy either. So our macro strategy will also prioritize defending this territory in a way where we don't actually have to fight directly on it. This is also the reason I chose the teleporter for my commander's war gear, as it grants my commander that little bit of extra mobility that lets him jump around this map and grab those servitors fast. I highly recommend that you also prioritize war gear in a way where it allows you to do this map in a fast and efficient way. Not all factions will have war gear that helps you there. Some factions' commanders are naturally already mobile enough. Some factions' basic units are naturally already mobile enough. Space Marines, not particularly. So the teleporter is a huge help on this particular map. 
And skipping ahead a little, look at that. Just as I'm sort of getting engaged, I manage to collect all of the servitors and win the day. This does, of course, as already mentioned, mean that I've barely built anything on this map and I have no advantage from persistent buildings. But we're going to work around that. It's better to just get the map out of the way and not risk that 3v1 scenario getting out of hand. So we end our turn safe in the knowledge that the spaceport is in our hands and we're the only faction that can attack anywhere and that the only enemy hero that can attack our new territory are the Necron. Everyone else isn't in an adjacent territory and a tower blocked by a little wall you can see on the map there. Because my hero is on the territory and has some honor guard, the AI is likely to go for a slightly easier territory as I can potentially rush and he won't be able to pull a 2v1 this early on. It's no guarantee of course, but it works here and the next turn I go for Fury. Fury's win condition is to destroy a certain amount of opposing units before they destroy a certain amount of your units. Usually held by the very slow Necron, unless you were playing as them, there's usually always a strategy to ensure that you hit the kill cap long before the AI does, even if they outnumber you. As an exercise in purely minimizing losses and maximizing kills, it is easy to maximize concentrated fire on the low numbers of the Necron, and you can do things like pull your squads back when they start getting hurt, and because the Necron are so slow, you're going to get away from them every time. With enough kiting, you can pretty much always guarantee a win here. It's also a little bit easier to stretch this one out while you turtle than the spaceport. And occasionally, it even goes a bit awry and you might kill most of the Necrons before you even hit the kill limit and you might find yourself hunting around the map for the last couple of Necrons to clean up. So, in general, it is a little bit less of a priority to defend this territory on the planetary map than the spaceport, but I still have a preference for not actually ever having to fight defensive battles on this map. Once you've conquered the spaceport and Fury Territories, I recommend prior prioritizing keeping enemy heroes away from situations where they can attempt to attack them, or where the cost-benefit analysis is too high for them. This Fury Territory also has another great video game over lore and setting moment. The diegetic in-game excuse for you getting the two attacks in a turn Fury ability is that it is a supernatural warp power that a demon of corn who is bound to the territory you conquer grants to you when you sate its thirst for blood by killing that certain amount of units before they kill a certain amount of yours. The fact that several of the factions would have nothing to do with the corn demon and would actually evacuate and nuke the site from orbit if they even heard a rumour there was one there, well, it doesn't matter because this is a video game before it's a 40k bible. Even better is the idea that Necrons, who are soulless and are uniquely unappealing to the corn demon, are almost always the army you are slaughtering to appease it. Ah well. The Necron lore in particular has pretty much had an entire reboot since this game was published, so my advice is to just embrace the fuzziness of it all and enjoy the game. So skipping to the end of this map, I obviously get to the kill limit and win my fury ability. Hooray! So despite my previously outlined macro strategy, just for the Space Marine faction, and for the sake of demonstration for this video, I will actually be going ahead and conquering every territory on the map before taking any strongholds. I don't recommend doing this yourself, as it gives your enemy maximum opportunity to, to develop their defences, and it forces you to fight as many defensive battles as possible every turn, as you inevitably trap each army in its stronghold. 
which is just time consuming for no reason. You're better off cleaning up factions as you go and denying them their best defences and saving yourself some precious time. I decide to attack the Eldar territory that has the lowest possible score of 1 because it has a veteran assault marine for reward and their mobility would be useful in the early game for capping points. It would also help to keep my mostly adjacent territories defended in one big block. Something to note here is that if your hero is in a territory adjacent to one being attacked, they still start the battle there in person, with their honor guard, and the same goes for the AI. So in this case, the Eldar can defend with their hero and honor guard units that are hanging out next door. Now, let's skip a little ahead in this battle to a bit where I want to show you something. There. Do you see the little ornate white ring around their Farseer and the red ring around my Force Commander? That's how you can tell the big hero from the planetary map and not a generic one you pumped out of your chapel barracks, which both you and the AI can do if your big hero dies. Honor Guard units get the same rings around them, and every faction gets their own design of ring. Honor Guard units cannot be replaced during a battle and can only be replaced on the planetary map with planetary requisition, so being able to see clearly which units are which is a good design cue. Given they didn't have the resources to give all the Honor Guard custom models. Anyway, knowing that this is potentially the map that will lock the Eldar into their stronghold and that I will have to fight heaps of defensive missions here, I'm going to have to fortify a good half of the map before wiping out the Eldar HQ. That's going to look a little something like this. And I just want to show you another little thing with this map where I get, got into a pretty huge spectacular firefight, one of the hallmarks of this game. And that looks a little something like this. Let's just take a moment to admire the impressive sync kill animations, the way people get blown out of combat and then have to rush back in, the impressive array of effects and things just going on. It all kind of adds up to quite the spectacular display. Of course, my Marines have this well in hand, and the Eldar didn't really stand a chance, but it's stuff like this that just keeps bringing me back to the game. Eventually, I decide I've had enough turtling, and I end the Eldar, and I earn some war gear for a 3 to 1 kill ratio, and this time, I pick something for my little feetsies and get a speed boost and some more HP. Knowing the likelihood of fighting defensively on that very large map, I figure more speed for my force commander is a wise tactical choice. I also buy my new veteran assault marine squad from the commander menu. Menu, You'll see me doing plenty of saving. I recommend you do too. I love old school games that just let you no frills, no hassles, save the game when you want to. I end turn and I watch the opponent's turns tick on by and... Lo and behold, would you look at that, it's my turn to defend from the Eldar. Straight away, they want to break out of their territory. Fortunately, I turtled so hard that that goes a little something like this. And this. So, I get war gear for winning my first defense as well. And this time, I choose some big shoulder pads for some big HP gains. It's worth noting that despite having beaten the Eldar, their commander remains in the territory they attacked me from upon losing. Had I attacked them, they would have respawned in their stronghold. This could also be a great moment in a run more mindful of time to take their stronghold out. But instead, I'm going, to, I'm going to attack the Orc Commander and get me a Dreadnought, an excellent piece of mid-game vehicle support that will be invaluable before my opponent's Honor Guard features much in the way of strong anti-vehicle or vehicles of their own. The Orcs attack me in the opening moments of the map, but I am able to fend them off. In this scenario, I advise you to not panic. 
focus on kiting enemy units with tankier units like your commander, while you produce whatever kind of squad you can that can get some kind of concentrated fire onto them, especially when it comes to the killing machine that is the Orc Warboss. He manages to take out my brand new Assault Marine, whom I weep for. It's a small price to pay to break the Orc army at this stage, and get to implement the old bottleneck and fortify strategy. And let's all take a moment to enjoy the gory animations that make the Warboss such a spectacular unit to admire on the battlefield. As you can see, you end up with quite a lot of Orc corpses should you drag out a match against them long enough. And with that aside, now is a good time to give some brief advice about how you go about coordinating and actually managing your armies in battle in this game. In general, every faction will have a squad that can wipe infantry and heavy infantry fast, and a squad that can wipe vehicles fast. When it comes to the Space Marines, these are the same unit. Regular tactical Space Marines can be fitted out with weapons for both scenarios. Heavy bolters and plasma guns for dealing with infantry and heavy infantry, and rocket launchers for vehicles and buildings. They can also use flamers, which are great for dealing with morale and buildings in the very early game. Every faction will also get some melee specialist squads, including at least one I would call a heavy melee squad that can both tank and dish out enormous amounts of punishment. In general, I produce a few of each, and I bind the melee tanks to the one key, the infantry melters to the two key, and the vehicle slash building punisher squads to the three key. That lets you quickly prioritise appropriate targets and draw fire onto your tanky units. While this doesn't work all of the time for every situation or for every faction, it is a general starting point. I also like to bind indirect fire artillery and disruption units to six or seven, actual tank vehicle units to five, and specialist squads like infiltrators or ability slingers or what have you to four. Whereas I usually use eight, nine and zero for shortcutting to buildings. There are also colour-coded stance settings for units that decide whether your guys shoot and chase anything that comes near them till they are dead, which is red, shoot and pursue things a little bit if they come near them, which is yellow, plant their feet and refuse to move but still shoot things that come near them, which is blue, not shoot anything at all that comes near them, which is green, and one that makes them prioritise killing buildings over anything else, which is orange. Useful if you move a death blob into a base crawling with enemies. I personally mostly use yellow and blue and almost never red and sometimes green. It is worth keeping in mind you can set production buildings to produce all of its units default in one of these stances. Very useful to use the blue plant their feet stance when using units defensively as it prevents them from pursuing an enemy and getting killed when you aren't looking. Also, there is a button that lets you choose whether a unit engages with melee, ranged or both, which isn't that handy but comes in useful especially for your commander units and maybe occasionally walker units. Useful if you have, say, a defensive line and you want your walker or commander to use its long-ranged anti-vehicle weapon and not walk out from the defensive line to melee something and risk being the victim of enemy concentrated fire. The Space Marines have a squad of Assault Terminators for heavy melee, and another Terminator squad that can join your Infantry Melter bind using their Assault Cannons. Tactical Marines can fill out the rest. They get an excellent and versatile Walker unit in the Dreadnought that both has good armour and HP, and can either be a melee tank or an anti-infantry support weapon platform. They get not the longest range, but the most precise and accurate piece of artillery in the Whirlwind tank, and their actual tanks, Predators, have great armour, come default as excellent anti-infantry and can be upgraded to one of the most powerful anti-vehicle weapons in the game. They also have some early game fast harassment and scout units in the land speeder vehicle and assault marine squadrons, though they tend to be a bit fragile for the late game. They have a particularly effective late game strategy using their special building, the Orbital Relay, which lets them drop dreadnoughts and marines anywhere on the map by shooting drop ships from orbit, with a bit of a cooldown representing getting the stuff up into space to get shot back down in the first place. Marines can also teleport or deep strike ter terminators. On top of that, they have rhino transport units, and their relic unit, the Land Raider, can carry squads too. They have a lot of good mobility and deployment options in the late game that makes up for the fact that they aren't the fastest. 
Couple this with their good HP and defense, and they really are a very forgiving army. They even have plenty of special ability units like the Librarian or the Grey Knights, the Chaplain or the Apothecary, which are particularly useful, granting significant health regen to any squad they are attached to, meaning Space Marines have very good options for withdrawing, recovering and re-engaging. You can see here that the AI often tries to salvage a loss by building a HQ as you destroy theirs. For some reason they aren't so good at doing this with other kinds of buildings, but learn to expect this. If you find yourself standing around one wondering why you haven't won yet, it's time to go exploring those strategic points in the fog of war, because I bet your enemy has built a HQ somewhere you haven't looked yet. Look at that, more war gear. This time I go with a power sword to make my force commander more bitey bitey in melee. Back to the planetary map. Because I have fury, I get to attack a whole other territory before my opponent gets to do anything. And of course, I go for the other dreadnought. This time, a hellfire pattern, which comes with long range missiles that disrupt infantry and an assault cannon for mowing them down at the expense of having no melee. I also can't afford all of my honor guard units after losses on the previous map and have to make a call about which one to take. Be warned that a downside of Fury is you only get one lot of planetary requisition per turn, so if you lose your honor guard unit on your first battle and then need to replace them on your second battle, well, your losses are going to stack up faster and you're going to find yourself unable to afford planetary goodies as often compared to if you hadn't have taken it. It's well worth it anyway. So. I choose to leave the tactical marines behind in this case because having some armour and some mobility in the early game matters more than being able to whip out a plasma gun or rocket launcher early. This territory isn't well defended and being able to snaffle up most of the strategic points fast and out economy the AI is an easy option. So that looks a little something like this. and. Me completely crushing them looks a little something like this. With my two moves used up, now I have to end turn. And this time around, I'm fortunate enough that nobody attempts to attack me, which means I'm free to make another two moves claim another two provinces. It's time to nab me one of those other juicy bonuses. And I'll go for the Arceria Forest here held by the Necron to get that increased manpower bonus. This particular map is very small and one of the easiest ones to knock over in the game, especially when it's held by the Necron, which will be 95% of the time. It's just so small that a rush is guaranteed to be effective because the Necrons are so slow. You will always be able to cover the ground to their base, which is right next door to your base before they have a substantial army. That is, provided that they've not been left to their own devices into the late game and their defense score isn't past six, but I would never do that. And even then, if I've got substantial honor guard to rush with, I'll probably still cinch it. Now, I could lose it if I were to turtle exclusively, as Necrons can get very overpowered in their late game if left to their own devices, but I definitely won't be letting them do that. So I charge on in there and wipe out as many of their units and structures, and structures as I can, especially power plants and scarabs, but I make sure to leave their monolith HQ alone until I'm good and ready and I've got the map locked down with my own structures and fortifications, and then it's just a matter of blowing their hat their HQ when I want my tasty boost the population cap. Now with that out of the way, I have the distinct advantage of being able to go past the 20 infantry and 20 vehicle cap that my opponents can't exceed. I should be nigh unstoppable. Well, actually Eldar can exceed it if they get the avatar and Necron can exceed it with their resurrection abilities, and Orcs kind of work in a way that may very well count as exceeding it, but that's all balanced in the game normally. This bonus to pop cap is a genuine edge only available in the campaign, and it should, in a 1v1 deadlock scenario, guarantee me a win. So it's a very nice bonus to have. 
Anyway, up next I go for the Pavonian Heartland land over here. It's held by the Guard, and I want it because I want another veteran assault marine to help cap strategic points in the opening moments of any given map, and also because it borders the spaceport and lets me defend it by stopping any army in its tracks before it can reach the spaceport. I swear, it's like really commanding an army, guys. That's some proper strategery, that is. Now, this is a big map, and one of my absolute favourites. And let's speculate for a moment. If you had two AI opponents, say for example if this territory had six defense score instead of four, this map could potentially be one where if they both got away from you long enough to field large armies, you could be up the proverbial cr creek without the proverbial paddle. A real risk on a large map like this when your honor guard is still small. For example, you rush the first base, find that its defences are strong enough to rebuff your rush and then before you know it you have two armies assaulting your base and you get overwhelmed and you lose. I'm just trying to drive home the point it is always wise to rush down one AI as fast as possible to nip the unwinnable scenario in the bud. You'll see me do it later I'm sure. Fortunately with just one base I have an easy time overwhelming them and doing my thing, bottlenecking and fortifying. And now here's some footage of me leading my whole army round the back of their base to find that they've built a second, very large base complete with a Bane Blade production facility, which just goes to show why we try and cripple our AI opponents before we build a massive turtle city. This is definitely something to watch out for, especially on larger maps. I got myself another Assault Marine, so more easy strategic point captures for me. I end turn and fortunately, once again I fight no defences, lucky me. Then I see the Chaos Lord sitting down here on a 5 defence territory that could tick over to the dreaded 6 and the reward is a Terminator on a guard unit. You better believe I want to win the Terminator and already have him in my ranks before I start dealing with 6 defense or more double AI battles. The Chaos Lord doesn't even have a big honor guard with him, so it should be an easy win. The province is adjacent to the Chaos Stronghold, so I will have to stick to the old heavy fortification plan and given that no enemy hero can attack either the Spaceport or Fury provinces next turn because they aren't adjacent to them, Going for the Terminator and locking the Chaos Lord from leaving one direction out of his stronghold seems prudent to me. So my initial rush goes well and I get the Chaos side onto the back foot before they can really establish an economy. The Honor Guard Dreadnoughts are the star of the show here and I'm really glad I nabbed them first. Then Operation Turtle City leaves me with a cramped but powerful base and I'm out of there. I win another piece of war gear and I go with the giant hammer that's main purpose is to let the force commander here lay down the big hurt on absolutely anything, whether that be a tank, a walker, a 16 foot tall blood demon from the warp, or a reinforced concrete command bunker. I choose to attack the Mariah Coast next, because it has the librarian on a guard unit, and your librarian for the space marines is your spellcaster essentially. He got all them good abilities, including Smite, which lets you do the old lightning bolt, and Word of the Emperor, which keeps nearby squads from dropping below zero HP for a while. Very useful as a get out of jail free card, or a way of tanking concentrated fire and breaching your enemy's lines. It's kind of a pseudo invulnerability. The cool thing about honor guard units is they are already fully trained from the moment they step onto the battlefield, and that means you don't have to slowly research all of the abilities over the course of the battle like with a regular librarian. You better believe the honor guard librarian is worth it, and he's a detector, giving you an easy way to spot those early game infiltrators that can be quite annoying. On top of that, this province, the Mariah Coast, is the only adjacent province to the Fury ability that I don't already have defended, and it'll lock the Imperial Guard permanently into their stronghold, effectively removing them from the game until I choose to take them out, provided I don't mind weathering defense missions from their never-ending attempts to escape this stronghold and make some headway on Cronus. Needless to say, it goes like all the other maps so far. 
but I want you to look at this ridiculous assault. Orbital barrage, missiles everywhere, lasers in all directions, explosions and bullets and corpses. These are the kind of moments where everything comes together and this game is nothing short of just absolutely divine. Just don't be like me and forget to change angle. Get a more cinematic look. There's heaps of detail and little animations playing out in these battles and there's always something amazing to see. So now it's the end of my turn and Chaos decides to try and take their little island province back from me. My hero being in the adjacent territory can make the short trip over the ocean and defend it with my honour guard. And because of I've dug in so well in the first place, and on such a tiny map, my turrets are already blowing par apart one of the two AI opponent's bases the instant the map starts. Seems the game's decided I've hit the tipping point and I've moved from the early game to the mid game and now I'm going to commonly see the AI using two opponents against me. Of course, this doesn't just happen when you attack a province with six defense or more, it also happens when you get attacked once you're past a certain point in the game, like in this example you're witnessing now. The cool thing about these kind of defense maps is you don't need to worry about doing anything except rushing their HQs and winning as soon as possible, so it's over in five minutes. No one else attacks me this turn, though the Imperial Guard have no choice but to soon, as do the Elder. Then I decide to go for the industrial production special ability to give me that final overpowered edge on the battlefield. Nothing like extra resources to get that head start in combat. This map has a win condition where you have to collect so much power before the time is up. But really, I just blow up the enemy base as soon as I can. I keep an eye on that timer though, as I can lose if I let it run out, and I can buy stuff that cost power to keep myself from going over the power limit while I turtle. But ideally, given the location of this particular province where only one other province borders it, if you do it right, you should never have to fight defensively on this province at all. So there's usually no need to turtle here. You just blow the enemy up, collect the power, and whatever. This one's another easy gimme province with a game-winning bonus. It took less than three whole minutes to win this particular battle, so definitely don't just go for the power target. It's often faster to just blow your enemy up. Now, with this next move, I don't know what I was thinking. The Necron are right there, ready to attack the spaceport next turn. And they've got a decent honor guard. I should have preemptively attacked them with this move and taken the last defensive position I needed to guarantee smooth sailing to complete and total victory and the complete defense of the spaceport. Instead, I take a huge risk and leave my one defensive score spaceport province vulnerable to the Necrons and choose instead to attack the only remaining non-stronghold chaos province, leaving my key strategic advantage wide open to a powerful army in exchange for a chance at winning a fucking space marine chaplain. Sure, it's a tough leader unit, but it has only got one special ability and just isn't really worth prioritizing in that context. I really don't know what I was thinking. Don't do this. The chaplain does not need priority. You can sleep on him. I do lock Chaos into their stronghold with this move and get to guarantee the security of my increased manpower ability, but the Necrons could attack next turn, whereas Chaos would have to waste that turn, moving into position and could only attack the turn after. So it was, no matter how you look at it, a dumb thing to do. So much for epic strategery. But it is another great map to build a super mega turtle city because of the sheer size of it. A skirmish map intended for like eight players to duke it out, and at most you'll be in a 2v1 on it, so plenty of room to, for you to build a huge amount of fortification and economy. When I do get around to striking from the choke point outside their base I was holding, it is classic 40,000 stuff. A great big maelstrom of chaos on marines. What fun. But 
It's my ability to concentrate rocket fire and my tank's las cannons onto their defilers, while a bunch of my squads with the Word of the Emperor ability from the Librarian make them into that shitty kind of invulner invulnerable that makes them able to withstand and draw the enemy fire while I systemically pull their army apart. Then I get to flood their base and win another massively fortified victory. Maybe the Blood Raven's Lost Primarch is Rogal Dawn, given the way I'm playing them anyway. So I vaporize their HQ and we get the Honor Guard Reclusiarch, and I basically threw away a turn for him there, so learn from my mistakes. With nothing left to do, I end turn and I have to fight a defensive mission from Chaos, and look, we are really going to start skipping over these big time now. If I've established good fortifications, and unless otherwise noted, every single defense mission will be a breeze. I even get war gear. I choose the halo to further beef up my commander's ability to tank damage and draw fire. My favorite use for a hero unit. Then I also successfully beat back the Imperial Guard and the Eldar this turn. I win some more war gear from the Eldar defeat and I choose these nifty gold gauntlets for increased health and damage. Somehow, the Necrons decided to leave the spaceport alone. Thank the Emperor. I got so lucky there. I would have had a hard time winning that scenario. In fact, it was probably unwinnable. Now that they have moved back into their stronghold and can't attack me in a weak point on the next turn, I take the breathing room to grab more provinces with honor guard units I want. First, some tactical marines, as you can give the veteran marine a rocket launcher straight away, expanding my crucial early battle anti-vehicle options. This province I don't even have to fortify, as I control all the adjacent provinces, so I just rush my honor guard and that goes something like this, then this, and then this. And then next, I want that first company terminator. So I attack this orc province down here, which takes a little while because it's adjacent to the orc stronghold. So I'll fight a few defenses here. So I really have to fortify it. The orcs will crash many a green tide fruitlessly against this sea wall. After I earn my first company terminators, I end turn and the tower surprise me by taking that blasted key province next to the spaceport off off of the Necrons. Spicy, surely that will force my hand to secure it for myself, as I should have done several turns ago. I also win two defences against the Imperial Guard and the Eldar again, no surprises there. So of course, the first thing I do on my next turn is attack the Tau in their new province. I'm not entirely brain dead. Bet they thought they'd done a good job securing their border there, but BAM! Space Marine Honor Guard in their face. Unfortunately, I make a pretty big mistake at this point and I actually forget to fortify. I think I accidentally left my Honor Guard too close and blow up their HQ by accident. Even though this province borders the Tower Stronghold and I'm going to have to defend it later. It is far from the end of the world in this context, however, and we'll come back to why in just a bit. I score some more war gear, and I get these fancy golden underpants that protect against melee attacks and increase my HP. We should all have some fancy golden underpants in our lives like this chap, shouldn't we? Anyway... With my next Fury-sponsored assault, I take this 9 defense province from the Necrons, and this is a particularly small map, so with the powerful honor guard I've managed to assemble at this point, I can wipe one of my two opponents out in the opening minute, like we've discussed before, and then the other one not long after. Our snowball is becoming an avalanche at this point, and... Even though, once again, fortifications would be prudent, I forget to do it here either. I must have just been having a bad day. So when we're back on the planetary map, before I hit next turn, I click on my one defense province, bordering the tower, and I spend some planetary requisition to garrison some regular troops there. 
combine that with the fact that if my hero is in an adjacent territory, they're able to respond to an attack in time so that themselves and their honor guard spawn at the start of a battle as well. And you may not need a hectic base already built to win a defense. All you really need to guarantee victory are the ingredients to wipe out their initial rush, which usually means at least having a way to tie up their hero while you strip its HP and some anti-vehicle weaponry. I fight defenses against Chaos, Orcs, Imperial Guard, the Necron, and here we are, my turn again. I attack this Elder territory with the special ability Bulwark on it. Honestly, take my advice from before, you could skip this province if you wanted, but as I said, I always get it for completion's sake. It's a very large map, so an Honor Guard rush is essential in the 2v1 scenario that you always fight here. There is no way to fight a 1v1 scenario on this map. If you wait too long, both opponents will field large armies on a large map, and that is the last thing you want against the Eldar especially, whose speed and mobility will ensure that they are unstoppable should they gain a significant upper hand on a big map like this one. Having conquered all adjacent territories and being in the late game, however, I can just rush both HQs and knock the map out in 5 minutes. So, I repeat, highly recommend either skipping or leaving this province till the very late game. And then, because I was a silly bugger earlier, instead of using my second move to take more ground, I need to use it to move back into my one defense mistake so that I can use my honor guard to help defend these weak territories when the Necron and Tau inevitably try and take advantage. I hit end turn and I have to fight defenses from the Tau. Then the Orcs, then the Imperial Guard. Now it's the Necron's turn on my low, whoops, forgot to turtle defense province. I've got my honor guard camped there and one vicious rush from them, plus me actually taking the time to turtle this time around, and I've got this one under control. The Eldar, of course, cannot help but have a go as well, and that goes as well as all the other times. I hope you are beginning to see why I recommend not going about winning by taking every province except the strongholds first. As you can see it results in fighting every single faction, every single defensive round. I'm only doing it for demonstration's sake, just for the Space Marines. 100% recommend you knock out factions as you are presented sensible openings. Then I finally attack the non-stronghold province I'd been saving till last. The now 9 defense orc held Hyperion Peaks the spiciest meatball in the Dark Crusade. Depending on your faction, this province could be a hard time. I left it to last for the Space Marines so I could use their full honor guard, but their starting lineup includes two Relic Unit Land Raiders, two Whirlwinds, two Terminator Squads, and four Dreadnoughts. So I think Space Marine could win this at any point. My advice in general on this map is to rush the critical point at the center of the map. There are three bases that this critical point is at the mouth of, and you must rush two of these bases while you are capturing that critical point in the opening minutes of the battle and wipe out all of their production structures. That is, their HQ, their barracks, and their vehicle factory. Whatever they happen to be called depending on the faction holding the province. For some reason, despite being able to build, the AI doesn't replace these structures. Once they are gone, they can't make units. You need to cripple the AI's ability to make units early, or you will end up overwhelmed fast on this map on hard difficulty. The third base, you should be able to hold the critical point against long enough to do a bit of regrouping and recovering. They will endlessly spam units at you, but fortunately they will rarely gather together a coherent army and attack. So long as you are only dealing with the one base's set of production buildings, you can win that war of attrition despite no, no reinforcements of your own. Once all three sets of production structures are down, given that the win condition is to wipe out all the structures on the map, you can take all the time you want and the rest of the map is a cinch. Space Marines getting double Land Raiders does make the whole thing a walk, if you ask me. But I do get to put them up against the Squigoth, so that's pretty fun. You get the forward base's ability for this, and it's a good one. It could win you the game, and we'll see how it does that with another faction. 
you also don't really need it to win the game either. It's worth snapping up and leveraging sometimes, and other times it just isn't, which I think is great design. And if a campaign map hinged around decisions like that all the time, it would be a thing of great beauty indeed. Forward bases also comes with some problems when it comes to stronghold maps in particular. Sometimes the bit of the map you are given to build in at the start of stronghold maps is very cramped. And if you were like me, and you like to build the old double base, well, the layout and the way the game spreads the building out when you purchase them through forward bases rather than place them yourself, well, it just doesn't let you squeeze in everything and that can really suck. Sometimes it's worth manually deleting and rebuilding structures after they've given you that crucial early game advantage that you want forward bases for. But often I choose not to use forward bases on stronghold maps at all because of this. Now speaking of stronghold maps, it's time to take our first one, finally! Actually, I tell a bit of a lie. First I want to experiment a bit. I move my commander into the old one defense territory again in case it's attacked. Then I buy myself some extra garrison and replace my honor guard and in general reinforce my army in preparation for the glorious victory to come. But before we get into that, for shits and gigs I decide to use my save game impunity and go ahead and give the old auto resolve option a try just to see how it does. And well, it loses me multiple unlosable territories. I'm not sure if it's completely random. I recall as a child using it in conjunction with save scumming to win unwinnable situations. So I guess keep that in mind if you get stuck and you don't object to that kind of thing. Loading the game and not using auto resolve and doing them all the long hard slow way I ace all of the defences because I made them easy for myself, but let's skip through them all because who really has time to see that? The first victim to get the boot entirely will be the Orcs. I actually usually suggest saving their stronghold till last because it's the easiest one in my opinion. This means you can afford to neglect it and let it get as strong a defence score as you like and it will still be easy. Every stronghold gets Narrator Man giving a little fluff about each stronghold and the faction that holds it. Each stronghold also gets an opening cinematic, although there's nothing much special about them from time to time, it's just the faction attacking them that changes, otherwise they're identical. There are a variety of factors that make the Orc one the easiest. First up, the starting base is in the most ridiculous terrain funnel of a choke point that is easy that is easy to defend. Although, heads up, make sure you have some anti-vehicle if you've left your attack until late game. Although this goes for every stronghold. Warlord Gorgatz has five bases with banners in them outside of his main camp. All you have to do is take out each of the banners, have the orcs rebel as each banner goes down, and then rush Gorgatz in his camp and take him out to win, which can be done in about 40 minutes usually. The banners don't have much HP and most factions have a cheesy in and out method or indirect artillery method to take out the banners as well, so it's rarely even necessary to fully attack each base. Sometimes one rebellious orc base will attack a neighbouring one and take care of their banner for you. A much younger me would slowly and methodically wipe out every single thing on the map, saving Gorguts for last, which I reckon, given the large secondary bases behind the banner bases, would take hours and hours. I don't recommend doing this. This map is easy. Hold your start base build up your forces, then take out the closest banner while plonking a forward base on the nearest strategic point. Then take the Moor of Gork, otherwise known as the Relic at the centre of the map. And from there, take out each of the other banners before wiping out the camp directly north, followed by Gorguts. For winning you get a little cinematic, which only changes very superficially depending which faction you are. And then you get a cool little write-up read by the narrator that actually describes the exact faction versus faction scenario and its consequences and isn't just the same shit no matter the context. And I swear, I replay this game 
just to hear the two little paragraphs revealing that little bit more of the web of lore and relationships in 40k from 2007. But seriously, given the severe technical and time restraints of the time it was developed, this one concession to the sprawling tree of possibilities that the devs have gone and rewarded you with works wonders. Take note, devs out there, even if it would be impossible to put in unique content in for every possibility a player may take, putting in even just a tiny sprinkle of acknowledgement and detail will work like fat juicy bait for hooking them into your game. I should note the one other little tidbit like that is that the commander units have like a handful of lines of banter with each other on the stronghold maps that I'm pretty sure is unique to each faction as well. And you better believe there's a bunch of defences, but I'm not even going to list them anymore. I do get some sweet wargy, however, from one of the defences, and I pick a plasma pistol to do some more ranged damage. So the next interesting thing to happen is I attack the Tower Stronghold. It's their turn to feel the Emperor's Wrath. Now, the Tower Stronghold is the exact opposite of the York Stronghold, and I rate it as probably the hardest stronghold in the entire game. Certainly the one best designed to literally take you roughly from behind. As such, I recommend attacking it early, if not first, before it gets a nice high defensive score. This particularly helps with keeping the initial rush on your starting base from being too brutal. Although, if you're like me with Max Honor Guard, not even the Tau's most overpowered rush is going to save them from you. The thing about this map is basically the Tau have you in one corner with concentric rings of bases that get larger and larger as they fan out in a kind of diagonal semicircle around you. These forward bases are interconnected with streets and buildings and walls, crawling with Tau units. This is one of the only missions in the game where every base is scripted to constantly spawn reinforcements, which are scripted to constantly gather and attack your base in waves. and I swear, they're programmed to rotate and attack your own offensive forces' flanks. I really have no idea what's going on behind the scenes here, but even all these years later, this map can still be quite the juggling match, trying to keep your base defended against powerful waves and keep your offensive force from getting sandwiched between two waves of rotating reinforcements. My biggest bit of advice for this map is don't get hung up on any particular forward base you build or army you attack with, and always, always, always make sure you have substantial defenders at your own base. If you lose an offensive force or forward base, it's no biggie. Just turtle some more, reinforce and try again. Also, if you are having a hard time with the town stealth suits planted on high elevations throughout the city, that only your units that are both mobile and able to detect can handle, the map has a built-in sub-objective you are going to want to complete. In the very middle of the map is a big tower recon tower thingy that if you stand a unit right next to, you can use a special ability to reveal any infiltrated unit and spot a fog of war on the map. It also doubles as a useful trick for spotting for artillery units without risking anything. This tower is right next to the map's only relic point, so you are going to want to wipe out the well-defended base here and get access to your relic unit anyway. Be warned though, the enemy will counter-attack this base if you haven't already wiped out their other bases. One thing to know about the tower is their tech tree is split in two, and they have a base on either side of the map giving them access to both trees. Wipe out a base and you wipe out the waves of units from that tree, I tend to find the waves of Greater Narlox and Krutox coming from the right hand side more annoying than the Hammerhead tanks from the left, but I find the uphill battle to get at the Krut base on the right way more of a slog, so often I eliminate the pressure from the left hand side and then sweep through the centre and down to the right. Once you've done that, pull up outside their main fortress, as it is very well defended and could wipe a poorly managed army. I suggest building some unit production structures outside of it so you can reinforce as you slowly pick their defences apart, murder their ethereal and put the tower down for good. I should note that the win condition for this map is eliminating that ethereal and not wiping out the tower, so theoretically you could just concentrate on defending your own base, ignore the rest of the map and just go straight for the ethereal. 
But since he hangs out in the back of their fortress and they pretty much never let up with constant pressure on you, I never try this. I do think it can be done and if this stronghold wears on you, it could be worth a crack. You get your closing cinematic and my special favourite two paragraphs read by Big Voice Narrator Man, and that's all she wrote on the towel. The paragraphs explain that a different Space Marine chapter, the Nova Marines, had previously failed to get rid of the towel, and that, well, the Blood Ravens avenged them. It also mentions that the Blood Ravens are angry that they didn't get to kill uh, the Commander, only the Ethereal, and... As revenge, they collect lots of alien blood to study instead, which is pretty weird, but, you know, they're not called the Blood Ravens for nothing, I suppose. Then it's yada, 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 a bunch of defences I'm going to completely skip. And then the next neck on the chopping block is the Necrons. So, bad puns aside, heads up with the Necrons. Always make sure that you have some way of dealing with vehicles in your honour guard when you attack this stronghold. Even on their lowest defence score of 10, they will always have one Tomb Spider Vehicle class unit activate inside your base in the opening minute of the mission. If you let them get a real high defence score like 16 or 17, you might even have to deal with three of them. Apart from that, the basics are the same on this map. Defend against the opening assault and then the steady waves afterward. This stronghold map in particular is the funniest and most incongruous scenario in the whole game. Not just in terms of lore versus gameplay, but also in terms of any kind of internal logic at all that isn't pure video game logic. This one stands out the most as the it's a fun video game, kid. Don't think too much about it. Moment in the game. So, get this. The premise is, you have attacked the Necrons in a vast underground network of caverns. The Necrons are meant to be kind of spooky, unkillable robot things, so to beat them, you've got this plan where you plant a big bomb and collapse the caverns on top of them and bury them for another few millennia. I guess in the hope your descendants will have the technology to get rid of them entirely? Anyway, it's very understandable from a game developer point of view that you aren't going to make new animations just for this one map. And so we are in the hilarious position where all of your buildings are being shot out of orbit through the ground and into the cave. And it's not just the Space Marine factions that in some way goes about building all of their structures in a way that involves some kind of airdrop or mechanism that makes no sense at all if you are underground. So much like a lot of the other moments I've already mentioned, this is actually something I love about Dawn of War. It's a game. It doesn't pretend not to be a game. It doesn't care that it makes no sense for the Space Marines to be orbital dropping dreadnoughts into a cavern. The laws of it being a consistent RTS matter more than some petty detail like none of the animations or diegetic lore elements making sense once you are inside a cave. The Necrons are the cool new army on the front cover of all the promotional material and they are getting their scary cave level and Games Workshop are going to sell more Necron models and you are going to have fun playing a great game and not give a shit the whole time. Another very important thing to note about this plant a bomb in the Necron cave premise is that your hero unit, the one decked out in all the war gear, is the only unit that can plant the bomb. And if it dies at all, then you instantly lose. It's important to remember that fact because it is the only time in the game where your hero dying means a loss rather than just having to build him again. So it's very easy to just la di da di da charge him in like normal and get them killed and be like, what happened? Why did I lose? My suggestion is to just leave them at the back of your base the whole time and only crack them out once the whole map is clear and you got yourself nice and set up for them to escape. Because, of course, once you plant the bomb, there is a countdown timer and a bunch more ooh so scary and cool necrons spawn and you have to escape before it all explodes. 
It's actually a pretty cool and memorable level, and the unending waves of Necron are never too much to handle, so it isn't frustrating. There's a few sideshows and distractions, like the obelisks scattered around the map that drip-feed you proximity-based encounters with certain Necron powers, like resurrection of dead infantry and taking over your vehicles. There are abandoned Necron tunnels you can use to move your own infantry around the map instantly, provided you've already discovered any particular tunnel exit on the map. There's also the base located directly next to your own base, but is on a completely different elevation, so you either have to take the windy path through the rest of the level to attack it, or use mobility units and abilities to jump or teleport or drop pod or whatever. It's a monolith graveyard. The monolith being the Necron's scary, powerful combined HQ and relic unit. And I believe if you plant the bomb and don't wipe this base out first, they all come to life and teleport into your base and render all to ash. You can, of course, cheese this stronghold and figure out how to just rush your dude into their base, plant the bomb and rush him back as quickly as possible. I mean, if you felt like it. And you could probably have this licked in like 10 minutes or something, but... I, of course, do everything methodically and slowly every time because this game is like comfort food for me. After you've blown the cave and buried the Necrons, you get the delectable victory paragraphs. They say that the battle in the cavern became so legendary among the Blood Ravens, one of the most significant in their recent history. So much so, they mark their armour with special decorative skulls and even update their heraldry, which I take to mean their flags. And they take on the oh-so-badass motto, Victory over death. I win my final piece of war gear, a multi-melter, upon whooping them Necrons. I'd like to mention a meme among 40k fans. The Blood Ravens chapter you play as in Dawn of War are all thieves. Because they have many relics and pieces of war gear you select for your chapter master that actually canonically belong to other famous space marine heroes and chapters. And the only way they could have them appear in the Blood Raven's possession is if they stole them. It's just another great example of how this game's unflinching commitment to being fast, dirty PC entertainment before being an accurate Warhammer textbook is... Well, actually a big hit among fans. Of course we all want the cool war gear and references to other chapters' cool stuff to appear in the cool video game, even if it doesn't make sense for the Blood Ravens to have that stuff. So we justify it by making a funny meme where the Blood Ravens, you know, are really sneaky and go around stealing everybody's cool stuff. Dawn of War is not so committed to taking itself seriously that stuff like this matters. It is fun to point out, though. Anyway, moving on from another tiresome sequence of defences, the Imperial Guard are next in my sights. And while their level isn't quite as hard as the Tau's, I definitely consider it one of the trickier ones, and actually one of my favourites. It's a good balance of slog versus glorious victory. The Imperial Guard also attack you in the opening moments with vehicles, but they are just chimeras, and you have more to worry about in terms of raw damage from the guardsmen they are carrying than the guns on the chimeras themselves. You can usually figure something out to mop them up, even if you don't have anti-vehicle units right at the start of the game. Before I get too into this stronghold, I actually experienced a crash on this one, and I lost like an hour of my time. So, here's a reminder on these longer maps to save mid-game, and not just on the planetary map. Back in 2006, I remember this game used to crash about once, sometimes between every 45 minutes and 2 hours. This was the only crash I experienced in 112 hours of gameplay. So modern systems do this game good. It's not 100% stable. It didn't not crash at all. Like, I do think you'd get away without a crash altogether, but it definitely can happen. Anyway, back to taking out the Imperial Guard. This map has a lot of terrain features that lend themselves to the Guard's entrenchment. 
The level is really split into three horizontal strips with your base in the bottom right-hand corner and the guard's main HQ you have to wipe out to win in the top right corner. There is a river segregating the bottom strip from the middle strip and a trench with a gigantic gun off of a long destroyed titan periodically shooting a canyon sized energy blast segregating the middle strip from the top strip on top of this both the middle and top strips are split vertically as well making for a highly compartmentalized map full of well defended choke points obstacles and heavily fortified bases on top of that, there is a huge group of basilisk artillery in the middle strip on the far left that thankfully can't hit your base but can hit huge radius around them. And you absolutely do not want your army to be hit by them. My biggest tip is to use some cheap scout units to work out where the invisible lines are that denote the range of the artillery and don't cross them with a unit that can't either stealth easily dodge or tank the barrage of inevitable Earthshaker rounds. My strategy for doing this is to take the little base that is closest to your own as it is outside the range of the artillery. Then you cross the river and wipe out the big base to your north. If you do that and with some good timing you can avoid getting vaporized as you sweep around through the Titan guns trench and then flank the artillery. Now, I didn't do this with the Space Marines, because I guess I forgot that that's the best way to do this. The Space Marines have very good options for dealing with the artillery scenario, because they can orbital drop troops and dreadnoughts in, deep strike terminators, and otherwise use their mobility options to minimize crossing the artillery's field of fire and exposing themselves to significant losses. So don't rule out the direct option if you have a good grasp of your faction's mechanics. You can also go for a direct attack if you don't mind taking a lot of losses and want to go the good old spam waves of troops at the enemy tactic. But seeing as the guard themselves thrive on that tactic, you probably are best not trying to out attrition them unless you are a horde faction like orcs. So here you can see me crossing the narrowest part of the artillery's field of fire, which leads to this very well defended strategic point at the mouth of this bridge. You need to be careful this point is fortified with enough mines and firepower to wipe out most armies, but they won't drop artillery on their own fortifications, so if you know what you are doing you can cross, dodge the shells, wipe their fortifications and use the safe zone it provides to stage another attack on the base in the bottom left hand corner of the map. This base always has a Baneblade relic unit defending it and is in a constant state of spawning reinforcements so it can be a very hard battle. It is wise to wipe out the reinforcing structures first so that they don't get you rude, fresh enemy squads spawned in on your wounded, battle-tired forces. This base also provides the Imperial Guard with their commander's air support special attack, so wiping it out early has the benefit of getting that harassment off of your back. Now from there, I swept up the left-hand side of the map towards their artillery positions. You need to be careful crossing the shallow water in the lead up to those artillery positions, which is why I normally recommend coming from the back. You see, the artillery can still hit you in that shallow water, and they have a heavy weapons emplacement covering it. The shallow water provides a penalty that means you take extra damage. An Earthshaker round landing square on top of, the mo of most squads in the game in normal circumstances will wipe them, so six Earthshaker rounds landing on your army in shallow water can be a really, really bad time. Tougher units like Terminators might be able to weather one hit, but it will send them flying, and by the time they've gotten back up and into formation, you need to be ready for another wave of artillery. Another tip 
And this isn't really a tip, as the game actually tells you to do it, but I'm going to tell you anyway, is that when you charge across the trench, the defending forces will be led by an Ogryn squad with a commissar attached. If you kill that commissar leader, a portion of the defending forces will switch sides and join you. So concentrate all fire onto him straight away to avoid having to wipe the base out yourself and then have a constant stream of dumb as a rock kamikaze guardsmen spawning and assisting you. It's a nifty little lore moment too, as it is a nod towards some factions of the low morale guard often being the first to switch sides or fall to chaos or similar. It makes a lot of sense when you are the revered space marines, though them switching sides against foes like the soulless wipeout all life Necron makes no sense. But that's another one of those it's a video game not a lore book moments. Next I sweep to the top left corner and take the power grid and relic point off of the tech priest. Watch out for counterattacks flanking you from vehicles coming through the gun trench or from infantry through the ruined buildings. Your new allies will prove to be woeful at doing anything about them. Also, make sure you have a detector, as their power generators are swarmed with mines. Once you've cleared all the generators, you will disable the Titan gun, and if you build some of your own, you can then fire it yourself, which can be useful for wiping their forces out while you regroup and prepare for the final push. Or, what would be the final push if I hadn't done this map in a bit of an unorthodox way? I'm a bit of a completion freak, as you know, so there was no need for me to do this, but I went ahead and wiped out this base before assaulting their final position anyway. If anything, it prevents them spawning more troops and harassing my flanks. It is a very well fortified base, but if you are methodical and don't overcommit, you can wipe it out without too much trouble. If you were to do things in my recommended way, you would have already wiped this base out. It was just that I know it was the first time I played the game in a long time and I totally forgot about the best way to do this map and so I missed it and had to come back and do it anyway. So, for the final assault, if you time it right with your new allies, you can charge from the ruined buildings here that vehicles can't cross. Simultaneously, as you attack from the trench and you can use them to draw fire while you dish out damage. There will be a Bane Blade protecting their base so make sure you bring some serious anti-vehicle weaponry and watch out the damn thing can respawn as well so be on the lookout for that. The final base is of course very well fortified. It has artillery and endless spawning elite troops and tanks pouring out of it. The old Build a base outside their base RTS trick may be useful here, so you can call on instant reinforcements as well. There really is nothing for it but biting the bullet and slogging it out with waves until you grind them to nothing. You get a little ending cutscene and then the beloved flavour text. In this case, it's devoted to attempting to justify why the Space Marines and Guardsmen are fighting when they are on the same side, and of course telling you of the fate of the Guardsmen that switches sides, who the Space Marines execute, because for them, of course, the right thing to do would have been to die fighting them rather than try and help. Another big tick for the grimdark law box for Relic. So, uh, back to skipping some defence missions. Next up is the Eldar Stronghold. The Eldar are holed up in the mountains and are so determined to make uprooting them as obnoxious as possible, only space elves could be involved. It's very typical Eldar behaviour. This is one of those strongholds that you could probably work out how to cheese and knock over quite quickly if you were determined, as the wind condition on this one isn't to wipe them out but to hold three critical points attached to giant webway gates for a certain amount of time. They are, of course, very well positioned to counterattack those critical points and make defending them hell, but I'm sure a determined player could skip much of the map and figure out a fast way to accomplish that. If you couldn't tell by this point, 
I am the exact opposite of that kind of player, and instead, not only do I never win this stronghold quickly because I have to do everything, but I also don't even go for the win condition and instead always opt for wiping out the Eldar entirely, which let me tell you is not easy. Because of the win condition, their main base is designed to actually be impenetrable and reinforces losses as fast as you can inflict them with what may as well be infinite resources. The devs figured that anyone up for the challenge of avoiding the mission objective and just going for an Eldar genocide outright deserves what's coming to them. So while I will show you how to wipe the Eldar base with all factions, by all means, if you want to finish this stronghold a little faster, do the actual objective. So, like all strongholds, the first thing I do is fortify and turtle. Get ready to hear those words a lot. This is a bit of a trickier starting point than most strongholds. Of course, the Eldar have you where they want you. Not only is it a small, narrow bit of land that can be a bit of a bitch to fit a nice double base on, it is also vulnerable to attack on three sides. To the right, a roving clan of orcs the Elder have tricked into hanging out in the mountains so they can hide behind them. The orcs will pressure your base from the right with endless waves. To the left, a splinter group of chaos led by a rogue sorcerer has been tricked by the Eldar into hanging out in a less mountainous path of the mountains so they can hide behind them. They will be less annoying than the Orcs but will also put pressure on you. On top of that, the Eldar themselves can attack your base by jumping over the river directly above you. Given they have the best transport and vehicles in the game for doing this, as well as warp spiders, well, yeah, if you don't manage things well on this map, you can get wiped out pretty early. I deal with it by just being patient and turtling my way to good fortifications. I use my honor guard to defend my base, and if you are attacking the Eldar stronghold mid to late game, a powerful honor guard with decent anti-vehicle weaponry is a must to survive the opening rush. I leave the Honor Guard at base as defenders and take a strike force of regular troops out to the left to deal with the little power base next door, and then push on to wipe out the Chaos base. You could go for the right side and deal with the Orcs first if you like. This works too, but for some reason I always go left and take on the Chaos forces first. Before you get to the Chaos base, there is a little scuffle between the Eldar and Chaos, and the Eldar base teleports away. I usually just send a scout to trigger the cutscene, and then I pull back and wait a little bit for the Eldar to finish doing what they do best, retreating. Then I push forward and attack the Chaos holdout. A tip with dealing with the Chaos base is the whole thing is scripted to blow up as soon as the Sorcerer dies. The Sorcerer is sequestered at the back of their base and well defended by plenty of tanks, defilers and endlessly spawning waves of Chaos Marines and Horrors. But if you push through it and take him out, they all go bye bye. Then you get some free extra troops. So make sure you have already maxed out your squad and vehicle cap before you do this. And don't worry if these freebie extra units die in battle as they get replaced for free a couple of minutes later so you can afford to risk them. Even use them as a spearhead unit guaranteed to be slaughtered safe in the knowledge you get a free replacement. After the chaos are dealt with, I sweep through the middle of the map. Always when dealing with Eldar, make sure you have a detector unit around as they love to cloak webway gates all over the map and then use them to teleport turrets in. If you destroy the webway gate before the turrets finish teleporting in, then they do not successfully teleport. Of course, this means you will just have to destroy them later when you encounter them in the spot they were teleporting from. So it's your call what you think is easier. After I deal with the middle of the map, then I push through this tank defended orc minefield where a detector is also indispensable. And at the end of it, there is this big old cage that if you blow the door off of, allows two of the orc relic unit, the Squigoth, to escape and go on a rampage right into the orc base. They actually don't do much damage, 
but if you are quick and push just behind them, they can draw a lot of fire for your army while you do the damage when you assault the orc base. There are plenty of waves of respawning orcs to deal with, and it can be quite a literal uphill battle, but you get rewarded with more perpetual free reinforcements when you take them out. This is actually really sweet, especially if you were already at your squad and vehicle caps. For most factions, you can actually rock four tanks at this point, which can be pretty overpowered. You were given this firepower because you were meant to split them up and defend the three critical points as per mission objective, but that's not what I'll be doing. The Orcs have a big ice bridge connected to the Eldar stronghold. It has mines, so watch out for that. On the other side is one of the mission objective critical points slash giant webway gates which I ignore. Instead, I concentrate on wiping out any Eldar structures my detector encounters while trying not to stray too close to the actual Eldar main base, lest they start sicking endless waves of fire prisms on me. If there is one unit in the game you do not want to face endless waves of, it's fire prisms. They do plenty of damage, are fast, and they can cause massive disruption, sending most units flying. So avoid them if you can. I have to slog through all the turrets that were meant to teleport in and ambush me, but I didn't give the opportunity to. And if you are like me and don't destroy them out on the field of battle, your best bet is not to risk too much at once attacking them. Use a unit that can tank some damage to distract them while anti-armor weaponry wipes the turrets out. Say, something like four predators fully kitted out with las cannons should atomize most turrets pretty quick. As I sweep down towards the center of the map again, another critical point slash huge webway gate and the only relic point on the map. Once you've got the relic point, this is where I like to gather my forces and produce a little base. So it is easy to reinforce and maintain a siege on the Eldar's proper base. They will also attack this base periodically, so you should keep the main heft of your army on the defense here too. It's also a great moment to finally produce my relic unit, the Land Raider, giving me one almost unstoppable lineup of Laz Cannon spam. I use my new army of Laz based pain to push through more turrets and clear all the structures around the final critical point slash ginormous webway gate. Once again, I do not capture any of these critical points as they trigger counterattacks from the Eldar. Also, always be careful not to aggro too much of the forces from their base, as they can really get out of hand quickly. Once you have the entire map locked down except for the nut that is their main HQ, it's time to settle in for some nut cracking. So, their base is full of buildings that constantly reinforce their losses, and they have way more tanks and troops than the regular squad and vehicle caps could possibly allow, and they have an avatar of Cain that has way more health than he would ever normally have. The solution to cracking the nut? Wipe out the reinforcing structures with as minimal risk to your own army as possible. How to do this depends on your faction. The Space Marines have a couple of methods I employ simultaneously. You can just use a whirlwind and the attack ground feature to artillery their buildings to death through the fog of war. If you don't know where the buildings are, you can sacrifice scout units to find out. This is slow though, as the whirlwind is not suited to this job. It doesn't really do very good damage against buildings. An artillery option is a good option for this for most factions. However, with the Space Marines, I opt to use my fully loaded with war gear force commander to charge into their base just long enough to lay down an orbital bombardment. Because his war gear grants him teleport and a lot of HP and speed, he is well suited to kiting in there, dropping the bombardment and kiting out. Space Marines also get apothecaries which can greatly speed up healing, so you can just keep doing this until you, until you succeed in tipping the balance in your favour and can overwhelm the Eldar. It's worth saving the ultra tanky avatar until you've cleared most of the base, so you can concentrate your whole army on taking on taking him down. If you wipe out everything and you still don't win, get a detector unit and start having a careful look around the map, especially near the critical points slash humongoid webway gates, 
as the Elder are masters at creating cloaked buildings in every pokey little corner. At the end, you get another cinematic and those brilliant two little paragraphs of text booting the Eldar off the world and hunting down whatever Eldar was left trapped after you blew up their gates. With the Eldar defeated, only chaos remain on the map. I have to fend off a paltry assault from them before I launch my final assault on their stronghold and the last push before I take Kronos for the Space Marines and the Emperor. So, straight up, I recommend not attacking the Chaos Stronghold last. I actually recommend attacking it early if you can. It is actually overall one of the easiest strongholds, but the initial attack Chaos pulls out, while not large in numbers, well, except for the cultists, but they don't count, they're like the weakest unit in the game, the initial assault isn't large, but it is very large in powerful, high damage chaos champions. If left for the late game, just the first rush of champions can be very troublesome for your honor guard. Look, I'm not saying they'll beat a full late game honor guard army, but they'll cause you a lot of losses if you aren't careful. They also have lots of horrors that can toast vehicles and buildings quickly. So this stronghold is one of the only ones I consider posing a genuine threat to you with their opening attack. This can be mitigated by attacking them early on, so do it if you can. Once you've dealt with the opening game rush, this becomes a fairly straightforward stronghold to beat. Fall back on the old turtle and fortify until you have a massive army, do the objectives, win the game kind of thing. This particular stronghold has a chaos gimmick called the Blood Pulse. It's these giant abhorrent altar things that, on a short countdown timer, periodically play a maniacal evil laughing sound effect and pulse a giant bloody wave of energy that instantly kills any infantry caught in it. Some of these are located at key choke points you will need to push through. They are, however, easy to deal with. Just don't ever park your infantry in their radius and you have no problems. Especially if you are a mobile army like the Space Marines who can orbital drop units wherever they want or use jump packs and teleportation. Even if you aren't, every faction has some kind of transport unit you can shelter your forces in and they will be unaffected. Really, the only way the Blood Pulse could be a problem is if you get distracted during the heat of battle while you cross one and forget about the countdown timer, which some of them are clearly designed to do, so be warned. You can think about this map like a big ring. You are at the bottom of the ring and the objective is at the top. The objective for this map is to wipe out a big chaos portal letting demons and the like pour onto the battlefield. It is located at the back of a very big, well-defended base. No surprise there. The reason I say it's a ring is you've really got two choices. Sweep to the left and hold the right, or sweep to the right and hold the left. Or you could sweep both sides at once if you like. It's a viable strategy if you've got a good handle on your faction, but I find it unnecessarily stressful. In fact, my usual strategy is just to sweep the left side because it has the relic and bonus units you get from the secondary objective, and just to ignore the right side altogether. Don't even do it, just hold it. All the right side does is have a few bases for reinforcing chaos. And well, they aren't so annoying at spamming reinforcements like say, the tower, that you even need to bother blowing those bases up. I think I do take out those bases on this run for completeness sake, but most of the time I leave the right hand side and never even touch it. Once you've fended off that initial game rush, got a decent turtle on and maybe assembled a decent defense to hold the right side, I push the land bridge on the left towards this blood pulse. Watch out, this will usually trigger a bloodthirster, but his AI is very bad and he's pretty easy to distract with a tanky unit like your force commander or assault terminators while your ranged units wipe him. He retreats a lot, which is quite annoying, it's best to just let him though, as he just comes back over and over until he's dead. 
There is a base just on the other side of the blood pulse that I wipe out first to ensure that as I push around the left side of the ring no chaos slips in behind and can attack my HQ from well set up defences. Then we push up the left side, avoiding the blood pulse, and attack their base around the relic unit. It's best to attack this base carefully, as Chaos do have some serious firepower defending it, but you can afford to hold out on the hill just outside the base and pick off Chaos units. You do have to watch out for respawning Bloodthirster and Cultists, but not much else. If you wipe out the Sorcerer, then you get some free extra units of your own as a bonus. Watch out as they can accidentally get killed before you know it if you haven't cleared some of the defending chaos when the Sorcerer goes down, so maybe you might want to leave him till last. Once you've trashed that base, take the Relic. This is also the perfect spot for you to build a forward base for reinforcing. Then. I go further toward the top of the ring, near this land bridge, and take this strategic point. But don't cross the bridge yet, and instead start sweeping to the right towards the centre of the map, to the critical point that controls the Blood Pulse gimmick. There's a bunch of defilers and turrets defending this, so some decent anti-vehicles should have little trouble taking this point. Like, say, my tricked out with Last Cannon's Predators. At this point, you can just push the final base and win the map. As mentioned before, I decided to blow up everything on the map just this time. So I grabbed my defensive forces down at my original HQ and pushed their side of the map, blowing up the two chaos bases and meeting my army in the middle. When you do push the final chaos base, you should know that in a ring outside of it, there are a lot of defilers and chaos predators. So Bring strong anti-vehicle weaponry and be methodical. The three choke points into the actual Chaos HQ itself are each defended with the Chaos Heavy Melee Unit, the Possess Marine Squad, as well as lots of support that's good against heavy infantry like Plasma Gun and Heavy Bolter Chaos Space Marines. It's best to be a bit methodical in your approach and use special abilities like the Orbital Bombardment and Disruptive Artillery to break up their defences Possessed Marines are tough, they do a lot of damage, are extremely fast and have flame attacks and are very good at tying up your forces and breaking their morale, while their Chaos Space Marines concentrate fire and melt your troops. So you need to use disruption to break them up and prevent them from getting you in melee, as well as whatever special abilities are at your disposal. There are also plenty of horrors about to make it hard for your vehicles too. Once you've dealt with them, and not overextended and seen your forces get trashed, the rest of the HQ is a pushover. I like to make sure I destroy all of their structures before I take out the Chaos Gate mission objective, but if you were struggling in this final showdown, you could just target the Chaos Gate straight away, as you win as soon as you've blown all of its bits up. I've never tried, but I reckon a player could work out a way to cheese this map by rushing the Chaos Gate and win very quickly so that could be worth exploring for you impatient types. You get a cutscene where Dawn of War's iconic Eliphas the Inheritor gets one of his many iconic comeuppances, and then we get what will be the last bit of fluff paragraphs that I adore for this faction. Then we get to see the final, yay, you won the campaign cutscene before we get booted to the credits. These cutscenes explore a little bit of each faction's endgame for Cronus, but the devs use them to explore the lore a little deeper and give the players that much more of an impression of how things play out in the good old Warhammer 40,000. So, for the Blood Ravens, unsurprisingly, this means implications of heresy and being watched by the Inquisition, because where would the drama be in your race of inscrutable, zealous super soldiers if they weren't also just maybe just unknowingly flirting with becoming demon-worshipping abominations. Attention always available to be explored when the Space Marines and Chaos are both on the scene. After many long and bloody battles, so that's it for our first faction playthrough. Only six more to go. And what are we, several hours into this video? I hope you've learned enough about how to crush this game, because... I won't be taking quite the same kind of time and detail for the other faction. 
Not that I won't be walking you through covering tips, tricks and strategy, but there will be a concerted effort to keep it brief in comparison, lest this video becomes 30 hours long and even more tedious and boring than it already is. For winning the campaign, with any given faction, you get a short cinematic detailing the endgame for Cronus and your faction. The Blood Ravens take over the planet and successfully defend themselves from the Inquisition. It turns out killing the Allied Imperial Guard was completely justified, but understandably, the Inquisition and Guard are still sceptical and keep a close eye on them in case of the dreaded corruption. The cutscene ends by foreboding that the chapter's darkest times follow shortly after the end of their victory on Cronus, which I believe is actually the canonical ending for Dark Crusade. Next, we have Chaos. Seeing as we've just done Space Marine, and they are a twisted, corrupted reflection of them, it seems appropriate to put them next to each other. Also, on a more personal level, they are the faction I like playing the least. The one whose playstyle just doesn't quite do it for me like the rest. So, I like to get them out of the way early. As a foil for the Space Marines, they work quite well. Both of them revel in violence and power, but the Chaos are less ideological and regimented about it and more hedonistic and, well, chaotic. They trade imperial eagles and religious idolatry for extra spikes and demonic mutations, an ideal twisted mirror. Playing as them, they tend to be a bit squishier than marines, but exchange that for more damage. This results in an aggressive playstyle. Pair that with lots of melee options and being particularly good at wiping the enemy's morale and you have a recipe for, well, sowing chaos among the enemy ranks. Unfortunately, this is also their weakness. The same terrifying demonic horde dissolves into a pile of demonic corpses very quickly if just a few key units go down. If a player stays steadfast and organised and gets the right concentrated fire prioritised in the right places, even the most high DPS horde of CSM will fail and fail fast. CSM is short for Chaos Space Marines if you've never heard that before, by the way. This is part of the reason they don't gel well with me. I find them the most all or nothing faction. Either your big push works or it doesn't. There is no falling back and regrouping. CSM just die so fast if you lose control. Well, at least without using a few dirty tricks, and CSM have quite a lot of those up their sleeve. I wouldn't say they have more special abilities than other factions, but they have a fair share, and if used just right, they can be devastating. I'm not great at it, however, but I recognise the utility. The other thing about them is they have a very limited selection of vehicles. Because of this, those vehicles have to do everything. So we have the Chaos version of the Rhino Transport, which is a very basic transport unit, the Chaos Walker unit, the Defiler, which literally does a bit of everything and is an absolute magnificent beast in terms of its animation model. It is, however, probably the single best example of a jack-of-all-trades master of none in the game. It has a flamer and powerful melee. It doesn't have bad defense and it has an artillery cannon in its chest and an auto cannon on its other arm to boot. Unfortunately, that artillery is short-ranged and terribly inaccurate and not very high damage compared to other artillery in the game, and is the Chaos Faction's only artillery and only unit that can provide indirect disruption. The Chaos also get their own version of the Predator tank, which I think is better at being an anti-infantry support tank than their Space Marine version, but not quite as good at being a LAS cannon anti-vehicle and building platform as the Space Marine one. But those are only minor differences. Really, they are the same tank, after all. And that's all of the vehicles they get, the slimmest roster in the game. They make up for it by having a lot of demons and heavy infantry. Their heavy melee unit, the Possessed Marine Squad, is one of the best in the game. As already mentioned earlier, they are very fast, they spew morale ravaging fire, they do heaps of damage very quickly, and there's enough of them to reinforce during a battle without fear of losing the whole squad, and they are tough enough to do some tanking. 
This works very well with their insane speed as it means even when charging into enemy fire, they have usually crossed the no man's land so fast they were only exposed to it briefly. The heavy ranged infantry for Chaos are the Obliterators, and I like them a bit less. They are very powerful and literally have a weapon to deal with any enemy in the game. They've got LAS cannons for buildings and vehicles, assault cannons for infantry, plasma guns for heavy infantry, flamers for up close. However, they are slow, huge, and you only get one squad of four, and despite their impressive looking armour and size, I find them quite squishy, which really means that they end up being useful as support at the back of your army, but unlike their Terminator counterparts, useless at tanking damage and drawing fire. They have a teleport ability, but like a lot of teleports in this game, it has a cooldown when they reach their destination, which leaves them vulnerable for a few moments. This means that while you can use it to ambush and flank to and catch enemies in crossfire, you need to plan it because they could be wiped in seconds if you teleport them in range of anything with a plasma gun or heavy bolter. It's often better used as an escape plan when they get into trouble than as a strategic or tactical advantage. Chaos Space Marines themselves are less versatile than their loyalist counterparts. They only get heavy bolters and plasma guns as weaponry, but they make up for it in late game where they also get to go invisible. What's the only thing able to chew through heavily armoured infantry faster than a few squads of space marines with plasma guns? A few squads of chaos space marines with plasma guns ambushing you out of nowhere. So, you lose versatility on paper, but functionally you more than make up for that with the stealth bonus, and, well, the lack of missile launchers and flamers is hard to miss when plasma guns are just so overpowered anyway. Of course this means, unlike regular Space Marines, lacking missile launchers they are not your standard anti-vehicle, anti-building unit. But Chaos get the demons that are called Horrors, which are little pink guys that throw warp energy. These guys can be teleported in and they do a lot of damage to vehicles and buildings. They aren't especially fast and they do die pretty quickly. And they are useless against anything that isn't a vehicle or a building. But when used in their role, they are actually one of the best counters to vehicles and buildings in the game. You just assign your sacrificial circle building to a number, have a bunch of horrors garrisoned in it, and whenever a vehicle turret or building needs to go down, you summon them in to end things quickly. They can't teleport around on their own though, so if they get caught out or targeted without support, or some bigger threat to draw fire from them, they are pretty much sitting ducks. The Chaos Sorcerer can teleport and has a swath of powerful abilities that do great area of effect damage, and they're good at affecting enemy morale, and when used at the right moment a sorcerer can turn battles, but also he's rather weak and dies quite fast if he's the priority target. The Chaos Lord is basically the Force Commander, with durability exchanged for higher damage, a pretty typical Chaos trade-off. The Chaos Factions also get a Tier 1 melee unit, the Jetpack Jumping Raptors, and a Tier 2 unit, the Corn Berserkers. Neither of them can tank damage well enough to be considered heavy melee. In the earlier parts of the game, these two units can still be devastating, and rather make up for the lack of disruption in the Chaos roster, as they provide plenty of high damage, high speed, high mobility melee units to tie up enemy lines as much as you like. There are also the Chaos Cultists, who I think are probably the weakest unit in the game, but one of the cheapest. They're the starter unit for Chaos, and perfect for capping points, and also for, well, throwing into the meat grinder, it's kind of what they, they're for. They have grenade launchers, and they can also get plasma guns to a limited extent, and also they can cloak. So, they do have their utility, particularly in the very early game, and Occasionally, I'm sure there are some strats in the later game where they come in handy too. But, well, their obvious major drawback is they get chewed up faster than cut in a cow factory. So, you have to be pretty clever to use them well once the big guns are on the battlefield. Finally, their relic unit, the Bloodthirster, is one of the top tier relic units in the game. You have to sacrifice a leader unit to summon it, but it has an absolutely massive amount of HP. And while melee only, it does huge amounts of damage. It has wings and can jump too, so it is one of the ultimate units for leaping into dangerous enemy lines, drawing all of the fire and smashing defensive fortifications and bases. 
usually while the rest of your army floods in, while big demon daddy soaks up all the attention. It also loses HP constantly, even when not in battle, so it encourages you to just use the guy as aggressively as possible at all times. Overall, I find the Chaos faction thrives with early game rushes, and is particularly able to lock down a game and absolutely gank their opponent in the tier 2 mid game, when they can spam defilers and corn berserkers with horrors for heavy support. For me, I struggle using them in the late game in an average match when other factions have all of their options and counters available, or on the other hand, I find them easy to counter in the late game when they are my opponent. Of course, you're not going to see any tier 2 mid game rushes in my gameplay footage because I'm playing the campaign against AI and will only ever be running strats for engaging in the late game with Honor Guard as well, so you won't see me using Corn Berserkers or Raptors very much. But if you were to skirmish or multiplayer, I reckon you'd find Chaos and those two units in particular are highly viable for aggressive expansion in the early game and for mid-game tier 2 domination. Speaking of the campaign, there's a couple of things about Chaos in particular that I need to talk about. The thing is that I think Chaos gets shafted the most. Maybe it's because their army is designed to be so high damage and aggressive that the devs felt they needed a nerf. Maybe I'm just no good at them and don't get them, and others out there think I'm crazy saying they are the Gimped faction. But I think they are. First up, with their Honor Guard, just like the Space Marines, rather than getting full Honor Guard squads, Chaos gets single champion units, which have incredibly good stats for single units, but, of course, cannot be reinforced if they die. And without any other bodies in their squads to soak up fire, it doesn't matter how good their stat line is, they are going to go down quick if caught by the wrong kind of concentrated fire. They do have incredible damage, as to be expected, but for goodness sake, Eldar get a full Seer Council squadron for Honor Guard, so Chaos getting just single Corn Berserker champions seems pretty slack in comparison. It does of course gel well with the Space Marines, who face a similar situation, but they actually warrant the nerf, as they are such a well-rounded, high defensive, answers for everything army. The second point, and once again this may just be my opinion, but the Chaos Lord Eliphas the Inheritor gets ripped off in the war gear department. Sure, he ends up being one of the most high damage units in the entire game, easily able to put down almost anything one on one, but there is a big caveat which is that when you unlock all of his war gear, the last one transforms him into a demon prince. On paper, this sounds great, because another giant free stompy stompy ultra melee relic level unit, in addition to the bloodthirster, that you also get to start the round with, sounds OP. But the reality is that I find the demon prince weaker than the fully kitted out Eliphas that is one war gear step below. It doesn't have anything like the durability or usefulness of the Bloodthirster, and I wish it either wasn't in the game, was optional, or was way more powerful. I spend more time trying to protect the poor fragile demon prince than I do wrecking terror and havoc with him, and for a giant demonic monster that is just sad. Even more galling is by the late campaign when you have unlocked it, any advantage having a big monster on the field from the get-go would have evaporated thanks to high defence scores on provinces and large powerful enemy honour guards. Okay, enough overview about my least favourite faction. How did my playthrough with them go? Keeping in mind for time's sake, we aren't going to dwell too much on the nitty gritty here. So, my opening move is to attack the Imperial Guard in the Murad Swamplands, which goes well. I take the time to fortify it and it gets me the Helm of Lorgar, which gives me increased melee damage and health but crucially lets Eliphas reveal infiltrated units which as mentioned before is almost always my go-to first ability for war gear. This also unlocks a Chaos Champion Honor Guard unit. On my next turn I attack the Moriah Coast that's held by the Necrons as it's only one move away from getting the coveted Fury territory that is one of the two linchpins in our unbeatable strategy. I wreck the Necrons and take the time to fortify the territory. This earns me another Chaos Champion and a piece of war gear. I pick the demonic armor to make Eliphas appropriate in his spikiness and to give him more HP and defense against melee. Next turn, I attack the Erez Badlands and go for the almighty Fury power, which I take easily. And then, making the most out of my new second move in one turn power, I beeline for the spaceport and attack the Pavonian Heartland. 
I wipe them out and I scoop up a Raptor Champion for Honor Guard and grab the Runic Boots for War Gear, which grants more HP and immunity to Knockdown, which is an excellent bonus to have in this game as it prevents disruption of your Chaos Lord by things like big explosions or giant thwacky Thunder Hammers. After another end turn, the move that cinches Planetary Victory is next. Step 2 in our two-step program for victory, attacking the spaceport. The addition of the Raptor Champion is very helpful for this map, as its mobility and jump pack ability are great for snapping up servitors fast. I grab them all in about 5 minutes flat and get the Demonic Gauntlet's war gear, increasing my damage and health. I can attack anywhere I please with my extra turn, so I attack the 5 defense Western Barons held by the Necron here for a threefold reason. Reason 1 is one of two territories that have the heroes on it that could attack the spaceport next turn. Reason 2 it has 5 defense and could go to 6 next turn and I'd rather claim it with one enemy base to defeat rather than two. And reason 3 is the honor guard unit I win is a defiler and some early game crab demon machine armor backup is a very nice bonus to have. While I take the territory and fortify it easily like normal, it is worth noting this little glitch happened where the Necron Lord seems to have frozen for no reason. I don't think I've ever seen this happen before or again, so I wouldn't worry too much about it if I were you, but it's a pretty cool little bit of footage. I don't earn any war gear for this victory, but I'm very happy to score the Defiler. I have to fight my first defense as Chaos at the end of this turn, and it's the Imperial Guard who challenged me first on the Mariah Coast, and they do not have a good time at all. I don't get any war gear or nothing from it. On my next turn, I decide it's time to get the next round of not quite as game winning, but still amazing bonuses and attack the Vandian coast to get me my sweet free resource bonus. And then follow that up with attacking the Assyria forests to get the awesome buff to the population cap. Next, I attack the Panria lowlands because the space marines are mustering up their army there and I need to protect the spaceport's border. I fortify the territory and wipe the marines out of the lowlands, which should really piss them off because it gives me a perfect staging ground to attack their stronghold. It also nets me a Corn Berserker champion for my honor guard. Then I fight a defense against the Imperial Guard in the Pavonian Heartland, which nets me the Banner of Chaos piece of war gear, which gives me a HP buff and damages enemy morale. Then I attack the Space Marines on the Oriston Plains next, as it's the last province bordering the spaceport, allowing me to rest easy knowing my OP game strat is locked in for good. I fortify it, of course, and get me another Corn Berserker champion. With that, I have both my key territories and bonuses impossible for the AI to attack, and I'm basically set to overrun Cronus with the powers of Chaos. I've also completely surrounded and cut off the Space Marine, and seeing as it's the only stronghold you haven't seen me do when I played as the Space Marine, it's time to say goodbye to the Blood Ravens. The Space Marine stronghold isn't one I'd recommend leaving till late, although it's not so hard that you need to attack it first either. In the late game, the Space Marines do come at you with quite a powerful first wave, and even more annoying, they often have whirlwind artillery that are only a hair's breadth out of range from bombarding your actual base at the start of the map. They can hit the middle point of your starting strategic points with it, so that's something to watch out for. Because I have attacked them early on, I don't need to worry about that, and my honor guard more than outstrips their opening assault. The only thing you really got to worry about on this map is the little forward base on the right hand side that lets the space marines drop orbital bombardments on your head. The joy is that if you take the strategic point in that base, you can then drop orbital bombardments on their head. So I always prioritize it first. Watch out for powerful space marine defensive formations all over the map, as well as mines everywhere. So don't just charge around blindly, make sure you've got detectors and make sure you take advantage of terrain. Kite and draw out defenders so you can just deal with them a little bit at a time. If you charge in with a big army on this map you can take some real heavy losses quite quickly so I recommend a more methodical approach. After you've taken the orbital relay forward base off the space marine, I recommend continuing to push up the right hand side of the map and take out the base that provides them reinforcements. There's some Terminators and Dreadnoughts and plenty of turrets defending it. So, I recommend using that orbital bombardment to help soften it up. After that's taken care of, sweep through the base and to the left to take the point at the centre of the map, then continuing to the left to take out the other forward base generating reinforcements, and then turning your attention to the relic above that. 
Once again, it's very well defended, but nothing a bit of a methodical approach and an orbital bombardment can't crack. All that's left after that is their actual fortress proper, which has an outer part and an inner part. The outer part is fairly easy to breach, just a few tanks and a lot of turrets and some squadrons. The inner part will roast you alive if you overextend thanks to some heavy bolter squadrons, so orbital bombard them and charge while they are being disrupted. Watch out for the assault terminators and abundance of librarians. Fortunately, the AI isn't too bright. They don't take advantage of such a combo and you won't have to worry about invulnerable assault termies. Anyway, once you've cracked the choke point that leads to the inner sanctum of their fortress, it's a cakewalk and you should see the victory screen within a minute or two. Enjoy your two flavour paragraphs. Apparently Abaddon the Despoiler himself is very pleased to see the Blood Ravens dead for reasons that even the narrator calls out as confusing. Once again, we're going to skip defence missions unless we win some war gear from them. Just note that because I'm conquering strongholds and booting races from the campaign as I go, instead of waiting till I have all of the provinces, it means I fight a lot less defences overall. Just remember in terms of overall strategy, if I've taken the time to fortify a territory, it is practically unlosable. So, next I take and fortify the Rian Floodplains Province Island Chain Thingo that's next to the Orc Stronghold. It has another Chaos Raptor, Honor Guard, as I find them so useful for capping strategic points in the early game. That nets me some war gear, so I go for the melee weapon upgrade and get my Chaos Lord a cool scythe called Man Reaper for extra damage. Then I go for the Janus Savannah, as the Necron army is occupying it and they could attack my one defense province, and I do not want that, so bye bye Necrons, back to your stronghold. This nets me a Chaos Champion on a guard unit. The Rian jungle with another Raptor Champion up for grabs is my next move, and because I already have all the territories surrounding it, I don't even have to fortify this province. I can just rush them with my Honor Guard in the opening minute, wipe them out and claim my Raptor Champion. No sweat. With my second move for the turn, I strike the Agamar Desert, which will net me a tasty Chaos Sorcerer for the Honor Guard. The tower only recently took this territory off the orcs, so it is particularly weakly defended. However, it borders two strongholds and some Eldar-held territory, so defense missions on this one are inevitable. It needs a good fortify. I win some war gear as well as the Honor Guard Sorcerer. I go for the final upgrade of the melee weapon, the Accursed Crozius. I think that's how you say that, which makes Eliphas do a whopping 621 damage a hit. This makes him a threat to absolutely anything in the game. I end turn, and another round of defences are quickly behind me, and I manage to nab Eliphas the plasma pistol piece of war gear. Seeing as I'm already next door to them, and they have no other territories left, and I love to get them out of the game early, I go for the Tau stronghold. So this is the first stronghold we are looking at for the second time, and I'm not going to re-canvas the territory too much, just know that this is my least favourite faction on the stronghold I find the hardest in the game, and I had a pretty frustrating time slamming my head into never-ending waves of greater Narlocks and crude hounds. But I got there in the end, and I got to see my precious two paragraphs of flavour text. After booting the tower off the planet, I decided it's the Imperial Guard's turn next, and I moved my army in position to attack them on the next turn. I fight off a few defences against the Orcs and Necrons and then make my move on Victory Bay. The Imperial Guard Stronghold is never too difficult, but it seems yet again I didn't use my standard strategy and instead charged across the artillery bombarded No Man's Land with a bunch of defilers with my infantry and rhinos behind them. I teleported horrors in from the sacrificial circle to deal with vehicles and buildings. This works very well and is testament to Chaos's focus on being good at direct assaults even on heavily defended positions. The whole stronghold is done in just a bit over an hour and I get some cool footage of demons overrunning Imperial positions. For some reason the Bloodthirster transformation is always at a really low frame rate. Anyway, I get the special paragraphs and earn myself double war gear. That lets me get the multi-melter to replace the plasma gun. It also lets Eliphas achieve a full demonic ascension, which I already mentioned I actually hate. 
I think it's an absolute downgrade from Eliphaz one step removed from Damon Ascension, and he goes from a reliable, high damage tank to a fragile giant target that needs to be babysat. Or maybe I'm just using him wrong. He does look cool striding around the battlefield and planetary maps, so points for the style. Anyway, I end turn and win a few more easy defense missions and then attack the Vandimar Mountains, a 10 defense province held by the Necrons, but with a very appealing possessed marine champion to earn for my honor guard. Knowing full well I'm going to be wiping out the Necrons next turn, I feel no need to fortify the territory. I blow both their bases up, take my possessed marine champion and gear up to take down the Necron stronghold. There's not much to say except that Chaos looked good overrunning a bunch of Necrons just like they do overrunning a bunch of humans. The two paragraphs grant you a cool little glimpse into how Necrons and Chaos relate, indicating that even at this relatively early point in canon, that the Necrons have plenty of anti-Chaos tech that needs to be dealt with. After another defense or two, it's time to take on the Eldar and boot them out of the Deem's Northlands and secure myself a demon kin obliterator and complete the whole honor guard set. The Eldar do not have a good time getting into melee with centuries old warp infested chaos champions at all and soon enough I have conquered the territory. Then it's the Eldar's turn to get booted off the planet. As always, I fend off the initial attack and then sweep out to the left to deal with the chaos destruction. Not really surprised to see Eliphaz not getting on with the schismatic sorcerer from the Night Lords on this map. After all, they are described as schismatic. Then I follow my groove and move through to the centre of the map, release the Squigoth and take out the Orcs. So, as always, I go about my unorthodox method of winning this particular stronghold, where I wipe out the Eldar base instead of defend the critical webway gate points. How do you go about this as chaos? Well. We use the indirect fire artillery piece in the defilers to bombard their key production structures through the fog of war. And on top of that, we spam the bloodthirster on suicide runs as often as we can. And we make sure we get really cool footage of our fifth or sixth bloodthirster taking down their mega avatar of Cain. Upon victory, a lovely two paragraphs go to the effort of describing how the Chaos bust open all of the Eldar's special soul stone thingos and feed the delicious contents to their evil gods. They certainly know how to have a good time. This leaves the entire planet conquered except for three provinces. Apart from the Orc stronghold, these remaining provinces I see as highly skippable if desired. First I go to the Ariel Highlands to mop up the last of the Eldar and for completionist's sake. Nothing to see here, they get wiped out fast. Next comes the province I really have to talk about yet again. The Hyperion Peaks. The no base, just the army you were given ugly duckling of Dark Crusade. What I want to say about it is, much like the war gear, Chaos get absolutely brassed, like ripped off completely compared to basically every other faction on this map. See, Space Marines get two Land Raiders, two of their Relic Units. Most factions get quite a powerful army here. Chaos, they don't even get one Relic Unit, not even one measly Bloodthirster. And instead you get a Demon Prince, making for two Demon Princes if you have already upgraded Eliphas into one. And let me tell you, they are not up for the job. If you just got a single Bloodthirster, this map would be a walk. But without them, the Chaos Army is pretty weak. And even though I know I've beaten this level with Chaos in the past, this time around, I just couldn't be bothered. I decided to skip it all together and spare myself the restarting and the frustration. Hell, I even came back and started a new campaign as Chaos and attacked the Hyperion Peaks province as soon as I could so its defense score was as low as possible and it was still an absolute bitch I couldn't be bothered to overcome. So call me weak if you want, I wasn't willing to slam my head into the wall that is the Hyperion Peaks as Chaos over and over until I knocked it down even for you, dear viewer. Although, I suppose if enough people demanded it, I would, but that's for another video. Let's wrap up the Chaos playthrough. So, one more defense against the Orcs, and then it's time to take out their stronghold. 
I always save the Orc Stronghold to last because it's so easy, even if their initial attack can be quite fearsome. I just like to have that nice, easy ending locked into the game. The usual strat of just blowing into their satellite bases long enough to wipe out their banners, then grabbing the relic of the Moor of Gork, then taking out Gorgarts works very well. The Bloodthirster being particularly useful for wiping out banners. Overall, it's a nice, easy win for the Chaos Faction. I enjoy my final two paragraphs and then get the delight that is the Chaos Faction's closing cinematic. Unsurprisingly, Chaos turn the planet into a living hellscape and then use it to launch terrible crusades on the rest of the Imperium. A big win for Pandemonium. The next faction I completed a playthrough of the game with are the Orcs. So the Orcs are a horde army and have different rules for their population cap. Instead of a limit of 20 and squadrons counting toward the cap, they have a limit of 100 and individual Orcs count toward the cap. They also have a WAAA counter that goes up as you build WAAA banners, which also increases your Orc population cap. Increasing the wah counter is also how you go up the tech tree. I personally find orcs quite easy to play, as they are rather straightforward being a horde army. A lot of the same basics apply, but instead of having a few key melee units to tank fire and tie up key enemy squads, instead you have a whole crazy horde of them with a war boss at the centre. You do have knob squads which can be loaded out with power claws for very heavy melee units, but often I find just saturating the enemy in as many regular orc boys as possible is even more effective. The orcs have extremely powerful heavy infantry melting units in the flash kits who will absolutely annihilate basically anything that isn't an armoured vehicle or building in seconds. They are kind of like super heavy bolter squadrons. The orcs also get very competent anti-vehicle and building units in tank busters who make up for a slow rate of fire on their rockets by having great range and being really sneaky. Being able to infiltrate means they can ambush and take out enemy armour with very little trouble. On top of that, the war boss, fully upgraded, might be the single most powerful unit in both offence and defence in the entire game. The other hero, the mech boy, is also endlessly useful and very powerful. He can teleport, provide extra defense to your units with his energy shields, disable enemy vehicles, detect infiltrated units, and repair your own vehicles in the field like a builder unit. They also have the heaviest, slowest of all heavy melee units in the mega armored knobs, each one a mini war boss. They also get mad docks that can make any squadron pseudo invulnerable briefly, as well as plant big bombs. They get shooter boys that make a good early game ranged anti-infantry unit before you unlock flash kits. And of course, regular boys ain't much on their own, but can gank absolutely anything in big numbers and can be given flamers to make them pretty good at wiping out buildings in the early game. The Orc Horde can be especially dangerous if the war boss uses his WAAA ability, which provides a whole landslide of bonuses and can turn the tide of a battle instantly especially if you lose morale, and the orcs aren't great at keeping their morale up in the first place. They also have a reliable, if a bit fragile, mobility option in the jetpack jumping storm boys. In terms of vehicles, the orcs ones are scrappy but effective. The truck transport is one of the fastest units in the entire game, and is so very good at its job. And it isn't half bad at providing anti-infantry support as well, though it does die quite quickly. The war track is a ridiculously useful and spammable mid-game vehicle. By default it is fast, moderately tough and well equipped to hit and run enemy vehicles and buildings, but it can be loaded out with a bomb chucker that gives it a short range disruptive artillery attack that sends infantry flying, making it excel as support for your horde. Although. Like all orc explosives, just as good at hitting your own units as your opponents. The Killer Can Walker is ridiculously tough and ridiculously dangerous in melee, making them awesome for drawing fire and breaking defensive lines. 
They can also be loaded out with a big shooter or rocket launcher so they can provide a bit of versatility in terms of anti-infantry or anti-vehicle support. And finally, the looted tank is one of the toughest, tankiest tanks in the game that can take a lot of punishment. It has two sponsored mounted shooters that are good for dealing with infantry and one very big gun that makes the looted tank the orc's main answer to artillery rather than anti-armor like the other faction's tanks. The thing about the looted tank is it does great damage and provides plenty of disruption if it hits infantry but is heinously inaccurate probably landing a shell on the intended target only one out of four shots. So your own troops are going to cop it if you fire this thing into a melee battle, and your boys will love every second of it. Finally, the Orcs relic unit, the Squigoth, is a transport, has great ranged and melee damage against all targets, and has heaps of HP. It also has a charge ability which will indiscriminately crush anything caught in the path, friend or foe. A theme for the entire army. This makes the Squigoth one of the best all-rounders of all the relic units in the game, although master of none, and it makes it a good equivalent to the Space Marine Land Raider, except with melee. To top it off, almost every single building the Orcs have has guns all over it and can shoot back. While they aren't especially dangerous to late-game units, this does make them quite deadly in the early game, allowing the Orcs to focus a lot on using their numbers in the opening parts of a match to expand and lock down as many strategic points as quickly as they can, knowing that an enemy's early game rush catching your base empty is still going to take a lot of losses trying to nab a few early Orc building kills. Overall, they are a scrappy horde army that only a fool would underestimate, as they can absolutely overrun you early and blow you the hell up late in the game. They aren't one of my favourites to play as against other people, but against AI, I think I might actually have the easiest and most straightforward time with them of all the factions in the game. They are the army designed for you to actually get away with building a giant green death ball and just sending it into your enemy's base provided you don't mind losses, which you would be crazy to mind with orcs. Collateral damage is a bonus for them. They even have a late game bit of tech that makes building your regular boys free, so they really want you to just spam orcs at your squad cap and drown your opponents in a green tide. That's not to say they don't have the ingredients to enact the same kind of tactics other factions do. They absolutely do, it's just all a bit more scrappy and likely to blow up in your own face and send your own boys flying. And that's great. Everyone on the Orc team is having a great time, no matter how many casualties or who is responsible for them. And that's how it should be. To the playthrough. The Orcs start the furthest away from our two key objective territories of any of the factions. So our strategy is a little different for them, but only a little. The most awkward territory, the Hyperion Peaks, is, for every other faction, held by the Orcs at the start of the game, and it very rarely falls out of their hands. But when you are playing as Orcs, it starts in the hands of the Tau. One thing to note about the Tau is that their tech tree does not lend itself to defensive emplacements. They don't get a dedicated gun turret structure at all, and instead the devs cheat them in by placing their tier 1 listening post just not on a strategic point. They do have a powerful defensive unit to make up for it in the broadside battle suit, but it is not very effective in the hands of the AI, and they are also one of the slower races, so this is one of the only scenarios where the Hyperion Peaks is actually a bit of a pushover, given that its bonus is actually quite good and makes winning the game much easier. We normally don't go for it just because it isn't worth the hassle. For the Orcs, it is our key first stepping stone to victory. With that in mind, it isn't possible to attack that territory on turn 1 because of the wall between territories. But we can get it on turn 2 if we attack the Agamar Desert first, which is also held by the Tau. The Agamar Desert will win me a nice honor guard shooter boy squad, and of course, I fortify the crap out of it. I also earn my first bit of war gear for my first conquest and I choose the Boss Pole upgrade, which not only increases the War Boss's health, but it increases both Squad and Vehicle Cap, which are great bonuses for any faction, but for a Horde faction like Orcs, any cap increase is a devastating advantage. Next turn, I take the planned action and attack the Hyperion Peaks, and 
boy, compared to Chaos, Orcs get an absolute walk in the park for this level. Not only are early game Tau a vastly easier army to deal with on this map, but the Orcs get two Squigoths, four looted tanks, two mega armoured knob squads, and let's face it, few other factions are as well suited to just reinforcing their existing squads forever without production buildings as the Orcs are. So long as you stick to the previously outlined strategy of rushing the central critical point and then wiping out two of the three bases production buildings as soon as possible, you will have no problems at all. I used the Squigoths to take out one base while the rest of the army took out the other and had no problems. Then you can hold that critical point and recover before attacking that final base and then the map is just mopping up their structures. Upon victory, I get the forward bases bonus, which will let me spend planetary requisition on starting around with some buildings already built. This is a critical advantage for either perpetrating early game rushes yourself or defending against an enemy's honor guard rush. Seeing as those are basically the only two major strats for the average map in this game, it's a great bonus to have. And now that we have the Hyperion Peaks under our belts, it's time to resume the regular strategy of getting the spaceport and fury bonuses as soon as possible, like with any other factions. Because we are already sitting on the Hyperion Peaks province, it means we are only two turns away from attacking the spaceport, so that's what we'll do next. So in order to do that, we'll hit the Western Barons next, also held by the Tau, winning us a heavy shooter boy squad. Overrunning the Tau and fortifying the territory is an easy win, and I even take some time to take in some of the details of the map. Ooh, would you look at that? Some nice details there, isn't it? Then on end turn, I have to defend the same territory against the Necrons, but it is again an easy win because I took the time to fortify, and I get my first defensive victory war gear, and I choose the bigger claw to make the war boss's melee just that much more crushing. Next is our beloved spaceport, which for once we are attacking with a substantial army. Now, does that prevent me from simply rushing all the servitors? No, of course not. So as usual, we end turn victorious, but with no fortifications. Of course, now we can attack any non-stronghold province on the map. And can you guess which one? Yep, it's the Erez Badlands with Fury. We are about to become unstoppable. Once again, as I actually have a bit of an army going into this, it's fairly trivial to wipe out the slow Necrons, and I even get a half-decent fortification down before hitting the kill cap victory condition as well. I win some war gear, and choose the faster legs, as speed is a very useful thing in this game. Then, using my second move this turn, granted to me by Fury, I choose to attack the only hero that can dislodge me from the spaceport next turn, which is the Necrons on the Vandemar Mountains here. Low defense early game territory equates to another easy victory, and a substantial fortification. I win an honor guard tank buster squad, which gets me that critical early game anti-vehicle option. I in turn happy my spaceport is safe for the moment, and I have to fight a defense on the Erez Badlands from the Imperial Guard. Fortunately, being well fortified, it isn't much of a challenge, and for some reason the objective where you have to please the Chaos Demon with kills doesn't repeat, so it's one short rush and it's all over. Then I go for the Pavonian Heartland, for three reasons you should be across by now. One, it borders the spaceport. Two, it's got five defense and is in danger of ticking over to six defense and having two bases to take down. And three, it has an excellent honor guard unit in the mega armored knobs. As usual, it's a stomp where I take time to do a very large fortification. But one cool thing is that the Imperial Guard are the only other Horde army in Dark Crusade, so the matchup with the Orcs can be spectacular sometimes. Ooh, would you look at that? It's really spectacular. Isn't that amazing? I might record over this, blah, blah, blah. I get the war gear for the 3 to 1 kill ratio because of this. I go for the Mega Heavy Armor to give the war boss a huge HP boost. With my second move, and no immediate threat to the spaceport, I opt to once again ruin the Necron's day and attack the Janus Savannah, as it has 5 defense and every 6 defense territory I can avoid the better. Can you guess? Another cake walk and fortify, and I get myself an honor guard mad dock, 
whose health regen and temp pseudo invulnerability for squads is always useful in the prone to collateral damage orc army. Using my two moves on my next turn, I decide it's time to pick up the other two worthwhile bonuses. So first up I take out and fortify the Arceria Forest to pick up the squad and vehicle cap upgrades that come from increased manpower. And then the Vandian Coast gets the same treatment to secure industrial production and the tasty tasty bonus resources it bestows. Then I end turn and fend off a defence on the Pavonian Heartland from the Imperial Guard and get myself a nice bit of gubbins in the Red Iron Gob for extra damage and HP. When it's my turn again, I decide to get me some big heavy knobs for my Honor Guard and attack the poorly defended Imperial Guard held Oriston Plains. One good old fortify and conquer later, and it's the Tau's turn to lose some territory to the Orc Horde. So I assault and fortify the Panria Lowlands and win myself a war track. Then I fight an unremarkable defence on end turn, and I finally decide it's time to take this campaign a bit more seriously, and that Chaos will be the first to go. A reminder that usually my preference is to take out the Tau and Chaos Strongholds first if possible, but in order to attack the Chaos Stronghold, I have to take one of the provinces next door. So I go for the Rian Jungle, as it doesn't have the Chaos Army sitting on it, and as I get two moves in a turn, I'll be able to wipe their stronghold before their army can respond, and that will, in turn, also boot their army from the game, leaving their remaining provinces as easy pickings to clean up. On top of that, I won't need to fortify many of them as they are surrounded with provinces I already conquered, so I'll just be able to rush my honor guard and have the whole thing finished in a few minutes. As mentioned before, this map can be a doozy defending against Chaos's opening rush, but because I attacked it early, it was absolutely no problem. As usual, I turtle and set up some defensive lines to hold against the AI's steady pressure. Then, once I've amassed a decent army, I send it up to the bridge to the left to wipe out the base there. Then I push through to the relic, collect the prisoners, move over to the centre of the map and take the critical point, which ends Chaos's gimmicky blood pulse. Then I take a Squigoth-led army from my HQ and use a bit of a pincer manoeuvre on the bases along the right-hand side of the map before assaulting the main Chaos HQ and their warp portal. The Mad Doc's fight and juice and the pseudo-invulnerability it brings is really handy for breaking through their defences as is the Squigoth. Then that's the end for Chaos this run. We get our cinematic and our first precious two paragraphs of flavour for the Orc run. Gorgots takes Eliphas's head, puts it on a pike, and calls himself Daemon Killer. Rather fitting. For my efforts, I get another bit of war gear, and this time I choose the Big Orns for even more damage and health. With Chaos booted, I end my turn and fend off an attack from the Tau which earns me another piece of war gear, and this time I get some charming skulls, which increases the war boss's health and does morale damage to the enemy. Then I decide it's the Tau's turn to get the old boot treatment. Serves him right for attacking me after all. So I use one move to get to a province I already conquered next door, and then the next move to initiate my assault on the Tau capital, Orez Tashin. As usual, I am grateful to have attacked the Tau Stronghold early, as they have such a nasty opening rush when left till late game. My Honor Guard is easily able to repel them, and I take my time fending off their attacks as I build up a large base. As mentioned earlier, I find this by far the most difficult stronghold. The Tau just never stop spamming reinforcements and flanking you, and they have long-ranged high-damage railgun sporting units like broadsides and hammerhead tanks, as well as their relic unit, the Greater Narlak, posted every few metres and around every corner. On top of that, they also never stop sending waves of these at your base. The Orcs as a faction are among the best suited to deal with these difficult conditions. First is that Orcs are a powerful melee army and the Tau are more of a high-tech ranged army that suck in melee. So if the Orcs can cover ground fast and tie them up in melee, they've already won. The Tau do have their crude allies, but they just aren't quite as good at crumping gits as the Orcs are. Even just on a cultural law level, the Orcs are a good matchup against the Tau because you think nothing of spamming Orcs into a powerful defences and taking losses by the hundreds. And because of the way the Orcs' pop cap and tech tree works, on a game level you are also encouraged to play them in a high losses, lots of spam kind of way. 
where, with another faction, I might approach powerful railgun defences gingerly with an infiltrated spotter, drop artillery on it, and then move in my forces in a pincer operation only once it was safe. With orcs, you just select your whole horde, pop the wah ability on your war boss, and charge. Of course, it helps to make sure you have your forces hot keyed so you can target appropriate damage types with their matching vulnerabilities. But other than that, the Horde mostly takes care of things by itself, acting as both damage sponge and unstoppable death ball, all at the low, low cost of some measly dispensable orcs. I find the orc transport, the truck, is also invaluable on this mission, ferrying orcs from my base to the front lines reinforcing my horde and allowing me to get the unwieldy screaming throng around faster. So the overall strategy here is to use the mech boys teleport and detector abilities to take out all the stealth suit snipers positioned around the map. While my honor guard defends my base and my regular army uses truck transport supported by looted tanks to first wipe out the towers inner ring of forward bases and then their outer ring of major bases. This works a charm and leaves me with the relic in my hands and a squig off to breach their main fortress. Just because I like to be thorough, I even make sure I wipe out every tower unit and building on the map before I complete the objective for the win condition, which is killing the tower leader unit known as the ethereal. I earn my two paragraphs, and this time around the tower manage to get the corpse of their ethereal out before the orcs get it. So your war boss, Gorgarts, doesn't get to mount his head on a stick. He is so angered by this, he kills a bunch of his own orcs and gets the nickname Rage Screamer. I'm sure we've all played an online game or two with someone who also deserves this nickname. I also managed to nab one more bit of war gear, and I choose the Mega Claw for extra crumpin. I fend off some attacks from Space Marines and Imperial Guard, and it turns out I must have made a mistake and didn't record a gaming session here where I took a few more provinces, so I apologise for that, but fortunately I remembered to record again in time for us to pick up at the next really important move I make, which is attacking the next stronghold, the Imperial Guard. It goes without saying that, as always, I fend off the opening assault and then build myself a nice large defensible base. This time around, I use what I think is the best strategy for this map, which... I know I'm repeating myself, but assuming your starting base is in the southeast corner, is to attack the small base immediately to your north, cross the river and take down the large base there, then time a charge through the giant Titan Cannon Trench to flank the other major base and artillery positions in the west, then go take out the Air Command and Bane Blade production in the bottom southwest corner before pushing the northwest corner and winning over the Rebel Imperial Guardsmen and taking over the Titan Gun for yourself. After that, all that's left is to assault their final stronghold in the northeast corner. Much like against the Tau, I think a well-played Orc army has some natural advantages against the Imperial Guard. The Guard are also a horde army, but they are a ranged army with lots of bodies but low morale squishy bodies. Just like the Tau, their powerful ranged weaponry will punish you as your army charges across no man's land to tie them up in melee but the Orcs are the faction best suited to taking losses in those kind of scenarios. The speed of the Orc trucks and vehicles also greatly help them navigate timed hazards like the Titan Gun. And let's face it, there's few things as good at completely ruining the morale of a bunch of squishy guardsmen as a horde of bloodlust crazed Orcs getting in amongst them with power claws and burners, and the fact that tank busters are by default infiltrated means that you have a fairly easy time dealing with the powerful guardsman armor, as the AI is rarely bright enough to use the Imperial Guard's various methods of detecting infiltration well enough to counter them. Oh, and flash kits absolutely chew through guardsmen like they were made out of paper, and it's true, flash kits chew through most things, but as guardsmen are only regular infantry and not heavy infantry, they don't stand a chance and basically melt the second a flash git looks at them. Guardsmen do have very powerful disruption on their side that could negate many of these advantages, but the AI just isn't that clever at using them, so you should be sweet. This time, the precious two paragraphs outline that basically the orcs don't care that the old Titan cannon is a holy relic, so they tear it to pieces and loot everything worth having to make their own kit better, and the war boss gets called Gun Smasher. 
I get the final two pieces of war gear by completing this stronghold, and so I choose the only two pieces left, the custom shooter and the mega blaster, giving my war boss some much needed extra dacker and completing his getup. Phew! Boy, fully upgraded Gorguts is a beast unlike anything else in the game, able to tank a whole army by himself and rip it apart at range or close up, no problem. Even buildings and structures stand little chance of not being flattened by him. That's how a war boss should be. A couple of successful defences later, and I decide I've had enough of the Necrons. It opens with the usual defend and fortify routine of course, but this time around I decide I've had enough of being a completionist and decide to go for the old shortcut. So rather than blow up every Necron on every inch of the map like I normally would, I just play the win condition objective, which basically involves getting a substantial army into their base in the southwest corner, destroying only the monolith on the side you were attacking from, as well as the other buildings and defenders, then rushing your war boss to the spot where you plant the bomb. Then stick him in a truck as soon as possible and use its speed boost ability and get him back to the extraction point at the back of your base and just leave your army behind. This skips about half the content to the map, but it's half the time. Works with any faction too. Only downside is that you might lose your honor guard and have to repurchase them, which isn't a big deal. As if you were doing it late game, you'll have so much planetary requisition every turn from all of your provinces, it won't take long to be able to afford to repurchase all your honor guard. And if you were doing it early game, you won't have very much honor guard to purchase, so it won't take you long either. As for the actual Orc vs Necron matchup, well, Orcs can take advantage of the fact that Necrons are slow and high value, even if they are very tough. The Orcs can concentrate fire on one at a time and whittle them down while tying them up with cheap or even free boys. Once again, the AI just doesn't have the smarts to use the abilities and tactics available to the Necrons that can counter this kind of play. So, Flash Gits are just as good at melting Necrons as they are at Imperial Guard, even if it takes them a little longer. When you earn your victory paragraphs, they actually outline how Gorgots blows up the caverns, with swaths of his own boys still in there, leaving them to be crushed. It then goes on to say that all the other orcs thought this was hilarious, and they start calling Gorgots Death Killer. So it's pretty cool that for the orcs, my quick cheese strat is actually canonical. A couple more defences are won, and then it's the Space Marine's turn to get clobbered. The initial Space Marine assault is easily dealt with, but they have a whirlwind raining artillery down on the base from the get-go. Fortunately, this is what Gork and Mork made the mad mech for, so I teleport him over to the cliff the whirlwind is bombarding from and have him take care of it. So, after I have a good base with some decent defences, I take an army to the east and capture the orbital relay, watching out for their own orbital bombardments on the way. Then pushing further to the northeast, I wipe out their base for receiving reinforcements, making sure to turn their own orbital bombardments against them. Then I head west back to the strategic point in the centre of the map, destroy the Space Marine defences there. Following that, I then continue to wipe out the base to the far east, with pushing the relic point to the northeast the final task before attacking their main fortress. Boy, does the orbital bombardment come in handy breaching the relic defences. Assaulting the outer fortress is easy enough as the defences are sparsely spaced, but the inner fortress can be tricky as they have lots of librarians that use word of the emperor to give the whole group pseudo invulnerability. Although, as mentioned with the Chaos playthrough, they don't really use this to full effect. But most dangerous of all, they have the classic formula we use ourselves to be so devastating, tying you up in a choke point with heavy melee assault terminators while infantry melting heavy bolter squads concentrate fire on your units. A smart player counters this with something like say, oh, an orbital bombardment or disruption from something like your looted tank's big boom gun. Once that's done, there's nothing stopping you shredding their base and taking the victory. The wholly two paragraphs outline that the orcs take a lot of losses but get to mount a lot of space marine heads on sticks and that makes them so happy they call Gorguts blood spiller. Back on the planetary map, it's just me and the Eldar left, so that leaves me no option but to attack the Deem's Northlands. 
It is an easy victory despite the 10 defense rating as I am one unit shy of a full honor guard and can successfully rush and wipe out one base immediately and then take my time to crush the remaining Eldar. With that victory, I earn my final honor guard unit, a killer can walker. Then back to the planetary map. I only have two provinces left, and even though you could skip it for completionist's sake, I do go ahead and boot the Eldar out of the Ariel Highlands, even though its bonus is essentially useless to me. It goes exactly how the Deem's Northlands went. Of course, I know I won't have to defend it, so I don't even bother to fortify it. Then, finally it's time to cinch this and leave Kronos exclusively awash with grain. No points for guessing the first thing we do is defend the initial assault and build a nice big base with nice defences. As usual, after I've got an army and a good base, I attack the Chaos Army on the east and earn myself some reinforcements. Then I backtrack to the centre of the map, wipe out all the webweight gates there, then heading northwest, I release the enemy Squigoths and use them as cover to attack the rogue Orc base. Then heading west across the ice bridge to the Elder Fortress proper, I... As outlined earlier, don't go for the mission objectives and capture the critical points, but instead sweep around the triangle shape the three points mark the corners of, clearing them of all Eldar units and structures. I establish a forward base by the relic point at the apex of the triangle and then start my siege on their base. Remember, you can just capture and defend the critical points, but clearing out the Eldar is one of my favourite things to do in this game, so I won't be doing that with any faction. As outlined before, no real army in this game has a high enough pop cap to be able to assault the Eldar base outright without you taking down some of their structures that constantly spawn fire prisms and other powerful units. Orcs have two good options for dealing with this one. One is to use the artillery on the looted tanks and attack ground where the structures are. The other is to use the Mad Doc's Fight and Juice ability to give pseudo invulnerability for just long enough for the Mad Doc to get in and use his bomb planting ability. The problem with this one is that the abundance of fire prisms still knock him off his feet, even if they can't kill him for the duration of the ability. They can knock him over so often he basically can't get near the base. So I settled for a third option to speed things up, which is just suicide charging the Squigoth in over and over again with looted tank artillery support until those three support portals that keep spamming fire prisms are dead. The war boss can also come in handy here as he has enough HP to tank the Elder Onslaught for a little bit as well. Once that's done, you're free to mop up the rest of the Elder, including the super mega buffed just for this level Avatar of Cain. My final victory paragraphs for the Orcs. It just says the orcs killed and smashed everything and managed to separate Taldia's head from her body. They start calling Gorgut's Ghost Killer. But next is that final reward, the victory cinematic. It basically outlines that the orcs pillage the whole planet and then use it as a staging ground to launch a wah that devastates huge parts of both the Imperium and Tau space. What else did you really expect? It does, however, have the narrator in his sweet voice reading out all of Gorgatz's earned new epithets in a row. Headhunter, Rage Screamer, Blood Spiller, Death Killer, Daemon Killer, Gun Smasher, and Ghost Killer. And if that ain't enough reward for a few hours of your time, I don't know what is. The anime mecha-inspired Tau are the next race I completed the campaign with. They are one of the two new races added for the Dark Crusade expansion, and while their population cap isn't different like the Orcs one is, their tech tree works a little different to everyone else's. The Tau have a tech tree that splits in two, and lets you go down one path or the other. You make the choice by choosing to build either the Montcar command post or the Kion command post. Once one is built, you cannot build the other, or any of the units and upgrades associated with it. This means that Tau's early game is mostly the same, but they have a couple of distinct options for their late game. Overall, as a faction, the Tau are highly advanced technologically, and are an expensive pew 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 high damage at long range army with some good melee options. Can you guess where the split between Montcar and Kaon is? Yeah, 
Monkar doubles down on long range pew 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 at the expense of melee, and Kaon gives them some much needed tough melee balance, but at the expense of locking out the biggest, most pew pew est units they have. The Tau themselves, as a species, don't actually do any of the getting up close and personal melee fighting, and are absolutely feeble in this context. So instead, they have an ally species known as the Kroot, who do the dirty work for them. The Kroot just happen to be carnivorous, and believe that by eating the remains of their enemies, they gain their strength. So, this is a deal that works out for the both of them. It also reveals the Tau as less of a xenophobic we must annihilate any species that isn't our own race than, well, just about any other race in the Warhammer setting. But that doesn't mean they are the good guys, because there are no good guys in 40k. The Tau instead believe in an ideology known as the greater good, and despite it being much more accepting of aliens and new technology than, say, the Imperium is, it doesn't mean it isn't regularly used to justify atrocities of both the everyday kind and the galactic scale kind. It is also heavily implied that mind control plays a large part in their social structure and hierarchy, and that there is little freedom or individuality in their strict, caste-based society. But... All that is pretty irrelevant to playing the game and kind of in the background. Just a little refresher for what was implied at the time. The town might have advanced technology including anti-grav slash hover slash levitation technology on most of their vehicles, but unlike the Eldar, they do not have especially good speed and mobility. They do have some mobility, a few of their mecha suit style units can jetpack jump around, but they definitely don't have speed on their side, especially after playing as orcs, who have some of the fastest units in the game. They also don't do well for numbers. An orc or imperial guard squad might have 14 or 12 individuals in it, a space marine squad has 10, a tau fire warrior squad has 7. They tend to be fairly tough with good armour and even shield options, but they aren't exactly space marines in terms of toughness, and their lack of numbers means concentrated fire on them is extra devastating, and their relatively good defence evens out because of this. They aren't a low morale faction, but they aren't an especially high morale faction either. Overall, they make up for most of their more awkward weaknesses with very effective long-range direct firepower, but have enough of those weaknesses that they can be outplayed with the tools available. As expected for a high-tech faction, they have lots of upgrades, so troops cranked out at Tier 1 can be upgraded to still be effective in the late game. Their initial scout unit, the Stealth Suit, is one of the best of the game because of this. Starts out as a single model squad with low damage, but invisibility. By the late game, they become three model strong squads with a jump pack, invisibility, a special ability that disables vehicles, and an armament that's very effective at damaging vehicles, making them an excellent unit for ambushing high threat vehicles like tanks, or using their mobility to get to an enemy's backline and disable their artillery. Their standard melee unit, Crook Carnivores, are not really the best units in the game, as far as melee is concerned anyway, but they don't need to be, as they are more for tying up enemies whilst the Tau's incredible firepower chews them up. You can research a leap ability, letting them cover no man's land quickly, and they can eat your enemy's corpses to boost their health. They aren't about to win in a one-on-one -on -one with other factions' good melee units, but they are all about the synergy with the rest of the Tau army, and that's a running theme with the faction. Lots of special units that have obvious weaknesses of their own, but when supporting each other open up some very effective strategy. They get another very early game melee unit, another of their alien ally races, the Vespid Stingwing Squad. These moth-like aliens have speed and mobility, and they can be tough for the early game. They have an ability that makes buildings vulnerable to damage, giving the Tau some sorely needed early game anti-building option and they can unlock an ability that lets them scatter infantry in all directions, giving them some disruption utility as well. They tend to get absolutely creamed by late game units however. The regular fire warrior squad is, as mentioned, one of the best ranged infantry and heavy infantry melter units in the game, and in large numbers are dangerous against anything. They are useless in melee and aren't especially fast, but can get a grenade or a shield upgrade in the mid-game, and if you choose the K-On command post, they get damage and range upgrades. 
They have long range, but not necessarily long line of sight, and they pair really well with Pathfinders, which are a small squad of not very dangerous or tough Tau, who have huge line of sight, can detect infiltrated infantry, and have an ability to mark a target so it takes extra damage. Pathfinders used well mean your enemy will experience pew 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 death from deep within the fog of war before they know what's happening. Poor use of Pathfinders will see them killed fast and your Tau army of highly advanced pulse rifles turned into a bloody mound of gibbs by power claws and chainswords in no time. Tau also don't get a defensive emplacement building like the Space Marine's heavy bolter emplacement and instead get the broadside battlesuit which has a rail gun on each shoulder and missile launchers instead of hands. They've got that same low line of sight but high range pairs well with Pathfinders thing going on. Broadsides are extremely deadly to absolutely everything but don't have a high rate of fire and may be the slowest unit in the entire game. They can't even fire their rail guns unless they deploy which involves them literally digging their feet into the ground, and it takes a while to deploy and undeploy, meaning they are extremely vulnerable to jump jet or teleporting high damage melee troops, like assault terminators, as they'll be dead from the gank before they can even pull their feet out of the ground. Used well, they provide unrivaled fire support or defense against anything in the game. Used poorly, they are the most vulnerable sitting duck there is. Are you beginning to see a theme with the Tau? Their commander unit is a powerful ranged combatant with weapons to deal with any kind of enemy, and a jetpack and shields when fully upgraded. He also comes with a snare trap that lets, that lets you slow enemies down to a crawl, buying you time as they cross no man's land to concentrate fire on them with your firing lines of fire warriors. He is one of the lowest HP heroes around, however, and is better at leading from the back and terrible at tanking in comparison to other faction's leaders. The other leaders we have looked at so far can run in first and draw fire for you, but the Tau leader is only going to be able to do that for a fraction of the time before you jetpack him out of there. His mobility and snare trap ability does mean he can be slippery and good at escaping, so he doesn't make a half bad spotter for your fire warriors if you don't have stealth suits or pathfinders available. The other leader, the Tau Ethereal, is less of a combat leader as he may give your whole army an all round buff just for being produced, but if he dies your whole army gets a huge penalty immediately including to morale, so targeting him is an effective way to instantly get an upper hand against a powerful Tau force. He can, however, make a holographic duplicate of a vehicle, which is useful for scouting, spotting targets for your long range units, and drawing fire risk free. He also has an air cased strike ability, which isn't quite as big and impressive as the Space Marines orbital bombardment, but is still very effective at clearing a large horde. His best ability though is the ability to summon a special Tau Fire Warrior bodyguard squad, which have truly absurd range and damage. In earlier versions of the game, despite a really long cooldown, there was no cap on this ability except for the global unit cap, so you could suicide all your units and replace them with Tau Fire Warrior bodyguards and then just vaporize anything from the other side of the map. These days you can only get one squad, but even then their range is outstanding and they can come in very handy because of this. I usually build the ethereal just to summon the bodyguards. Then I'll often just stash him in the back of the base so he can't be targeted and forget about him. As for vehicles, the Tau Transport, the Devilfish, is pretty good. By default it's infiltrated and it has good weaponry for dealing with infantry, so it makes a good early game support unit. It is not very fast and while has a half decent toughness for a transport, will definitely die fast to anything with anti-vehicle weapons, so its invisibility is its main means of survival. It carries a very respectable three squads, so it is good at its job, but the lack of speed does limit its ability to deploy and evacuate troops from any given situation. All your opponent needs is a detector and a rocket launcher or equivalent and devilfish are sitting ducks. Skyray missile gunships have similar disadvantage, slow and relatively fragile, but with no infiltration to protect it. 
Instead, it relies on its massive range, and it's very effective at taking out buildings and vehicles at long range with a spotter. But if caught out, it basically can't escape. It can be upgraded with a missile barrage ability that gives it an excellent long-ranged area of effect attack that does good damage and disruption to all but the toughest of targets. The Tau also get ambush drones, which can dig into the ground and pop out to ambush a target. I don't use them much, but they can be quite effective at scattering and harassing unsuspecting infantry, but don't have much use outside of that in my view. They do self-destruct upon death dealing good damage and knockback, so that gives them utility at dealing with melee opponents who are likely to get close enough to trigger their ambush. Given that the wrong kind of infantry in the wrong place is pretty much the tower's biggest weakness, they do have their place in a Tau army. The Tau don't get an indirect artillery fire unit, probably because their army already has heaps of very long range direct fire units. But in my opinion, their answer to artillery is actually the drone Harbinger. This vehicle is slow and not that tough, but can spawn a huge amount of drones and send them to a rally point. If you have a good resource base and can afford it, this means you can suppress and overwhelm virtually any defensive position with unlimited drone spam. Against an AI opponent, this is extremely effective. I have a feeling any real player with a brain would just ignore the onslaught of low-value drones and attack the producing harbingers themselves. Since they are slow and fragile, they don't stand much of a chance even when well defended, so be warned. Fortunately, the AI just isn't that bright and they work very well against the AI, who seem to have no answers for their overwhelming drone spam. Now those are the units you get no matter how you play Tau. There are some units you only get depending if you choose the Mont Car or k -on command post. Let's go with the Mont Car first. If you go that route, you get Crisis Battle Suits, which are slow but have a jetpack jump and can be loaded out with weaponry to deal with any kind of opponent, so it can be useful for a variety of strategies. They are powerful, but I don't find them very useful for myself. They can very easily be ganked and overwhelmed, and I just don't think they are as good at melting infantry as fire warriors, or as good at taking out vehicles and buildings as stealth suits, nor are their flamers any substitute for a decent melee unit. They suffer from a bit of jack of all trades, master of none. There are some specific strategies they come in handy for, but otherwise I find them a bit redundant, despite them being the iconic Mecha Tau unit. The other Montcar unit you unlock is the Hammerhead Gunship, which is everybody's favourite Tau unit and pretty much the most powerful long-range tank in the game, and is considered so good by the devs that if you go Montcar, you don't even get access to the Tau Relic unit because you get the Hammerhead. The Hammerhead has the big railgun and huge range, low line of sight, so it goes excellent with a spotter. It has decent anti-infantry weapons up close, so it's great at providing support at the back of your army. It's tough too and can take a bit of punishment and hold its own against other tanks, but is slow and easily outmaneuvered. There are a few other non-relic units that will instantly become your enemy's priority target like the Hammerhead, but given its range and power, it can be irresistible to deploy. So if you go the k -on route on the other hand, you don't get cool mecha jetpack crisis suits or iconic big gun tanks, but you do get a selection of crew affiliated beasts that fill out the melee gap in the Tau army perfectly. First, you get what I would call the Tau's heavy melee unit, the Crute Hound, and I would say they are among the best heavy melee units. Good speed, excellent damage, great defense, and they can get upgraded with the leap ability. The old 1-2 Crute Hounds to wade in and tie up Fire Warriors to annihilate with Pew Pew strategy is my number one tower go-to. They also get one of the best Walker units in the game with the Crutox, a kind of gorilla bear-like bird creature being ridden by a gun-brandishing regular Crute that quite frankly has an unreasonably good amount of HP that to this day doesn't exactly feel balanced. It has great DPS against infantry at range and is dangerous to absolutely anything in melee and they are the Tau's best go-to for drawing fire and wading into danger first because of this. Finally, the k path gives the Tau access to the Greater Narlok, a giant T-Rex dinosaur and the Tau's relic unit. 
It's smaller and not as tough as pretty much every other relic unit in the game, but does a lot of damage in melee, more than a lot of other units. Uh, it's pretty much a bit of a consolation prize of a relic unit to make up for the fact that the rest of the Tau army has so much firepower. Giving them something equivalent to a bloodthirster in mobility and toughness would be unfair, and it'd be extra unfair to give them something with tactical utility like troop carrying you see with the Squigoth or Land Raider. So they get a high damage dinosaur that goes down easy with ganking. It's still tough enough to fulfill the main role of a relic unit to be a massive fire drawer and damage sponge, but it's not much good at anything else, and even at that, it's not as good at it as most other relic units are. I mean, it's not really surprising, it's the only relic unit that you can choose to lock out of your tech tree entirely in exchange for hammerhead tanks, so they weren't going to make it an indispensable powerhouse. This is kind of its own advantage. There's a lot less stakes in requisitioning and deploying it than a lot of other relic units. Though the truth is, it is often so irrelevant to Tau strategy that I rarely ever use it, unless I happen to have the spare pop cap for it. I'd take more Crutoxes or Crut Hounds over it any day. If you couldn't tell already, I heavily prefer the balance that the Kaon Path brings over the heavy firepower of the Monte Car. The Kaon Path, I guess as a way to make up for the lack of long range units it brings, also provides two extra upgrade unlocks for your regular Tau Fire Warriors. One that makes them longer range and one that gives them more damage. Fully upgraded Fire Warriors supported by Crute Hounds and Crutox for the melee, I find an almost unbeatable combo, far more overpowered than the Hammerhead tanks. So is it any real surprise I very rarely ever go for Montecar? Not to say it's completely useless, there are some scenarios and situations where the Hammerhead or even the Crisis Suit is the solution to the problem. The right hammer for the right nail as it were, but that's pretty much the only time. In summary, I'd say I use the Kaon Path 90% of the time and really only use the Mont Car to take down strongholds, as I find the Hammerhead has a lot of utility as a tank in those more structured scenarios. Now, to the playthrough. So the Tau have the unenviable position of being the current occupiers of Kronos at the time the events of the game go down. It's one of their colonies, and apart from a swamp with an orc problem and a relatively small population of assimilated humans that many generations ago were imperial, it isn't until the events of Dark Crusade that Kronos begins crawling with Eldar, Necrons, Chaos and Imperials. Not to mention Gorguts arriving to transform the orcs into a big problem. I guess the Necrons were there, but they weren't awake yet. So. Naturally, the Tau Empire responds and sends in the troops to defend their planet. It also means it's their cities full of colonists, their resources and their infrastructure that serve as the backdrop and collateral damage for the game. So, certainly it makes a lot of sense they are mobilising to defend it. I start the game in the Tau Stronghold City and thank goodness that means I don't have to take it off them. The Tau have a nice central position on the map and are well poised to grab the spaceport on turn two and then fury the turn after. I choose to take the Western Barons held by the Necrons for my first move and as usual I make sure to build massive defensive bases all over the province before delivering the killing blow. I earn a Vespid Elder Strain for my Honor Guard and I get some war gear and I go with the jetpack, as I anticipate the need for the mobility on the upcoming spaceport map. As an aside, the war gear progression for the Tau leader is one of my favourites, if not my absolute favourite in this game. The way he goes from dude with one gun to full-blown anime mecha heavy armament echidna is just so satisfying. Also, I think he gets one of the best models in the game, and is a great poster child for how much attention to detail the models were given with relatively primitive graphics. I end turn, and without a defence, that spaceport is mine, baby. That fast, highly mobile Elder Strain Stingwing squad paying for itself on this map. Then, 
another turn with no defences, and the Errors, Badlands and Fury are a turn three cinch for the Tau. Thanks to the nature of the Tau vs Necron early game matchup, it isn't too hard to hit the win condition of 70 dead Necrons before they hit 70 dead Tau. What more could Fire Warriors ask for than tough but slow moving targets they can concentrate fire on but almost always successfully fall back from before they are in any real danger? As usual, the real trick here is it's a race to get a decent defensive base up before you hit the cap so the territory is easy to defend later. I do very well on that front this time around. So hitting turn 4 with no defense missions played but my key strategy already well and truly aced, it looks like the tower are going to have a fairly easy time booting every last invader or would-be conqueror off their planet. So you know what I decide to do next? Feeling confident, I go straight for an early game Hyperion Peaks to get my most awkward nemesis of Dark Crusade challenges out of the way early. Lo and behold, even with no honor guard, the Tau start with three Greater Narlock Relic Units and two Hammerhead Tanks, not to mention three Crutox, two Broadsides, two Sky Rays and some Crutowns. Every time, I just cannot believe how shafted Chaos get on this map. Like, one glance at what the Tau bring, and you know they are winning this one. To spell it out, you can hold the center with the broadsides, providing the pew-pew while your crew towns and crew tox tie the orcs up in melee, and in the meantime, you can clear one base with the Narlocks and the other with the Hammerheads and Sky Rays, and then converge it all on the final base when you are ready. Don't be surprised if the Narlocks die. They are the most piddling of the relic units after all, but the Hammerheads are pretty much the ideal unit for this map and will have little trouble so long as you take advantage of their range. I get a piece of war gear for my victory and choose the Advanced Sensor Array, which makes the commander able to see infiltrated units and increases his health. After, I have to fend off an attack by the Imperial Guard on the Ares Badlands, or the Fury map. And good thing I had a decent base built, as I'm able to clean them up quickly and get myself some nice missile pods to give the commander a bit of bite at range against vehicles and buildings. Then next I go for the Janus Savannah and show the Necrons who the planet really belongs to. Yada yada yada, fortify, yada yada yada, annihilate, and I wind up with a Crute Alpha pack for my honor guard, and I get some nice shiny Iridium armor for the commander to make him a teeny tiny bit less fragile. With the spaceport not under threat and the Eras Badlands able to defend itself, I go for the resource bonuses on the Vandian coast. As usual with this one, it's easier to just wipe out the enemy forces early than it is to go for the power collection win condition, and if done right, buys you time to build a decent defensive base. With the Tau in particular, if you decide to leave an enemy structure standing, you can use your drone harbingers to subtract power from the total you need to hit by endlessly spawning drones. This will let you take as much time as you want to kit the map out as you see fit in the, in the case of a defensive mission. Or it would if there wasn't a time limit that I completely forgot about. I actually ended up losing this mission because the time ran out and I rage quit because of it. So don't do that. When I loaded my save, it was from before that happened but I included it in the video anyway just to point out that you can play the King of the Turtles game on this mission if you like, but not without its risks. And honestly, this territory can only be attacked from one other territory in the game anyway, so it's probably not worth playing the King of the Turtles here at all and just winning this map outright as soon as you possibly can. So... Back in time a little, but one turn later and the Space Marines have moved into striking distance of the spaceport. I have two moves to burn this turn, however, so I resolve to get rid of them on the second move. For the first, I decide that my little timeout experience has put me off the Vandian coast, so I th instead I think earning me some nice fire warrior bodyguards for my honor guard and chasing the orcs off the border of my stronghold would be sensible so I attack the Agamar Desert Province. 
the usual trap them in their base while I play City Builder ensues, and then I get me some tasty, tasty Fire Warrior bodyguards. Now, my threatening Space Marine buddies on the Oriston Plains, it's your turn. I haven't forgot about you. One pew 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 and large base later and I got me a crisis suit bodyguard to go with my fire warriors. This army is really coming together. I end turn and I have to fight a defense from the Necrons and they do not last long. Then it's time for me to make up for past mistakes and I attack the Vandian coast. And this time seeing as the only way to attack it is to go through the Oriston Plains that I have already successfully fortified. I don't need to piss about and I just slaughter the marines in 10 minutes persistent bases be damned. With my industrial production bonus secured, I use the second move to once again protect my precious spaceport, as it seems the space marines have snuck around the back and occupied the Panria lowlands. They are poised to attack it from the other direction. So I crush them under my anime mecha bootied hooves. At least I think that's what's going on with the tower feet. I build me a right old nice old base and earn myself a veteran stealth suit squad for my troubles. Unfortunately, both the Imperial Guard and the Necrons are in good position to attack the spaceport too. But since my army is occupying a neighbouring territory, that means at the very least I'll have my whole Honor Guard available to defend it should they choose to attack it. Fortunately, the Imperial Guard choose to attack the well-defended Erez Badlands, because I guess getting a taste of that Chaos Demon approval is too tempting for them. It does net me some more war gear, so I'm not complaining. I picked the nice, chunky fusion cannon. Fortunately, the Necrons decide not to make a move on the spaceport and retreat back to their stronghold. They must have seen my thick, pulsing fusion cannon and thought better. Following turn, I decide to take the Deem's Northlands off the Eldar because I want another Fire Warrior bodyguard for my Honor Guard. These bodyguards are almost the same as the ones the Ethereal summons with this special ability. They have the most ridiculous range and damage, and are just one of the single most OP units in the game, so prioritising them is a sensible strategy. Anyway, one huge fortification session later, and the Eldar are booted from the Northlands. Then I use the second move to take the Arceria Forest off the Necrons and get that increased manpower bonus. Despite the fact that the Imperial Guard could make a move on the spaceport, and I probably should have done something about that, I risk it and end turn. I have to fight off an Elder counterattack on the Deem's Northlands and a Space Marine assault on the Pamria Lowlands, but fortunately my gamble pays off and the Guard do not make a move on the spaceport. I do get some more war gear from my defences, however, and choose myself a plasma rifle to replace the fusion cannon and make the commander spit even more dangerous blue glowy energy. Still pursuing the best at Honor Guard, I then go for the Orc-held Rian Floodlands, so I can get me a Crute hunting pack of Crute Hounds, giving my Honor Guard some coveted heavy melee. Another easy victory for my army, and even more war gear, and I decide to grab a Flamer so that the commander at least has an option should he get ganked in melee. The Chaos-held Rian Jungle is next on my sights, so I can get another Crisis Suit. I build a big turtle city and walk away with my suit, still leaving my spaceport wide open like a doofus, I end turn. I easily repel the orcs at the Agamar Desert and the space marines again at the Panria Lowlands. Given that now I'm right here next to their stronghold, I decide it's time for chaos to get flushed down the drain, and I assault the Deimos Peninsula. At this point, the completionist in me is tired, and after I've defended the opening attack and set up a decent base and army, I decide to ignore the entire right-hand side of the map, just like I've been advocating for this whole time, but not doing. So I just charge up the left-hand side, grab the relic and prisoners, move over to the critical location in the centre and stop their blood pulse gimmick, then move on to directly attacking their main base and chaos portal. It's all a cinch for the high range, high damage Tau. This is one of the maps where I choose to use the Monte Car command post, as nothing quite beats a hammerhead for taking out defensive vehicles and buildings at range. 
These stronghold maps have that little bit more structure to them that the versatility and power of the Kaon tree isn't necessary and you can just run your whole army in support of your hammerheads instead. That gets me my first two precious paragraphs for the Tau. It outlines how the Tau on Cronus had never seen chaos before and are extremely traumatised by it. But they don't succumb to its madness because of the not so subtly implied psychic mind control of the ethereals. It also outlines how any of the crook carnivores who have eaten any chaos flesh are hunted down and killed. Thus is the harsh reality of warfare in the 41st millennium. Next turn I decide to clean up some of the remaining leaderless chaos and get me a Skyray missile gunship and attack the chaos held Mariah Coast. Fortunately, I don't see having to defend this province as a possibility, so no need to waste time whipping out the old Turtle City, and it's a quick victory for me. I even get some war gear and pick the stealth field. No points for guessing what that does, but at this point he becomes quite a powerful unit, capable of harassing any kind of enemy independently. Still kind of fragile, but with the mobility and utility to escape a gank, should he get stuck. Fortunately for me, despite it being wide open, the guard have backed off from the borders of the spaceport, so I end turn and don't have to suffer through any defensive skirmishes. Then I decide that I may as well just sweep the legs out from under the guard so I don't have to worry about them again either, and so I attack this stronghold, Victory Bay. Much like the Chaos stronghold, I finally settle into the fast formula for taking down this map. Push the base over the river to the north, flank the artillery by sneaking through the Titan gun trench, clean up the air command and Bane blade base, then take the bridge and assault the power generators on the other side of the trench. Finally, once the traitorous guard members have been won to my side and I've got control of the big gun, I take out their main base. The victory paragraphs outline how the Imperials were a big threat to the Tau because they legitimately wanted their cities back, and that the far-reaching implications of that were viewed as heresy by the Tau. It then outlines how they set up re-education camps for the surviving guardsmen, and how some of them escape to wage guerrilla warfare. But others yet were converted and let on Imperial military secrets for the Tau to take advantage of. Yeah, so the Tau, definitely not exactly good guys, but still a damn side less evil than what most of the other factions would do in this situation. I decide to use my second move to set myself up for the next turn. Moving to the Panrea Lowlands province, my army is both poised to assault the Space Marine stronghold and to move into the spaceport and defend, should the Necrons choose to attack it. The Necrons do attack, but the Western Barons are not the spaceport, so I am easily able to drive them off from one of my Grand Turtle Forts. The Space Marines also make an attempt to get out of the trap I've caught them in by attacking the Oriston Plains, but they also get annihilated, leaving me free to attack their stronghold at North Vandia with the opening move of my next turn. Fortunately, as I've attacked them early, there's no whirlwind raining missiles on my base from the get-go, so it's fairly trivial to deploy some broadsides, build base and defences, and then charge the east side of the map to get my hands on their orbital bombardment power. After that, the rest goes to plan, with their forward base for reinforcements falling next, and then their other forward bases shortly after, and then the relic point to cap it off. Once again, I go with Montcar and use hammerheads to assault their final fortress. The tower's ridiculous range and the AI's inability to move out of position to engage them in melee makes it like shooting fish in a barrel and victory is mine in no time. The victory paragraphs aren't very interesting and mostly make sure to mention that the Space Marines killed a lot of Tau despite losing and that they didn't get annihilated entirely but fled to fight another day. Typical 40k Space Marine lip service in, even in defeat. I'm lucky enough to score my final two pieces of war gear, and that means choosing the last two upgrades, which are a gun and a shield drone, which do pretty much what they say on the tin. 
And look at this badass. Missiles on shoulders, a big gun on each arm, heavily armed little robots and a jetpack. I am all about this guy. He could star in a third person shooter and I'd play it. With the Marines gone, my thirst for booting factions for the game has not yet been sated, so I manoeuvre my army into position ready to wipe the Necrons and end turn. I fight the said Necrons off in another short-lived defence mission, and then counterpunch and assault their stronghold at the Thur Abyss Plateau. I go Montcar so I can use hammerheads, and this time I do decide to be a bit of a completionist, and I make sure to wipe out everything Necron on the map before planting the bomb and evacuating, and even then it only takes me about an hour. The special paragraphs say that the Tau are especially interested in the crazy spooky Necron technology, and set up vast research complexes to try and reverse engineer some of it. Which is... Hilarious, as it is the complete opposite of their reaction to chaos, even though the Necrons probably bear similar technological hubris risks. With so few factions left in the game, I decide to spend a turn cleaning up the remaining orphaned territory and fill out the last of my honour guard. That means no need for turtling or fortifying. First up, the Murad Swamplands, which gets me a crude Elder Shaper, and then... The Pavonian Heartland, which gets me a final Crute Alpha Pack. Then a defense from the Eldar, followed by me cleaning up the Vandemar Mountains and getting a veteran stealth team. Finally, I take down the most irrelevant of provinces, the Ariel Highlands, that the Eldar army has been trapped in the entire game, earning me the useless Bulwark ability. With that done, all the Tau have left to do is swat away a few more pitiful assaults and then stomp the final two strongholds. Eldar get booted first. As usual for strongholds, I go Montcar so I can use hammerheads. Then I set up defensive lines on the east side of my base while taking my army to the west to take out the Chaos forward base. Once that's gone and I get my free reinforcements, I take out the webway gates at the mouth of the bridge before setting my sights on letting the Squigoth out and using them as cover to wipe out the Orc outpost. Once I've secured the verge outside of the Eldar Fortress, it's time to get down to the painstaking business of wiping them out instead of holding the mission objectives to win. And the Tau have an easy time at this. They can just spam drones from their harbingers to reveal the fog of war while the OP long range fire warrior bodyguard squads wipe out whatever you please from outside of your enemy's vision. It takes a while but works without issues and with very little risk. And of course, I do make sure to take out the ultra powerful avatar and get some cool footage while I'm at it because, well, I've got to do that every time, don't I? The special paragraphs tell me that this is one of the first clashes between the Tau and the Eldar, which is pretty cool. It says that the Tau actually negotiate with the Eldar for prisoner releases and are successful at reverse engineering some of the simpler Eldar technology, which I think makes sense in a cause and effect point of view, but is a little nonsensical for the overall fluff of the setting. It makes you ask why the Tau don't ever adopt Eldar tech later then, and it removes a bit of identity and demarcation between the two factions that are both highly advanced alien races that like speed and stealth. It does say that they can't figure out any of the really advanced stuff like Wraithbone and D-cannons, but it does illustrate one of the ongoing issues I've always had with the Tau, which is that they don't quite sit amongst the settings other factions as particularly unique. A lot of the ground they cover feels like it's been done before by other races. Just my opinion, don't get too mad at me, Tau nerds. Finally, this leaves just the Orc stronghold on the Green Coast. After one last offence, that is. As usual, I have no intention of being a completionist on this map, and after I've driven off their assault and made a nice big base, I go about the usual strategy. I use the old drone harbingers to spot, and the fire warrior bodyguards to wipe out the various Orc banners from extreme range. With that done... I then go ahead and secure the relic at the Moor of Gork. 
then there is nothing to stop me exterminating their main fortress and their war boss Golgats too. This grants me my final two paragraphs for the Tau playthrough, which name drops famous Tau Commander Farsight and outlines how to prevent the orcs from reinfesting the jungle. And to do that, they let the crew carnivores have it, who apparently transform it into an ecosystem that suits them. So even though the orcs are exterminated, it sounds like an environmental disaster for Cronus. But I doubt the Tau care very much. That just leaves the closing cinematic which goes out of its way to outline how horrible a Tau victory is for any humans who are subjected to extensive re-education and even sterilization so that they barely make up any of the population of Cronus a decade later. So yeah, the people who made this game definitely didn't want you to get the impression that the Tau were the good guys. Overall, that was the fastest and easiest playthrough yet which I think is indicative that while the Tau are overpowered, you do need some kind of brain to exploit their very obvious weaknesses. Still, overall they have the hardest stronghold and one of the easiest run-throughs of the campaign. I definitely think Games Workshop were looking to push them a bit harder as they were, at the time, a pretty new faction and they would have wanted them to look good and feel good to drum up sales. And I think Dark Crusade does a pretty good job of that. The Tau certainly feel like a bit of a power trip more so than the other races, thanks to their ridiculous ranged pew 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 pew. Now, speaking of Games Workshop wanting to push the power trip feelings next, faction up is the Necrons. The guys on the box art and the most mysterious faction of all. The Necrons are Terminator-inspired, ancient, undead-like robots made out of some kind of living liquid metal energy who, at the time this game was made, only want to exterminate all life in the universe for mysterious reasons. Forgive my ignorance around the Necrons. It's not like I've read a codex of theirs ever, so I'm hardly an expert on them. The impression this game gives is... Silent, ancient, zombie, terminator robots who exist only to annihilate all organic chemistry from the universe with glowing green, spooky lightning energy. I am aware that they have had a complete reboot and overhaul in terms of their origins, motivations and lore since this game was made. And I'm not very familiar with that. Just be warned, of all the factions in this game, the Necrons have changed the most over the years, so their depiction here should be treated like a snapshot in time. Possibly in the same way you might look at a black and white photo of your nan's old car. They are the black, gothic, spooky, mysterious, undead evil, whereas chaos are the lava and flames and heavy metal spiky demons evil. Kind of like Necropolis vs Inferno in Heroes of Might and Magic. Both of them are supernatural evil, but one's all black skeletons and graves and cobwebs and mysterious howling in the night, and the other's all reds and hellfire, anguish screaming and big twirly goat horned demons. Hell vs the Graveyard. Distinct flavours of evil, but definitely all of it is evil. Like the Tau or the Orcs, at the start of the game, the Necrons are already on Cronus. Apparently, the tombs they lay dormant in were buried deep underground on Cronus so many billions of years ago, no living races except the Eldar even remember they exist. Apparently, this is the case across the whole galaxy, and all kinds of planets in the Imperium, or in the Tau's Empire, or many other factions might be in possession of have catacombs of long dormant necrons just waiting for whatever mysterious moment wakes them up. While I'm not sure what particular event makes them decide to wake up in time to be a part of the Dark Crusade here on Cronus, but that undead robot rooster crows and the necrons are getting up and starting their morning yoga just in time for the party. There's always this implication with the Necrons that only a tiny little tip of the iceberg of their forces and power are available to them, as most of it is yet to wake up, 
and that the bulk of what they are capable of never gets a chance to show itself before they get shut back in their slumber hole by one of the other factions. The Eldar apparently were there last time they were fully awake however and are so traumatised by it as a species that they pretty much do anything to stop it from happening again and they only really came to Cronus to put the Necrons down again. On top of this the Necrons technology is so advanced it appears to be otherworldly and they are totally silent with one notable exception. This adds up to them having this wonderful, unstoppable force of nature feeling to them, which the developers like to emphasise through their gameplay. The first thing to know is that they have a different relationship to the tech tree, resource gathering, progression and to speed itself than any other faction. Their slow inevitability is kind of the running theme to their shtick and informs how they play. So rather than even have requisition collected as a resource from capping points like everyone else, instead they have a percentage that relates to the speed of their operations, i.e. how fast things build and move. This means that capping points isn't as necessary for your economy as you don't need them to buy anything. But it's still not something you can ignore forever. As if you fall too far behind because everything takes too long to build, you'll be cleaned up by your opponents. So, if they don't get requisition from points, what do they get? Power and only power. The idea being that the bigger your weird green glowy energy power grid, I think it's called Gorse Energy in the game, the more capacity you have to wake up more Necrons and power more of the Necrons bigger, more complicated stuff. In addition to this, rather than build a building that then produces a certain kind of unit, say an airfield makes aircraft and a barracks makes infantry kind of thing, like in 95% of all RTS factions in the world, the Necrons instead have a single structure called a monolith that produces all of their units. That's not the only structure they have, but it's their only unit producing structure. Their other structures are power generators and structures that unlock the tech tree and enable upgrades. Not to mention their equivalent to listening posts for strategic points, which up the speed of production. In terms of balance, this means the slow but powerful Necrons don't have to stress too much about their lack of speed shafting them in the early game as other factions expand. So long as they can build generators in their own base, they can get away with some early game turtling. Also, given how slow they are, even if they aren't turtling, it lets them have options that their lack of speed might otherwise take away from them. Despite lacking speed, Necrons often don't lack mobility, as they are masters of hyper-advanced teleportation technology. So, if you do rush early game only to find another faction attacks your base while you're out, they have an ability to summon their troops back to the monolith or strategic point so they can defend it, as they would never be able to leg it back in time given they move at the speed of glaciers. That's really their whole dynamic. Move as fast as the average snail, but every individual is as tough as a tank and can dish damage out like one too. Oh, and they can reassemble themselves after they get scrapped like in Terminator 2. It isn't guaranteed that a dead Necron stays a dead Necron. Sometimes they just get right back up and keep going. So... Despite their lack of speed, they have staying power and more than enough quirks and abilities to make up for it. Another quirk for the Necrons that sets them apart from other factions is that their monolith structure that produces all of their units doubles up as their OP final relic unit. It starts out buried in the earth, and as a mission progresses you can unlock upgrades to it, that see it rising out of the ground and activating more systems until the very late game where it basically starts hovering and shooting giant green thunderbolts at stuff. It is, of course, the absolute slowest thing in the game, but it can teleport a fair distance, although that teleport's got a huge cooldown. Still, 
as the only relic unit that doubles as a building and one that can spew out more Necrons as it goes, there's a good argument for it being the strongest relic unit in the game particularly as it still works as a target for Necron teleportation, which means it can be used to surprise jump your entire army fully supported by the monolith exactly where you want it, which can be devastating if used correctly. Oh, and the Necrons being soulless robot dudes generally don't have any morale to worry about. Not that they don't get the loss of morale red circle thingos like every other faction does, but it's less of a prominent mechanic for them. Given their move speed, it's less likely you'll need to enact a fallback in the case of loss of morale, especially given they may have a teleport you can use instead. So while we are on the topic of Necron's army, let's mention their other completely over the top super unit, the Nightbringer, which you can only get after building a specific expensive late game building, then purchasing a specific expensive upgrade and even then you can only get it for a brief period of time as your commander unit, the Necron Lord, transforms into it for about a minute or two and then it has a massive cooldown. The Nightbringer appears as a gigantic Grim Reaper with a scythe. It is outright invulnerable. It is also the most dangerous thing in the game in melee. And in general, if an enemy uses it on you, the best thing to do is to withdraw and wait for it to run out of time and disappear. Of course, if they use it to attack your base, you are out of luck. It's unstoppable. But don't waste time trying to stun lock or overcome it. Although, you might gank it with your cheapest, most disposable troops to try and waste its potency while you run out its timer. The AI has no capacity to counter it, however, and you can pretty much use it with impunity to overcome heavy defences, counter an enemy's relic unit, or just be a guaranteed to not die until the time runs out fire draw. As for the Necron Lord, when it's not transformed into a gigantic Grim Reaper-looking celestial monstrosity, the Necron Lord is also one of the most OP commander units in the game. Not quite as much of a beast as a fully upgraded war boss, but not far off either, and with way more options and special abilities. To begin with, the Necron Lord has a powerful teleport with good range and not the worst cooldown. It can be used twice before a really long cooldown ensues at the least. On top of that, the Necron Lord can carry up to three artifacts that each grant a powerful ability. You can pick which artifacts that he carries at a building that the Necrons get called the Forbidden Archive. There are a variety of artifacts with the cheapest ones with the weakest abilities available as soon as you build the archive and the more powerful expensive ones unlocking as you go up the tiers of the tech tree. The thing to keep in mind is that there's no take backsies. If you build the Forbidden Archive and then immediately pick the first three artifacts, that's it. You can't pick the later more powerful ones and override them. This gives a variety of strategic and tactical approaches a player can go for. Do you load up the Necron Lord with powers immediately and go for an early game rush? Or do you purposefully leave some slots open to capitalize on a powerful ability in the late game? Given the nature of some of the abilities, a lot of strategy for a Necron player may very well revolve around the artifacts you choose for your Necron Lord so it's well worth familiarizing yourself with what's available to him. The most iconic of those powers and the most iconic Necron strategy of all is the Resurrection Orb, which lets the Necron Lord revive a bunch of Necron corpses into half HP, fully functioning Necron troops. This ability even lets the Necrons exceed their unit cap, which leads to the absolute classic strat of maxing out your unit cap only to see your entire army killed assaulting your enemy's base, just for you to max out your unit cap again for round two, teleport your Necron Lord in and use the Resurrection Orb to revive a swath of the original army in addition to your max cap new army, and bam, no single opponent can hope to beat you because you have far exceeded the cap they are limited to. Although watch out, this can be a crutch as you find yourself with no headroom in your unit cap to produce units to counter specific enemy types if you've clogged the whole thing up a couple times over with regular Necron warriors. 
Overall, the Necron Lord is the closest thing in the whole game to a single, pivotal army-defining unit. The Necron Lord can scout, assault forward bases, deploy essential abilities, lead armies, stay back and defend, or transform into a giant elder god beyond your comprehension. He's kind of the only Necron who really matters, and as a result, they have no second leader unit in their army. Not to say that they don't have plenty of other great units you'll use all the time, just that more than any other unit, the Necron Lord can do it all, and do it well, both as an independent free agent and as a key piece of a synergistic strategy, and can even rapidly switch from one to the other in the hands of a skilled player, thanks to his powerful teleport. The Necron Lord's Resurrection Orb is not the only method the Necrons have available to them to recycle and resurrect their troops. To begin with, sometimes after they die, they just get back up anyway, all on their own. It's not that common and a bit random though, but worth mentioning. And not as spectacular or impactful a move as the Resurrection Orb, the Walker unit for the Necrons, the Tomb Spider, also has an ability to harvest Necron remains and then spawn Necron squads. They are limited to only a couple of types of Necron units and it's a gradual process compared to the orbs, press a button, watch a lot of troops come to life ability. It's more of a support role that lets tomb spiders hang around the back of your army, cleaning up the losses and gradually reinforcing your squads with the basics. As a walker unit, Tomb Spiders are devastating in melee and can be equipped with some decent range damage too. I find they aren't quite as tough as other factions' dedicated walker units. They do go down a bit faster against anti-vehicle and aren't quite as good at tanking damage when rushed in first. But the average Necron being all slow and tough, they need the fire drawing tank walker less than the other factions do as you can afford to be less precious about your regular troops, especially as you can resurrect them. So the increased utility of the Tomb Spider makes a lot of sense. Not only can they support the Necron army with harvesting corpses and reinforcing, they can also sacrifice a part of their HP to spawn a small squad of scarabs. These scarabs can be used to scout or take down vehicles. The scarabs are very fragile, however, but can be reinforced to have enormous numbers per squad. Overall, the Tomb Spider is a versatile unit that can be used as the supporting backbone of a Necron army, as a powerful base defense or anything in between. While we are talking about Necron vehicles, I will mention the other ones they get. I'm going to put air quotes on vehicles because with the exception of the Tomb Spider and the Monolith, their vehicles are just a Necron with a kind of hovercraft anti-grav platform instead of legs called a skimmer. They have three of them, a Destroyer, a Heavy Destroyer, and a Lord Destroyer. They are still considered vehicles for damage types however, so feel free to target them with appropriate weapons. They are a bit different to other vehicles in the game in terms of tech tiers. For early tiers they are quite tough, but for late game they aren't that good at resisting damage. The regular Destroyer is good at damaging infantry and the Heavy Destroyer are good at vehicles and buildings, and the Lord Destroyer is more of a special abilities unit, and none of them really are equivalent to a tank. They are good at outputting their damage type, and they are fast and manoeuvrable unlike other Necron units, but none of them are really that damage absorbing one unit army solution that tanks are in other factions. The Lord Destroyer kind of makes up for this with its abilities. One is a stasis field, which freezes anything in its radius in a stasis, meaning it can't move or do anything at all, but it also can't be damaged. The second ability lets the Lord Destroyer take over other vehicles. These two abilities are designed to work as an effective combo. So the Necrons don't really need a tank of their own because they can steal their opponent's ones which kind of makes the Lord Destroyer equivalent to a tank unit, and it gets the two-unit population cap the other factions have for their tanks as a result. As for the rest of the Necron lineup, well, they get some pretty cool units. 
The basic warrior unit is essentially your classic slow moving spooky green lightning terminator skull robot from the game's box art. They have numerous upgrades to health and damage and scale and speed with the global necron speed bonus and can be very effective at every stage of the game because of this. They have good ranged and melee damage and like all necron units get up of their own accord sometimes after they've been killed. Even at max speed, they are never fast, so their weakness is always that they are very easily outmaneuvered. It's just a combination of their relatively short-ranged weapons and their slow speed, and in a game like this where concentrated fire on appropriate targets is king, the Necron Warrior is the most vulnerable to this. It doesn't matter how tough you are if you can't get out of the way of five heavy bolters or plasma guns all targeting you at once, then you are nothing but dust in moments. Fortunately, the Necrons have an answer to this vulnerability, with my favourite Necron unit, which are the flayed ones. These cute little guys look like regular Necron warriors who haven't cut their nails in a few million years and grow big claws. And they have this adorable little habit of flaying the flesh off their enemy's bones and wearing it as a gruesome little hooded cape. See, they think they're people. Tactically, they have mobility on their side. They are able to be garrisoned in the monolith and then teleported to any location on the map. Where they do their cute little zombies crawling out from the earth routine instead of just appearing. They are hugely effective melee units and are dangerous to just about anything, but have no ranged attacks whatsoever. They also come with morale damage, because nobody likes fighting death robots covered in freshly flayed flesh. They perfectly complement the other Necron forces, because whenever you find yourself being outmaneuvered by enemy squads shooting you from outside your range or kiting you, you can just teleport a few flayed one squads on their heads and watch as they panic. Unfortunately, they do have a major weakness in that you can attack and damage them while they are playing their crawling out of the earth animation which means a savvy player can have your flayed ones basically annihilated before they can even swing their first attack. Fortunately, the AI is rarely able to understand and capitalize on this weakness, but against a real player, you might have to get a bit clever sometimes. Combine their deep strike teleport ability with Necron summoning teleport back to the monolith ability, and flayed ones can be on a never-ending cycle of being ready to be deployed anywhere instantly on your hotkeys all of the time. For anti-vehicle building troops, the Necrons get Immortals. They look a bit different to regular Necrons, but are essentially the same, except they have no melee attack and instead carry a very long-ranged big green lightning gun that does excellent damage to vehicles and structures. They also come in small squads. They are very effective at what they do, but are pretty much sitting ducks against anything not weak to their damage type, or anything at all that catches them in melee, meaning to be used well, they really need to be part of a cohesive strategy and army. Otherwise, some regular orc boys might bonk them with some Stone Age axes until they fall apart. The Necrons also get one of the best heavy melee units in the game, the Pariahs. Apparently these are strange half-Necron, half-human hybrids, which makes them very strong for some reason. I'm not really sure about the lore with these guys. They are brushed over in this game, and I don't even know if they are still a thing in Warhammer 40k in general. But if you are going to play Dawn of War, they are worth knowing about. They have a decent move speed unlike most other Necrons. They are extremely tough, like tougher than Space Marines tough. Almost nothing lasts as long under extreme punishment as well as a well-supported pariah squad. They do great melee damage and on top of that their weapons lower both the speed and health of their enemies with every attack that connects and the effects last until the pariah squad is destroyed. Very powerful units indeed, and I find them the real crutch of the Necron army, taking all the risks while the rest of their army cleans up. The Necrons also get the Wraith, 
a fast-floating scout unit that can't capture strategic points but can uncapture them. It has the ability to detect infiltrated enemy units and can phase out of existence where it cannot be damaged but also can't damage anything in return. Perfect for making a quick escape. It can do a lot of damage in melee but has no ranged attacks and is not very tough. All round a pretty good scout unit. Finally, there is the Builder Scarab, which is their builder unit. They come in small squads and are completely unarmed, but crucially, are the only unit that can cap strategic points for the Necrons, and are also the only unit other than the Wraiths that can detect infiltrated units. On top of that, they can repair Necrons and their buildings and vehicles. So, you tend to always have them in your army, or out and about on the map accomplishing tasks and not just at your base like other factions builders. And because you will always have a few at your base, usually building more power, the detector ability means your enemy will have a harder time sneaking infiltrated units into your base, something to keep in mind if you find yourself with a Necron opponent. With all that said, it's time for the Necron's blow-by-blow -blow playthrough. Their intro cinematic details that they had been asleep under the sands of Kronos for eons until their gods woke them up for the explicit purpose of exterminating all life in the universe. Which might not be the most nuanced motivation for a faction, but it's refreshingly straightforward for 40k at least. Almost all the factions in 40k are pretty much genocidal, but at least for 2007 era Necrons, it's as simple as our gods told us to, or rather programmed them to. Hard to tell with the Necrons. Why do these gods want to do that? Who cares, it's not important as far as this game is concerned, and the lore has changed massively since then, so I'm not going to get bogged down in it. More important than why the Necrons are killing everything on Cronus is the detail that somehow a bloke named Thomas Maccabee gets captured by the Necrons and turned into one of their half-human, half-Necron pariah units. This gives the Necrons someone who can speak to the player and make them a little bit more fun than pure silence and weird mechanical rattling sounds. Which, at this point in time, it was strict lore that the Necrons' creepy, never-changing silence was a big part of their shtick. How or why Thomas Maccabee gets to keep his ability to speak and no other pariah does, and why he is essentially speaking to the player the whole time when there's no one diegetically in the game for him to talk to, well, these are questions that are never answered and you probably shouldn't ask. After all, it's just a game. Relax. To kick it off... Necron starts central to the game map and are only two moves away from our priority territories. Nabbing the spaceport first means we are only three turns away from having both the spaceport and Fury. There are a whopping three territories that Necrons can make an opening move on and still nab the territory. Depending on what honor guard unit we want first will dictate which one we go for. A choice between Builder Scarab, Warriors, and Immortals. They are all useful, but I go for Warriors on the Vandemar Mountains province because they are probably the best general all-round versatile option. It's only a small map, so I'm not even going to give the Tau time to crank out more than a stealth suit before I wipe their structures and lock them into their HQ while I fortify. I earn my first bit of Necron war gear and choose the Death Mask because it reveals infiltrated units, which can be one of the Necron's army's great weaknesses. I in turn have to fight no defences and of course on my next turn I go for the spaceport. Necrons would be at an enormous disadvantage on this map as their lack of speed would make our usual strategy of just rushing all the servitors a no-go. but. The Necron Lord himself makes up for that, as he really isn't that slow, and most important of all, he has a powerful teleport. You can also send a couple of Builder Scarabs out early, and hopefully get enough Servitors to meet the mission objective before the map becomes too saturated in enemy troop movements. This has the bonus of letting me keep a few troops at base to fend off any early rushes. With the spaceport secured and no defence to fight, this sets us up beautifully for that third turn fury. So, 
I attack the air as Badlands. It's usually held by the Necrons, but playing as them, it sees the Imperial Guard holding it. Or potentially, Chaos could take it, but it's very unlikely. Necrons vs Imperial Guard on a map where the objective is to hit a kill limit first. If you even need help winning this one, you might want to rethink if RTS games are for you. Build a couple of warrior squads, waltz them into the Imperial Guard bases, and go for flayed ones as backup. The fact is, each individual guard is quite squishy and doesn't do much damage and has got weak morale. Necrons are the exact opposite. Very tough, do lots of damage, have no morale and automatically damage enemy morale. To top the matchup off, the guard field huge numbers and the Necrons not many at all. So the winning objective puts this scenario deeply in the Necrons favour. Of course, with intelligent play, the Guardsmen can turn this match up on its head easily, but the AI being intelligent isn't about to happen. With that out of the way, we are now set up for our Attack Anywhere 2 moves a turn victory parade through Cronus. I use my second move to take the Pavonian Heartland. This moves my army close enough to defend the spaceport should it come under assault, as the Tau look like they might be preparing to. And it also nets me a nice anti-vehicle immortal squad for my honor guard and sets me up with a direct path to take out the imperial guard stronghold so all in all a good move it goes well i take the province and fortify it i end turn and fight off a defense from the guard at the era's badlands guess they really want that fury bonus from the chaos demon huh well they don't last long and i get some war gear I choose the reinforced body to get a huge HP and defense boost. Then I decide it's time to take out the Hyperion Peaks early, and once again, Necrons illustrate just how badly Chaos get taken for a ride on this map because they get two entire awakened Necron monoliths. Yeah, they're slow, but given you can pretty much teleport them into the enemy base immediately, the Orcs don't stand a chance. You can even afford to sacrifice one of them to the brunt of their forces and still solo the map with the other one. While, just like with other factions, you can't just build new units on this map, you can pump out Builder Scarabs for some reason, which means you can even repair the monoliths. Combine that with smart use of Tomb Spiders to respawn Necron squads, and that the Necron Lord comes with the Resurrection Orb, and overall, they have a really easy time on this usually very tricky level. Though, thanks to their slow speed, it might take a while, so make sure you prioritise wiping out those production structures you could conceivably lose if you let their production run wild while you wait for your monolith to crawl around. I pick up two new pieces of war gear, as well as the forward basis power. I choose the Heart of Darkness, which increases HP regen, and the Skinning Blades for extra melee damage. For the second move of my turn, I attack the Western Barrens, as it is the territory that borders both the Spaceport and the Hyperion Peaks, which allows my Honor Guard army to be close enough to defend both, should they come under assault next turn. And it gives me a path to attack the Tau Stronghold. Given that I like taking down the Tau Stronghold first, I opt to not even bother fortifying the Western Barons and just rush their base and take them out. If I take out the Tau Stronghold next turn, no faction would be able to attack it without going through another territory first. And fortunately nobody attacks me on the defensive round and I'm free to wipe the Tau from the face of Cronus. So, Yada yada yada, we do the usual, defend the initial assault and build a nice fat base and army. Big tip for Necron Stronghold strats is use your Lord Destroyer's special abilities to first stasis and then possess yourself a couple of tanks. For the Tau you can get the Hammerhead and they will make demolishing Tau bases a cinch. Just be wary and don't charge them in blind as they do have broadside battle suits and hammerheads deployed at most bases and they will do good damage to any vehicles that get in their range, possessed or not. Of course if you are clever and pair them with a good spotter like say your Necron Lord, you might be able to hit them not from outside of their firing range 
but from outside of their view distance and prevent all damage altogether. But it requires a delicate touch and for you to eliminate any pesky pathfinders you spot. This should allow you to keep quite the sizeable army in defence while you charge around the map with your possessed hammerheads. Get the Shroud ability for your Necron Lord and he can even keep them invisible too. Combine that with some scarabs for repairs and securing yourself the relic so you can get the Nightbringer or Monolith out and you shouldn't have too much trouble cracking any particular base. Plus, Necrons can always fall back on their good old strat of resurrecting a previously failed assault at the start of a new one. The Necron Lord, if you have the Mask of Death war gear that lets him see invisible opponents, is also perfect for teleporting on top of all those annoying stealth suit snipers in elevated positions around the map. If by this point in the video you haven't got the gist of how to go about any particular stronghold, then you are on your own, as I've repeated myself more than enough already, although no guarantee I won't continue to repeat myself. Just let me say, with lots of teleports, infiltration and revivals, the Necrons probably have the best toolkit of any factions for dealing with the frustrations of this map. At the end, the Ethereal dies, the fortress is decimated, and I get my first two victory paragraphs for the Necrons. The paragraphs quite happily detail how the Necrons simply kill every single living thing they can find, and then abandon the place, and I quote, Automated vid systems still broadcast images from the desolate streets. The bleached bones of Tau, Kroot and humans lying still in the ash-strewn streets. No prizes for guessing how the rest of the Necron victory paragraphs go. I also get some war gear and go for the reaping blades to make the Necron Lord really deadly in melee. With the Tau annihilated, I decide to take the Agamar Desert from the Orcs, as it comes with some adorable flayed ones for my honor guard. A classic lock em in and fortify follows, although let's take a moment to appreciate some of the great animation work from the developers here. Woo, would you just look at that? Isn't that fantastic? I love some of the animations in this game. Even though they're old, they excite me to this day. My second move sees me nabbing and fortifying the Arceria forests and getting me the increased manpower bonus. Or Necron power, I guess. Then I have to fend off the Imperial Guard in the Pavonian heartland, but fortunately have no other defences that turn. The Eldar are threatening my precious spaceport, so I preemptively attack them in the Pamria lowlands, and after the old turtle manoeuvre, I get myself a wraith for Honor Guard. I use my second move for the turn to get me a key on a guard unit, the Crypt Pariah Squad from the Murad Swamplands. And I don't even bother to fortify as my honor guard can defend the territory while I'm there, and I'm just going to use my two moves on my next turn to secure the provinces that border it, starting with the Chaos Stronghold. So we do the defend ourselves and build a base dance. Up the left side, get ourselves the relic and some prisoners, grab the crit point and shut down the blood pulse. We disregard the right hand side of the map entirely and then we blow up the big base and the chaos gate. We're all across it at this point. Good? Good. Our victory paragraphs even outline how the Eldar still have some parchment crystals or whatever it is they use that remember when the Necrons and the Chaos used to beef in the old times before humans and Tau and other nonsense. Then it goes into exactly what the Necrons do when they find Chaos, which isn't just atomize every single Chaos thing they can find, but also all of the dirt and air Chaos has ever touched. Anything that has warp energy in it gets atomized. Almost like the soulless robots were designed to wipe out warp entities or something. Anyway, it illustrates that cool hell versus the graveyard dichotomy when the graveyard wins. It reduces all the fire spikes and screaming torture and carrying on nonsense down to nothing but ash and silence. You can choose what's the cooler, scarier outcome yourself. With my second move, I opt to follow the plan and nab the Mariah Coast from the Imperial Guard Army, who are sizing up there to try and take the Murad Swamplands I left undefended. I don't even fortify it because I'm pretty sure I know who's tasting the green lightning next. 
I end turn, fight a defense, win a war gear, you know the score. I pick the Death Shroud, which gives increased speed and protects from ranged attacks. I use my first move next turn to boot the Space Marines from the Oristan Plains, and it's a simple rush, then annihilate them a fair. And did you guess who was tasting the Green Lightning next? Yes, that's right. It's the Space Marines. <laughs> okay, so I left the Mariah Coast without my obsessive fortifications open for the Imperial Guard to attack. It's probably not the best move, but we'll deal with it when we come to it. This stronghold goes typically. After the initial attack and base building phase, I rush the orbital bombardment power, wipe out their forward reinforcement base, take the middle of the map on the way to wipe out the forward bases on the right. Then I nab the relic and assault the fortress, making sure to steal a couple of predators with the Lord Destroyers on the way. And... So long as you don't charge your forces straight into the wall of heavy bolters at the big choke point without some disruption from, say, a monolith teleporting on their heads or their own orbital bombardment redirected on top of them, their base will be nothing but singed green lightning toast in no time. The two paragraphs go out of their way to outline how all the Holy Faith Space Marine bullshit means nothing to the Necrons and that they ignore their sacred relics, which might be the entire super secret reason the Blood Ravens are even on Cronus, and they simply annihilate every living thing they can find. It particularly mentions that they disintegrate all the gene seed and nearly destroy the Blood Ravens chapter for good here because of it, which just goes to show how vulnerable the smaller Space Marine chapters really are in defeat. I get two bits of War Gear 2 and go for the Death Grip, increasing damage and health, and the Mantle of Doom, increasing health and morale. Is anyone surprised on the end of my turn that the Imperial Guard attacked the Mariah Coast that I failed to fortify? Lucky I'm playing as Necrons who, thanks to the mobility of the Necron Lord and the ability to deep strike flayed ones, are extremely good at rushing the enemy HQ so long as you were starting with a small base like I am here. So it's not a problem, but if I'd been starting with nothing at all, it could have been an unwinnable scenario for me. So that's good, but watch out for that. Upon victory, I gain the penultimate bit of war gear and pick the Necron tier sigils, giving the old Lord more ranged damage. With no other defences that round, I use the first move of my next turn to attack the Vandian coast and snap up the industrial production ability. With all adjacent provinces already conquered, it becomes a simple annihilate the opponent and chase the win objective. Remembering to not let the time run out, which this time around is very easy. I use my second move to position myself in the Povonian heartland so that I can run the Imperial Guard out of town on my next turn. The Guard, of course, attempt one final assault to dissuade me, but that doesn't last long, and I even nab the final bit of war gear on victory, and I get my range damage to maximum with the Gorse Flayer. Assaulting the Imperial Guard stronghold as Necron is probably one of the easier faction matchups for this particular scenario. Necron's mobility and high value models plus morale damage negate a lot of what the Imperial Guard have going on here. The Necron Lord alone can solve a lot of the entrenched problems you run into. With the opening assault and base build behind me, I do the usual wipe out the nearby base, push over the river and take out the base to the north. And then I time my run through the trench so not as to get vaporised and come in behind the other base and attack their artillery positions from behind. Then I move on to the southwest corner and attack their Baneblade production and air command and my army actually gets wiped out here but nothing a little bit of classic Necron Resurrection Orb can't deal with. Then it's destroy their fortifications at the mouth of the bridge, time another army movement through the big trench, and wipe out the commissar to turn coat some of the guardsmen. Destroy the power to the big gun, build my own power and take the relic, and start using the big gun to vaporise them while I regroup and reinforce. Then attack their final base with the monolith, a few stolen tanks and a whole bunch of necrons and enjoy my precious two victory paragraphs. 
All they say is the big gun in the trench couldn't stop the Necrons and that it's weak in comparison to what the Necrons can do, while name-dropping some of the events of the previous Dawn of War expansion, which I won't mention here because, as we talked about, I'm not actually covering that expansion unless someone out there really, really wants me to and asks me to nicely. With them dead and my second move to go, I decide to clean up this little orc territory, the Janus Savannah, which is another brainless honor guard rush their HQ in the opening minute of the game level. I end my turn, fight no defenses, and find myself another two whole moves to clean up this map. I take out the remaining specks of chaos at the Rion jungle next. Disappointed the orcs were too incompetent to do it while I was wiping out some of the other factions, but at least it's a short rush and it's all over. Then it's the orcs holding out on the little island known as the Rion floodlands, and despite the orcs usually being my favourite to leave to last, I've decided they are next on this particular playthrough. So no fortifying here, just rushing in with the honour guard and wiping their HQs off the map. Then I fight off defences from Eldar and the Orcs before assaulting the Orc stronghold at the Green Coast. As always, with this stronghold, the hardest part is dealing with the initial assaults. After that, it's just a game of wiping out the banners while risking as little as possible. With a unit like the Necron Lord and the ability to teleport most of your units out of the hot zone, the Necrons have no shortage of options for this, so it's fairly easy. Halfway through, I take the relic at the Moor of Gork, so I can use a monolith if I so desire. But I don't even bother. I just push through their main base and take out Gorguts and get my two paragraphs. They outline how normally getting rid of Orcs is impossible because of their reproduction, but the Necron's ruthless systemic purge was super effective and did the trick at no problemo. That just leaves the Eldar, the classic ancient enemy of the Necron, in the lore which is why I left them to last this time around. First up, I decide to take down my least favourite and eminently skippable territory, the Ariel Highlands, with a classic series of HQ rushes with my honour guard. Then it's the Deems Northlands turn, which is nothing short of a parade of my full honour guard rubbing it in the Eldar's face. Sure, they think they are well dug in, but they are in no way prepared for my shiny metal boot. The Elder Stronghold goes as normal. Defend, build base, push out to the left and take out the Chaos, cross the map and use the Squigoths to take out the Orcs. Secure the perimeter around the Eldar Fort, including the Relic, and then avoid capturing the critical points and doing the mission objective and instead find a way to exploit your faction's abilities to destroy the Eldar base instead. In the Necron's case, that's pull your monolith right up outside the base and use its very long-ranged attack to bombard their production structures while you repeatedly wait for the cooldown on your Nightbringer power to finish so you can use the big old Reaper Boy to wipe out a structure or two of your choosing. When it runs out, you can just teleport the Necron Lord out of there before the Eldar gank him too badly. Capturing a couple of Fire Prisms with your Lord Destroyer is also recommended. Go to town ganking the Super Avatar of Cain once you've cleared the base out, and with all their structures destroyed, I've won those final two paragraphs for the Necron campaign. They outline how the Eldar came to Kronos specifically just to deal with the Necron, and it goes on to say that the Necron particularly hate all of the Eldar's Wraithbone stuff and spend a lot of time making sure it is destroyed. I wonder why that could be. Their closing cinematic details how they use swarms of scarabs and other special devices to wipe out every last molecule of organic life from the planet and turn it into a Necron tomb world once more, which then becomes the heart of a Necron crusade through the eastern part of the galaxy, which successfully wipes out a huge part of it despite efforts from the Imperium Tau and others. Neat. Guess that's why the game's called Dark Crusade and the Necrons are on the cover art. Next up is the Imperial Guard, my absolute favourite faction to play in OG Dawn of War, and as a result maybe they'll get a bit more detail and attention than the other factions in this video. Well, maybe. They are the other Horde faction that isn't the Orcs. Unlike the Orcs, the Guard rely on lots of very squishy, regular dudes with laser rifles, which makes them a ranged horde army that loves to fall to pieces when a big, scary melee unit gets in amongst them. 
And given that most factions love big, scary melee units, that happens a lot. Fortunately, the Guard have methods of dealing with this. That usually involves making their own commanding officers even scarier than whatever monstrosity is tearing Guardsmen apart left and right. They are a fun faction. The most fun faction for me. And that's mostly because I find that using them involves the most push and pull, the most struggle for victory. And by struggle, I don't mean me, the gamer or player's frustration. I mean for them, the units in the game. Guardsmen win battles by throwing a horde of men at an opponent, losing all hope and falling back, calling in artillery, then charging in again, then falling back again, and reinforcing and then flanking with tanks and so on and so forth. It's messy, but if you understand that, that's just how they roll, it's really fun and feels the most like being in the moment in a fierce battle. Granted, as a horde ranged faction, sometimes when you have them fully geared up and have truly staggering numbers of bodies concentrating fire on a target, they can vaporise anything very quickly, and I reckon even give the Tau a run for their money for ranged damage, though not quite as long ranged in terms of distance of engagement. Unlike the Tau, Guardsmen are cheap, and losses are cheap and are basically factored into the equation of any particular engagement, skirmish, battle, or conflict. The Guard also have great vehicles. They aren't especially high-tech or flashy, but they are tough and cheap enough to mass-produce and fill every niche in their army to perfection. Rather than have a commander hero unit like the other factions, Guardsmen have a commander squadron led by a general to represent their less heroic individual theming, and more organisational collaborative army theme. Just like the Guard themselves, the Command Squadron is greater than the sum of its parts, with each of the units in it being much weaker than any other faction's heroes. But as they are a squad, they have the same advantage as lots of other squads in this game do, that upon losing models, they can fall back and reinforce, potentially giving them a lot more survivability but also giving them much less if micromanaged poorly. The core of your command squad is your Imperial General. This being Warhammer, the General leads from the front, and in this case has Wolverine-like power claws he insists on running up to the horrors of the 40k universe and getting up close and personal with. The rest of the command squad is made up of three specialised commander units that are available not just in this squad, but can also be purchased to lead just about any Imperial Guard squad. They are the Psyker, the Commissar, and the Priest. The Command Squad can, when fully upgraded, have a total of five members, and depending on how you choose to build it, can be a veritable smorgasbord of useful and powerful abilities. The Captain General, in the late tier, can call in a strafing run large area of effect ability that basically amounts to air support blasting dozens of missiles into an area. Not so useful against vehicles, but great at disrupting and denying territory for infantry. The Commissar's primary ability isn't relevant in the Command Squad, and we'll get back to it later, but his passive abilities of boosting morale and HP regeneration are always welcome, and he's a tough melee combatant. The Psyker has lots of powerful abilities, including being a detector. He has two powerful attacks that damage infantry, one good at damaging enemy hero units and one good at damaging and demoralizing enemy squads. And a final one that I find most useful, and it disables enemy vehicles. Used well, a Psyker ability at the right moment can turn a battle around. Finally, there is the Priest, who is a tough melee unit, adds hit points, morale, and a damage buff to any squad he's a part of, and has an ability that turns their squads invulnerable temporarily. Just in the single player campaign, the command squad can also unlock access to Cassacrin bodyguards, who are high damage long range units with no abilities. Overall, the command squad is indispensable to the Imperial Guard army, but isn't as straightforward as other hero units. In the early game, they make a good fire drawer and can go toe to toe with enemy heroes. Well, kind of. They usually lose in most melee engagements with powerful opponents, but with some kiting and reinforcing and good micro and synergy with their army, they can deal with just about anything. 
In the late game, they tend not to stand much of a chance against the likes of a Necron Lord or a Force Commander or War Boss directly, but have such a powerful abilities and are so useful that it more than makes up for it. And they can sit in your army chucking out lightning bolts and strafing runs and popping in vulnerability and running fire draw tactics. With the commanders out of the way, let's talk the regular Guardsman squad. These guys are simultaneously among the weakest and the strongest units in the game. An isolated guard squad without maximum members, leaders or upgrades are pretty much sitting ducks ready to be chewed up by anything. Well, anything except maybe chaos cultists. A fully reinforced and upgraded squad with a commissar and five plasma rifles or grenade launchers is going to hurt all but the toughest things that approach it just through sheer volume of fire. Multiply this by several dozen squadrons, and the guardsmen are incredibly dangerous to absolutely anything. Even a Bloodthirster or Avatar of Cain can see its HP drop rapidly, with 12 full squads concentrating fire on it all at once. Each squad can have 13 members, 14 if you include a leader. They are cheap and take 2 squad cap. In the campaign, you can potentially have a unit cap of 24, meaning with 12 squads you can fix a combination of 168 lasgun, plasma and grenade launcher barrels on a single target, which can be absolutely no fun for anything that has to endure the bombardment. Of course, rarely will you dedicate the entire squad cap to just the regular guardsman squad, but you can if you want to. And you will make the majority of your army out of them, no matter what. Guardsmen have a huge amount of upgrades available to them, and are necessary to keep them competitive as the tiers of the game play out, including buffs to their HP, numbers, amount of special weapons, range, damage, etc. Most important is to give them a leader. The same three leaders are available to them as in the Command Squad. Unlike the Command Squad, to get a Guardsman Squad a leader, you don't reinforce the squad with them, but build a special upgrade to your HQ that you can then purchase them from as an individual unit that you can then attach to the Guardsman squad with. Sounds cumbersome, but it allows you to attach the Psyker, Commissar or Priest to any squad, not just Guardsmen, or let you use them and their powers individually too. The Priest and Psyker function the same as they do in the command squad, but the Commissar's ability comes into play when attached to a Guardsman squad. Commissars can execute a single Guardsman model which instantly buffs their morale and damage. This is an essential strategy as the damage buff is significant and applies to all squads nearby, and they are very, very prone to losing morale. You can have an entire entrenched position of guardsmen screaming for their lives, losing members all over, and it looks like you are going to lose the whole match fast as some corn berserkers wade into your lines. And then you pop this ability, watch a commissar shoot a guardsman, and suddenly everyone's got their morale back and are doing extra damage, and the berserkers are just a berserker-shaped pile of ash. Similarly, a Dreadnought might be giving your men hell, but one Psyker later and it's disabled long enough for you to do something about it. Next up for their infantry is the Heavy Weapons Team. This is a single unit usually, but when deployed is a small squad that acts as a single unit, so no reinforcing. It carries around a heavy emplacement weapon. I imagine it's the kind of thing that a space marine could shoulder mount, but needs three guys, a dug-in emplacement, and a big heavy stand for regular humans to use. It starts off as a heavy bolter, but can be upgraded to an auto cannon or las cannon. As a bolter, it is excellent against infantry and heavy infantry. As a las cannon, it rips vehicles apart, and as an auto cannon, it's good against both, but not quite as good as either specialized weapon against their specialized target. It has fantastic range and works well with the spotter, but can only be used when deployed and cannot move once it is. It's also fairly slow to acquire a target if facing the wrong direction. They are amazing for defensive lines and as traps for ambushes. They are literally the big guns and one of the best answers in the game to heavy armour. They aren't so good for offensive tactics because of their setup time and vulnerability when moving. 
But if brought up in the back of an advancing army, the hordes of disposable guardsmen make ideal screen while they get set up and deal the real damage. Next are the Ogren. These big boys are a kind of space ogre that get giant shotguns. They are the Imperial Guard's heavy melee unit, and they are, in fact, their only melee unit, if you disregard the command squad. They are very capable in melee, and their shotguns are powerful but inaccurate. Really, they have one job. Attach a priest to them, turn them invulnerable, and charge them in first to absorb the damage and tie up the most powerful enemy units, while the rest of your army does what they are best at, and dish out the ranged damage. In a similar fashion, also perfect for tying up that one high value enemy range unit like flash kits or heavy bolter squadrons that are ripping your guardsmen up while you retreat. The guardsmen also get an elite version of irregular guardsmen called Cassacrin, who are among my favourite units in the game. They basically just are ultra rapid fire, ultra high damage versions of guardsmen. They are a little tougher and faster, and I like to pair them with a Psyker so they have abilities that make them versatile against vehicles and heroes. I just love the sound and style of their rapid fire las guns, and in fact this game has my favourite depiction of las guns of any Warhammer media. I'm not sure most other 40k fans would agree with me, but the thin red little lines that just instantly snap across the battlefield just feel so right to me. The final infantry unit available to the guard is the Assassin, whom counts as the guardsman's secondary hero unit. Although not really a hero like other factions, the Assassin is an anti-hero unit, a counter to heroes. Very long-ranged, able to deal a huge amount of damage to a single infantry target with their sniper rifle, and has the ability to infiltrate makes an excellent spotter and has an ability that temporarily increases their range and damage. Great at being a spotter, whether for your main army or for artillery, great for demoralising or warding regular infantry off strategic points, and great at laying a lot of hurt on high-value targets like an enemy Farseer or Chaos Lord. Not much good against vehicles, not great in melee, and doesn't really have the most HP, but is quite fast so can usually retreat and re-infiltrate if he gets into trouble. And before I get into vehicles, I thought I'd just mention the Imperial Guard Builder Unit, the Tech Priest Engine Seer. He is also my favourite builder unit in the game. Not only do I love his voice acting, I think he is both one of the best builder units in terms of build speed and damage, which might explain why you only get three of them instead of four like most other factions. He isn't that effective at combat, but he can be used in a way I'll mention in just a moment that makes him very useful for dishing out damage in certain situations. As for vehicles, well, the Imperial Guard have answers for everything. We'll start with the Chimera Transport, which isn't the fastest, but isn't slow. It isn't the toughest vehicle, but it isn't the most fragile either. It isn't the most dangerous, but it isn't defenseless. It carries three squadrons and takes up only one unit cap, which means that you can easily carry most of your army around in these things, no problem. They're tough enough to get your army into the front lines, and then they are quite adequate at providing support to infantry and even being useful to fall back to and evac with. They are not tough enough to be a frontal assault unit in and of themselves, but they do allow the units garrisoned inside to fire out from inside of them, which makes them a little bit more useful when used in synergy with the forces they are transporting. And by that I mean... They can fire out regular lasers. If you, say, put Cassacrins inside of them, they don't suddenly get Cassacrin guns. They kind of have mounted internal guns that whatever troop is inside of them can use. I believe it is meant to represent the troops firing out from inside, though. Then there's the Sentinel, the Imperial Guard's walker unit. Unlike the other faction's walkers, who tend to be giant, tough, vehicular melee units, the Sentinel is a fast, fragile scout unit that carries a deceptively effective las cannon. In groups, they can be devastating to buildings and vehicles and are fast enough to hit and run these units easily. They can also decap strategic points that don't have a listening post, although they can't cap them. This makes them excellent frontline scout and harassment units. They also provide much needed mobile anti-vehicle versatility to the Guardsman army in tier 2. 
Two or three sentinels in the back of a horde of guardsmen can spell the end of units like dreadnoughts or falcon grav tanks that otherwise guardsmen have no answer for outside of the unwieldy, slow-to-deploy heavy weapons team. All of this in exchange for being extraordinarily fragile and having no answer to infantry or melee. One stray rocket or power claw and kiss your sentinel goodbye. Next is the Hellhound, which is the guard's vehicular answer to massed enemy infantry. The Hellhound is a better armoured Chimera chassis, with a giant flamethrower on top. Great for dealing area of effect damage to a group of infantry and sapping their morale, and excellent at taking out buildings in the mid-game. Not especially long-ranged, but tough enough to make up for it. It can also deny ground to enemies with a special ability that basically lights a patch of ground on fire for an extended period of time that will damage anything unfortunate enough to be caught in it, including your own units or the Hellhound itself. While I don't find this as useful as the Sentinel, if I'm being rushed early by Orcs or Chaos or any infantry army, spamming these guys can sort it out fairly quickly. But where? They tend to explode in fiery infernos that are quite dangerous in terms of friendly fire, so they don't play as nice amongst your own massed horde as sentinels do. Finally now, we're up to the best unit in the entire game. My favourite unit of all time, maybe of any game ever. The unit I would marry if I could. The Basilisk. Nothing but a slow moving giant tracked artillery cannon. These things can outrange absolutely anything in the game. They aren't perfectly accurate by any means, but they are more than accurate enough to be useful. They provide absolutely fantastic disruption against infantry and heavy infantry, and more than enough damage to bombard buildings and vehicles. They have a very expensive special ability called the Earth Shake Around that costs a thousand requisition and a thousand power per shot but does so much damage on such a large area that it can instantly shred almost any infantry squad in the game, and landing two or three of them in a row can erase any vehicle or building. Many an enemy has thought they had the Imperial Guard on the back foot, only for a few basilisks to wipe out their base with earth shaker rounds, shooting right over their army's heads. If you have a powerful economy, you can spam Earthshaker rounds all day, but if you attempt to use them too early, it will cripple your own economy. They do have a long cooldown per shot for a semblance of balance. Endlessly fun to use, but watch out, they are quite capable of friendly fire and blowing your own dudes up as much as they are taking out your enemy. They can easily lock onto a melee squad that charges into your own ranks without you noticing and cause you and your men a lot of headaches. Basilisks work marvellously with a spotter like the Assassin, or simply parked in the back of your army, or well behind your lines. The Imperial Guard also get a bit of an overpowered ability as part of their HQ that lets them reveal any spot on the map for a limited time, and reveal any infiltrated units in that patch, which when paired with the Basilisk's Earth Shaker rounds, is almost cheating, I swear. It also has a long cooldown, but this can be mitigated with multiple HQs. Their weakness is that they are useless at absolutely anything except shooting a large explosive shell over a huge distance. They are very slow, they aren't especially tough, they have a minimum range so anything that gets too close they can't attack at all. They are loud and give their position away with every shot. Every faction has units that can effectively counter basilisks. Anything that's effective against vehicles will annihilate them in seconds, and lots of factions have an anti-vehicle option paired with good mobility. For example, melter bombs carried by assault marines. You can jump assault marines over some terrain, hit the basilisks with melter bombs, and jump back out before the guard can respond. Chaos can summon horrors in behind them, or deep strike obliterators. Orcs can use tank busters stealth to get the drop on them. Tau can use stealth and mobility with their stealth suits, and so on. 
The game is overflowing with effective counters to basilisks, and it's a good thing too, because basilisks used well are just about the most dangerous, effective and fun thing in the entire game, and honestly I've never played any other game where artillery feels this good. Then there is the iconic Lehman Russ battle tank, also my favourite tank in the game. While not outright the most powerful tank, or the one with the most options, I do find it the most useful. Sure, a Predator can be outfitted with LAS cannons and become an anti-vehicle powerhouse or be left with auto cannons and heavy bolters and annihilate infantry, or a little bit of both. And sure, the Hammerhead already has answers to everything, but the Lehman Russ is tough and has exceptionally good range. It can sit just on the edge of the fog of war and effectively tank snipe anything and its main battle cannon is a lot more subtle chipping away at stuff than the giant blue hammerhead energy blast or las cannon for that matter. And because it is so tough, it's perfect for doing what tanks do best, being tanks. Drawing fire, leading the assault, supporting the massive infantry. I find it excels in its role as an actual tank more than any other tank in the game. You can leave it on a strategic point, confident its heavy bolters can deal with the infantry, and that it can chew up any light vehicle and give a heavy vehicle a real headache, and be confident it has the speed and toughness to keep firing while it retreats. It is the most effective workhorse tank in the game, and it is always reliable and always punches way above its weight. It's not fancy and not special, but it also has no drawbacks. It's just a tough, useful tank through and through. The Imperial Guard also get my favourite relic unit. And let's face it, almost everyone's favourite relic unit. The absolutely absurd 11 barrels of hell, obscenely massive tank known as the Bane Blade. These things should, by any semblance of common sense or logic, collapse under their own weight at any moment, but it is just such a glorious dedication to the over-the-topness of Warhammer that you have just got to love the thing. With 11 different guns, it of course has a weapon for every kind of unit and situation in the game, including one that can do artillery to a degree. On paper, I believe it is probably the most dangerous and most damage outputting unit in the game, although in practice this is less true. It has a lot of HP, but if a Bloodthirster jumped on it in melee, I'd put the money on the Bloodthirster. If a Land Raider came up against it and used its speed and abilities well, the Land Raider might cinch it. It's tough and slow, but not invulnerable. It sure as hell draws attention. No enemy is about to do anything except focus on one when it turns up. It certainly has the capacity to erase just about anything it points its guns at. Nevertheless, the real use of the Baneblade is as the ultimate fire draw. Its presence is so arresting, so demanding, that most players in the LAN party back in the day would immediately forget that all the real damage output in the Imperial Guard army comes from the hordes of regular guardsmen all shooting at the same time at the same thing. So, when they concentrate all their forces on trying to get rid of your Bane Blade, now is the chance for you to really hit them where it hurts with the rest of your army. Against AI, they are not so clever, and often with the way the vehicle cap plays out, getting a Bane Blade may not even be necessary most of the time. But they are just such a wondrous joy to behold, steamrolling over the battlefield, spewing little mushroom clouds, las cannons and heavy bolt of fire singing, that sometimes you just gotta. If you come up against the Bane Blade, I'd urge you to remember that it isn't actually that tough or dangerous if you don't panic. It's so slow and unwieldy that with a few of the right abilities and the right kind of weapons pointed at it, it'll go down in good time. Just don't forget to keep the rest of the guard army tied up and disrupted. That's where the real DPS lies. Before we get to the playthrough, I'd like to talk about the Imperial Guard buildings. You see, on the surface of it, the guards seem like they are a slow slog of an army with little mobility. Well, mobility that doesn't relate to tank treads. You see, every Imperial Guard building isn't just a building. It's a bunker. Every single one has slots to shoot out of. 
emplaced heavy weapons inside and plenty of room for squads to hunker down in. More than that, every single building is connected to every single other one with underground tunnels. Guard are masters of entrenched defences, and this is how the game reflects that. The guard may not have great mobility on the offence, but defensively they have some of the best mobility in the game. Able to fall back to any building, then rapidly redeploy to just about any other Imperial Guard structure on the map, making it easy to hold built-up strategic points and giving them extremely effective routes to fall back and regroup for counter-offensives. On top of this, it also gives them a huge amount of early game survivability, as the guard are among the weakest, the most vulnerable in the early game. Remember how I love the Tech Priest Engine Seer? Well, say a structure can have three units garrisoned inside of it. I believe with one unit inside a structure, it just fires las guns. But if there are two or three units inside of it, the heavy weapons like plasma guns fire from inside as well. A tech priest counts as one full bar of garrison in any structure, just as much as a whole squad of guard does. This means you could garrison three tech priests in a building and it would be exactly the same as having three fully loaded guard squads in there. This same trick works out with other single units like the priests, Commissar, Psychers, Assassin, and Undeployed Heavy Weapons teams. In the early game, where the guard are most vulnerable and most outgunned, they can garrison their structures and wear their buildings as armour, and then can live to fight on once the buildings have blown up, or zip off through their tunnels to regroup. An absolute favourite tactic, and one of the reasons I love to play guard so much. It encourages you to build forward bases, and entrenched positions that you can rally around and fall back to. It encourages you to use your structures as an expanding front, really making the faction feel and play like a defensive army that crawls forward as much with buildings as with treads. Imperial Guard also advance up their tech tree by building certain relevant buildings and then building relevant add-ons or depots and upgrades within their buildings. So their method of expanding via defensive building can also serve to encourage developing their tech tree. The opening cinematic details how the Guard were pursuing the Eldar when they came to Cronus which is one of those tidbits that links Dark Crusade to the Winter Assault expansion from before it. But we won't worry about that. They land in their stronghold at Victory Bay, find an old relic Titan Cannon, which is such a big deal that upon reporting it, the Imperium changes the orders of the Guard to securing the whole planet and any relics it holds, and goes so far as to rename the whole Imperial Guard Regiment the first Cronus Liberators. The intro makes sure to make clear that the Blood Raven Space Marines are absolutely not cool with this and that with neither of them willing to back down are quite happy to slaughter each other despite being on the same side. Which, for fans of 40k, isn't really a surprise. And for fans of RTS, well, it isn't either. But I do like it better when they work together, even if it works better for a game like this if they don't. And that's the setup. You start in your stronghold on Victory Bay, and being only two moves from both the key spaceport and Fury territories, I immediately strike out at the Pavonian Heartland, which is held by the Necron. In the early game, Necron are a bit of an awkward matchup for the guard. On the one hand, their slow moving but tough high value targets are ideal units to kite and concentrate fire on, but on the other hand, their special abilities and powerful melee make them a tricky and potentially very dangerous opponent in the very early days before guard have their shit together. It's scrappy and lots of guardsmen die, but by making good use of falling back to the bunker buildings and regrouping and reinforcing and lots of kiting, I'm able to deal with the Necron Lord and the first few Necron warriors and flayed ones that rush me. I get a couple of squads together and push their base, only to be forced back by freshly summoned Necrons, a revived Lord and some Wraiths. In the meantime, however, I've managed to build up enough structures that I can fall back to them, wear them as armour, and bleed their forces dry while making minimal losses myself, 
and in this way, I am able to gradually out-economy them. Necron's slow, high-value units losing out to cheap losses on the Imperial Guard's side, which buys me the time to advance up my tech tree and get some hellhounds and plasma guns out and assault their base. That momentum is more than enough for me to bottle them up and take my time turtling a nice built up huge base and get to the top of my tech tree at my leisure for later defences before I eventually choose to finish them off with a bane blade. Because when you got access to a tank this big you just gotta. I get awarded war gear and some relic unit regular guardsmen known as the regimental bodyguard. I choose the targeting optics, so my general can spot infiltrated units and do more ranged damage. I fight no defences and I'm free to go for the spaceport at the start of my next turn. The spaceport goes pretty much like it does for every other faction. I grab all the servitors as fast as I can because I already know where they are, but I don't get many fortifications built. Guard don't have great mobility options to speed this up in the early game, but make up for it with cheap base units. Two guard squads can grab two servitors in about the same amount of time as one highly mobile squad, like a jump pack or teleporting unit. It's over in about five minutes. I end turn, don't get attacked, and then go for the air as Badlands to grab Fury and, and complete our holy duo of winning the campaign. Fighting the Necrons is much like mentioned before. If you rush and your micro goes well, you kite and use your concentrated fire, you can play your squishy numbers advantage against the Necrons quite easily and rack up the kills without taking too many losses of your own. Use your command squad to draw fire while the bulk of your guard concentrate fire on the Necrons themselves. Get plasma guns early so that your guard are extra effective against them, and whatever you do, fall back as soon as your squishy regular squads get into trouble, as this mission is a numbers game, and the guards in particular are vulnerable to having their losses run away, as they are pretty much designed for that. Get your guardsmen and tech priests into your bunker building ASAP at the first signs of any serious danger, and you should have no problems. Chimerias can be useful as mobile versions of this, just watch out for immortals. Other than that, I try and fortify and get up my tech tree as much as possible. I just fell back to my base when I was 9 kills from victory and turtled building as much as I could, waiting for the losses from their inevitable assault to win the game for me. With the important abilities in my hands, I use my newly earned second move to attack the Panria lowlands and start securing the territories around my key provinces so that I don't have to defend them. This territory has the Space Marine Force Commander occupying it, so I have to fend off a rush on my HQ in the opening minute, which Guard are experts at thanks to their bunker buildings. With that done, I'm free to charge forward bottleneck them into their base while I fortify the rest of the map, which I have fun doing with any faction, but is the most fun with Guard, who are designed for it. An early Tier 2 Dreadnought from the Space Marines would have had me helpless, but fortunately I had some heavy weapons teams out and upgrading to LAS cannons that allowed me to counter them. There are few things in the game a horde of guard are so poorly equipped to deal with as high armor melee walker units with flamers, so it's good to be aware that that's your Achilles heel and try and get some anti-vehicle weaponry on the field as early as you can. Guard do not have simple early game anti-vehicle units like a lot of the other factions do, but the heavy weapons team can be very effective if used well. And those cheeky marines hit my bottleneck with an orbital bombardment. And they follow it up with a rush, which wipes a few of my defences, but a lot of my squad survive thanks to the bunker buildings and their tunnel. I'm able to fall back to my next line of defence. I actually might be on the ropes. This is a harsh lesson in why you always try to cripple your opponent before they get to tier 3. I rush out some sentinels to counter their vehicles, and that seems to drive them back. Theoretically, they should be unable to out economy here, and that should win me the battle. See, this is why I love Imperial Guard. I just don't get this kind of back and forth struggle with other factions. 
While I've got breathing room, I focus on getting down more power plants and vehicle production facilities. As if you've got a strong enough resource base, it doesn't matter how powerful a single AI opponent army is, you will be able to overcome it as the guard. Two opponents is a different story, of course. They attack me again and hit me with another orbital bombardment, and I use my tunnels to dodge it again, but this time, with my larger resource base, I am able to roll out some basilisk artillery support, and that's going to make all the difference. Now I can use Earthshaker rounds to annihilate structures and armies on a scale the Marines wish their orbital bombardment could achieve, all while the rest of my army sits pretty in a defensive posture, ready to fall back into their tunnels at the first sign of trouble. On a small map like this one, there is little the AI can do about a strategy like this. A smart human player could of course try all sorts of sneaky or clever plans to deal with it, as every faction has mobility options to get behind their opponent, but the AI will not be clever enough to pull this off. I roll out the Bane Blade and start building my second base, and at this point the map is unlosable. Even if the Marines came at me with both their unit caps full and a land raider, I'd be able to deal with it. So, once I'm built up to a satisfactory degree, I move my basilisks up and start annihilating their fortifications with Earthshaker rounds. Then my whole army moves up and the Space Marines are done for. I take a little bit of extra time before finishing them off to build a few more fortifications, mines and turrets and such to make defending this province later easier, as I am expecting to fight a few defences on it, and then I roll my Bane Blade down to their main HQ and it's lights out. I get some war gear and an honor guard Vindicare Assassin, who will make an excellent spotter for future artillery barrages. I go with the Governor's Raiment for war gear, as it increases the squad of vehicle cap, which is pretty powerful as it is, and also lets me add Cassacrin bodyguards to my command squad, making it a bit more of a ranged powerhouse, if I so wish. With that done, I end turn, and surprise surprise, the Space Marines immediately attack me on the counter-offensive to try and win back the same province I just took from them. Thanks to my elaborate preparation, my turrets are destroying their buildings in the opening seconds of the map. In no time, I have Lehman Russ and Baneblade out on the field, and the Space Marines last about 5 minutes. I get another war gear and go with the Victory Sash, which increases the always low Guardsman morale and improves the speed at which requisition comes in, another quite powerful bonus. Next, because no other faction is in a position to attack my undefended spaceport on the next turn, I decide to double down on my resource bonus and go for the Vandian coast. I rush my honor guard at the enemy HQ and those new Cassacrin bodyguard give my command squad some real early game anti-infantry firepower and I have no problem locking down their base with an early game rush. For this province now, it's just a matter of whether I collect the power for the mission objective or blow up all their structures first. It was structures by a long shot. In addition to the industrial production bonus, I get some war gear and I go with the carapace chestplate to make my commander a bit tougher in terms of HP. With my second move for the turn, I decide to secure the spaceport's border a little better and make a move on the five-strength province held by the Tau that is the Western Barrens. At this point, the momentum is getting in my favour, and scrappy back and forth openers are less likely. I rush my honour guard, encounter their opening push, and overcome it. Guard don't have a terrible matchup with the very early Tau. If you have a detector on the field, stealth units are no issue. Granted, in a non-campaign mode, this might be quite hard, as Guard's lowest hanging detector is the Psyker in Tier 2. And Fire Warriors are not especially dangerous in the low numbers they start in, and their high damage is countered by how cheap Guardsman losses are. And then, the Tau Commander suffers from the same high-value target being swarmed by cheap concentrated fire equation that we've already discussed plenty. Vespid Stingwings used well could be a real headache for the guard, and a few minutes past the opening and Crook Carnivores backed up by fully enforced fire warriors could chew through them, but fortunately, not too much trouble in this instance as the AI isn't exactly a savvy player. 
I am able to push till I encounter the somewhat dev-cheated tower defences of listening posts plonked not on valid strategic points, and then I camp outside their base. The devs obviously chose to do this to give the tower some sort of actual fixed emplacement, but there is no way a player can place listening post defences in this manner if they are playing as the Tau. This map is interesting in that you are on a raised platform in the centre, so they can simply circle around and go for you from the other side. Fortunately, a smart player will be expanding that way as well, and taking as many strat points as possible so they can out-economy their foe and lock them down. So even though I encountered the Tau trying to rotate out of their base and poke me in the behind, I have my scout capping troops able to defend and plonk down an infantry command to give me some building armour to fall back to. Then it's just a matter of trotting out some plasma guns and armour and fortifying until I decide to take them out. I get a hellhound for honour guard and end my turn. I don't have to fight any defences and then I decide to go for the Assyria forest province to get that sweet increased manpower bonus, particularly useful for the horde-based guard. As always, with this map being so tiny and usually held by the Necron in a base right next to yours, means that the early game rush is immediate and effective, and there's not much to talk about. I lock their base down, fortify and take them out at my leisure. The addition of the Hellhound to my honor guard really does help with taking out early game buildings, so that's cool. With my manpower bonus secured, I decide to go for the Twisted Child of Dark Crusade and attack the Hyperion Peaks early, while the Orcs still have the, a strength of 7 and the forward production bonus could still be conceivably useful to me, especially on Stronghold maps. Guards start with two Holbane Blades and two Basilisks, which pretty much means so long as I rush the Bane Blades and take out the key production buildings as I've already discussed, and then I set the Basilisks to support, I cannot lose this. I also get two Heavy Weapons teams and two Cassacrin squads with two Psychers to lead them, so I've got the firepower to back up your armour against the infantry, not to mention a bunch of regular Guardsmen and some Sentinels. Not the most ridiculous overpowered start, but up there. The Bane Blades could almost solo this one. So, I do the old rush the crit point in the centre root routine while my Bane Blades already get to work in one of the bases. The Bane Blades take some heavy damage, but I am able to fall back to the high ground overlooking the crit point and do what Guard does best and form a defensive line with the Basilisks at the back and get my Bane Blades repaired with my only Tech Priest. Once they are back in action, I send one Bane Blade to take care of the base on the left while the other holds down the defensive position. Then I can roll them forward and take the crit point and begin assaulting the final Orc base, which does not last long under the onslaught of two whole Bane Blades and their exceptional range and anti-building and anti-vehicle weaponry. With that done, it really is just playing leisurely cleanup with the rest of the structures on the map, and in the off chance I have to defend this province later, I make sure to cap all the strategic points, but with no real requisition income or ability to properly build, there is no way to fortify. But I do go ahead and spend some planetary requisition on garrisoning some squads in the territory just to make any defences I do have to fight there easier. I end turn and have to defend the Western Barons from the Necron. And it's over in five minutes because of my good fortifications. Fortunately, there are no other defences this turn and I'm free to secure a territory bordering the spaceport, the Vandemar Mountains. With just one Necron base on another small map, this is another simple rush. Bottle them up and fortify, with victory earning me another Honor Guard Assassin. With my second move, I secure the final province bordering the spaceport, the Oristan Plains, held by the Space Marines. I overcome the Space Marines' first rush, which comes from both directions and honestly without powerful honor guard has the potential to be dangerous for guard, as they don't have a great matchup against the Space Marines, who both have the toughness and numbers and access to melee early to make it hard for the guard, as we saw in the very first back and forth on the Pavonian Heartlands. 
But with their rush defeated, the rest goes as normal. I push forward and cripple their base, camp outside and fortify the rest of the map to deal with the future defence missions. I win a regimental commissar for honour guard and end turn. I am not attacked, so I'm free to take another two provinces. So I go for the Rian floodlands down by the Orc stronghold because I want those veteran Cassacrans. Another flawless rush, lock them down and fortify without much to talk about. Orcs potentially have the best early game matchup against Guard as they have so many tough melee units in the early game and also have cheap horde units so Guard's only early game advantage doesn't fly against them. Guard do have a good counter with their bunker buildings but it can really let the Orcs grab all the strat points and out-resource them if the Guard player isn't clever. Fortunately, the Orcs hero wasn't on this province when I attacked, so they didn't have a standing army waiting to counter my own honor guard, and therefore it's a cakewalk. I win my veteran Cassacrans, and with move two, I go for the Janus Savannah held by the Necrons. I rush them, and they have some turrets up, but my Hellhound is well suited to taking them down while my guardsmen and assassin deal with their troops. Another unremarkable lock them in and fortify follows. I win a sanctioned Psyker for Honor Guard for my troubles. Yet another round of no defences, which is remarkable given the amount of territory I hold, and that I have the Space Marines completely locked into their stronghold, and the Necron and Tau almost completely locked in. I go for the Deem's Northlands, because it's about time the Elder felt my bite, and I really don't feel like seeing them get that territory to a 6 strength double base slog. I rush them and encounter no opening rush from their honor guard even though they are present and lock them into their base with no issue. I take my time building some elaborate fortifications as I know I'll find a bundle of defenses here then I wipe their base with my basilisks and get an honor guard sentinel for my effort. Second move I attack the Rian jungle to nab me another sentinel and prevent another 5 strength territory going to 6. With no commander nearby on the planetary map, there is no standing army and my opening rush is unopposed. Copy and paste another hold the choke point on their base and fortify the rest of the territory and not long after I'm booting them from the province. With my sentinel earned, I end turn and I have to defend against the Necron in the Western Barrens. Unfortunately, they are up to attacking me with double opponents, so it takes 10 minutes instead of 5, but I get two pieces of war gear, and I go for the Carabas Pauldrons and Carabas Greaves, which make my commander tougher and faster. The Elder also attack me and are dispatched quickly. I marvel that the Space Marines didn't attack me, they've been sitting quietly locked in their stronghold for quite some time. I decide it's finally time to get rid of some of these factions and attack the Chaos Stronghold. One of the two strongholds I like to get rid of first, the other being the Tau, if you couldn't remember. Thanks to forward bases, I'm able to start the map with a couple of turret emplacements already built, and I fend off their initial assault without too much trouble. Then, after the usual build-up, I get a visit from the not-so-friendly neighbourhood Bloodthirster. And even though it's tough, I have more than enough guns pointed at it that it gets sucked back to the hell from whence it came. Then I push to the left while my honor guard holds the right. It goes just like it does with every other faction. I time my push to dodge the blood pulse, wipe out their forward base next door, and then push up to the relic and release the prisoners. Guard have a particularly easy time thanks to their Earthshaker round artillery. The prisoners include an assassin, which meant on this map Imperial Guard can use four assassins at once, if you include the two Honor Guard ones and the one you can build normally, which is remarkably effective against just about everything, including buildings and vehicles. Goes a ways to explaining why they are normally capped to just one. The next is grabbing the crit point in the centre of the map and shutting down the blood pulse, then finally pushing the Chaos main base and ignoring all of their stuff on the right hand side of the map. With this being guard, it's as simple as dropping Earthshaker rounds while you camp outside using your HQ's exactly Earthshaker round sized ability to reveal them through the fog of war. Then charge in and take out the gate, or you know, Earthshaker round the gate, and I get my first two paragraphs for the guard. 
in which they suffer a lot of losses for their victory, get the honourable title Demon Killers, and have a bunch of their psychos, not all of them, but a lot of them, go mad and need to be executed. What fun. I win a piece of war gear and go with the Mastercrafted Power Claws to increase melee damage. With the stronghold out of the way, I decide to clean up one of the now leaderless Chaos Provinces and get myself another Honor Guard Cassacrin. So I attack the Murad Swamplands. There's now no reason for me to fortify the territory as it's impossible for it to be attacked, so I just rush their base and wipe it out and that's that. Then it's end turn for me and I fight off the Elder again and get myself some war gear. I choose the Power Fist for even more melee damage. Then I clean up the last remaining Chaos Province and attack the Mariah Coast for a regimental bodyguard, which has low defense and with no standing army get walked over in a couple of minutes. This sets me up nicely to take out the Necrons for good on my second move, which given my large and diverse Honor Guard army means I have little trouble dealing with the Necrons that pop up in my base in the opening hours of the map and I'm free to take my time setting up and building as large a base and an army as I like. Of course, if you've watched this far, you've seen the breakdown of this map enough, so I'll focus on what's unique about doing it as guard, and that is Basilisk Artillery, which you can use in combination with your HQ special ability, spot the base to the south of you, and start pounding it with Earthshaker rounds without ever leaving your cushy defensive structure. Oh, and points to the guard who not only airdrop buildings and supplies while they are in a cavern, but also have their fully functioning artillery work without smashing shells into the cavern ceiling. I'll never get sick of clowning on this particular map's incongruity. With as much damage inflicted there as I can, I'm then free to bring that same strategy out of the base, advance my front line forward and then bombard to my heart's content, which is very effective against the Necron pylons, as you can Earthshaker them into oblivion from outside of their range of effect. Then, after I clear the rest of the map the same way for completion's sake, it's bomb plant time, and we use Chimeras to quickly evacuate the command squad to the exit point at my main base and butter boom Our victory paragraphs describe the Imperial Guard taking heavy losses and being very scared. But what else is new? They also say that a bunch of Necron buildings don't get buried and poke up above the desert's surface, so the guard just drop more bombs and artillery on them until they don't anymore, which is no less than what I would expect from the guard. I get no special rewards and I end turn. I fight off a defence from the Space Marines, who must have been just busting to get out of their home territory, but they didn't last very long against a well-made guardsman defence line. No other defences, so with my first move I attack the Agamar Desert to get me some big fat Honor Guard Ogrens. The last Honor Guard I need to snap up in this campaign. I rush my Honor Guard to defend the bottleneck outside the Orc base and get to fortifying the map. As this was only a two defence map and there is only one enemy base, it's low risk if it comes down to an all out max population cap brawl. But Guardsmen, more than any other faction can afford to not perform the old cripple the enemy base manoeuvre immediately, as if they do get locked into a stalemate, they can always end it using artillery earthshaker rounds on the enemy's HQ or other key structures. Still, we get a nice big dust up because I didn't cripple them and I'm forced to fall back, but good old guardsman building armour shields me from the losses and I drive the orc offensive off. Next time they try it, I have enough on the field that it's cleaned up with only a few losses for me, and by this point I've got heavy armour, so even though they throw a squig off at me, it barely makes a dent, and it's almost dead by the time my bay blade even arrives. I use the old 11 barrels of hell to drive forward and race the orc base from the map, only to see they've done the old sneaky and expanded to a second base elsewhere. But that's only a few more minutes before that's nothing but smoky, orky rubble as well. With victory comes another bit of war gear, and I upgrade to a storm bolter for some extra ranged firepower. With the second move of my turn, it's time for the Tau to say goodbye. Except that I don't have enough planetary requisition to get my full honor guard on the field. So, I end turn instead. Good fortune smiles upon me, and I fight no defenses. I guess... Everyone's had enough of losing, 
so I'm free to attack the Tau, and this time with everything I've got. Aware that I'm fighting the hardest map in the late-ish game, I make sure to use what remaining planetary requisition I have to get four turrets at the start of the game to help fend off their initial rush, which goes exactly as planned, and leaves me to happily do the defend and build up forces dance. Guard get to solve the problem of the stealth suits in hard to reach places on the map the way guards solve all their problems with artillery shells, which you can see me doing here from in my base. Then straight after that, the never ending one, two, back and forth hammerhead, then greater Narlock assaults that make this map so frustrating begin. But with such powerful artillery, guard don't have to commit their forces too far away from the base to do some real damage to the outer ring of tower structures and defences. With my command squad beefed up with war gear, they make excellent tough spotters for the artillery, able to take a few hits and fall back, hopefully before the basilisks themselves get hit. And if they don't take your fancy, there's always assassins for the classic stealth and scope spotter roll. They chew up infantry, especially stealth suits, and the big guns take care of vehicles and buildings. A good tip is that those same vantage points the Tau stealth suits use to get the drop on you also make excellent artillery positions to bombard that outer ring of bases with. And I couldn't reach one of them from there, so I had to commit a little forward position to deal with it. But just be prepared to fall back if one of the those inevitable 1-2 Tau assaults come at you. With their outer ring busted, it's time to decide what to do about their inner ring. Phrasing. That is the inner ring of defensive bases, and as usual, I decide it's the one in the center on top of that juicy relic that I want to take down first. With my small artillery sortie, I advance, and with a little patience and a lot of shells, the relic is free of Tau. Then I decide of the one two hammerhead greater Nylock assaults, taking out the one, the hammerhead assaults, would be most expedient and I inch my little artillery block forward enough to commence a very heavy rain indeed on the left position of the inner ring. And all the while my bustling defences are busy working away murdering any town monstrosities brave enough to try their luck. I'm not exactly sure how the AI on this map works, but I suspect it might tell the Tau's assaulting forces to attack the most powerful concentration of forces that you have on the map. That may explain why other times I did this map with other factions, I kept on having those tower assaults not only go for my main HQ, but keep on flanking my main army as it tried to take out their bases. This time, where I only have a small defensive force outside of my base looking after my basilisks, they don't seem to be attracting any kind of rotating flanking manoeuvre, which would absolutely decimate them and undo my strat, that is, point by point unpicking the tower defence grid with my artillery. So I guess the lesson is, if you do have the capacity to work through the tower defences with a minimal but effective force, do it and keep the majority of your forces concentrated in elaborate defences. Almost as if it's designed for the guard and may go a long way to explaining why the guard are my favourite faction, avoiding the town frustration. With the left inner ring base annihilated, I move back through the centre point and capture the relic while I'm at it and start building a nice little base there. There's also the Tau Communications Tower that gives you an ability that's pretty much the one that the Imperial Guard HQ already has, then I make a move on the right-hand side in a ring base that spawns the two Greater Narlock Assault. With little fear of being flanked at this point, it's fairly simple to advance the artillery into range, and I decide to take advantage of some of that defensive higher ground again. I beat the Tau at their own game. I get a Bane Blade on the field and clean up the last of the defences in the city so I can turn my attention to their main fortress, which is still pumping out assaults. But with a Bane Blade, two Lehman Russes, three Basilisks, and a whole army of guardsmen, I have an assault of my own to dish out. Although I'd still be a fool to just charge in there, even with this armor, and the best strat remains using the long range scanner HQ ability to spot targets and wipe them out with Earthshaker rounds. 
otherwise known as the Universal Dawn of War Imperial Guard Crutch Procedure. Then there's nothing left to do except clean up with the big tanks and wipe out the mission objective Tau Ethereal. The two paragraphs tell of the Guard's particular delight in liberating the city as it used to be Imperial who knows how long ago and how they parade through the streets and then proceed to hold trials and executions for any traitorous alien collaborator humans who worked with the Tau, which I imagine would have been everybody because I think the Tau had been in control of this planet for generations. I get my final piece of war gear as well, which is a wrist-mounted plasma pistol, making my governor militant particularly deadly against heavy infantry at range. Then, because I waited a turn before attacking the Tau, I have a second move, so I use it to position myself to make the Space Marine go bye-bye, which, after an end turn and another no defences, happens immediately. There's some dramatic dialogue between the Imperial Guard General and the Space Marine Chapter Master, because they respect each other's integrity, but have to kill each other anyway, because this is Warhammer, and that's how you 40,000 things in a mid-2000s video game that definitely didn't have the time, budget, scope, or inclination to include alternative options. The opening assault from the Space Marines is brutal if you aren't ready, but nothing on what the Tau throw at you and certainly nothing for an honour guard as pumped as this one. Unfortunately, the guard have almost no way to deal with the whirlwind bombarding them up the top of the base in the opening minutes of the map. No teleporting units, no jumping units, no counter special abilities, nothing that wouldn't involve the risk of losing honour guard early in the game. So I just do without the strategic point being bombarded and build my base nice and far back until I can get some basilisks. And then I do some counter battery work and artillery their artillery. Build up an army and defend until I'm ready to strike. Unlike the Tau, you can pretty much just move around this map with a well organized death blob as the Space Marines really only have small sorties coming out against you. As always, for this one, I go for the right-hand side of the map first and use a nice armoured column to wipe out the forward base that calls down their orbital bombardments. It goes without saying at this point that basilisks make this easy, although capturing it is a little trickier. But once it's on your side, and I can use their orbital bombardments against them, my victory feels inevitable then it's time to roll on northward and take out their reinforcement forward base. And then sweep back to the centre of the map, watching out for mines. Then I use the central point as a staging ground to take the relic on the left hand side of the map, and also sweep down to the lower left to take out the little forward base overlooking my own. Then the assault on the Space Marine Fortress begins. And so long as you use your artillery and long range radar ability well, the Marines aren't going to give you no trouble in the outer fortress, as it's honestly rather sparsely defended, and I use the Psyker Special ability to disable any Predator tanks that come at me. The inner fortress has some powerful heavy bolter and assault Marine squads, but I can use the orbital bombardment and artillery to neutralize their threat, and other than that, it's a cakewalk. There are some more dramatic words between commanders, a bunch of explosions, and pew 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 pew, and I'm reading my victory paragraphs. Which outline that of course they had to fight because of their contradicting orders, and need to impress the big space emperor. It does mention that even though the Blood Raven spaceship blow up the remains of the fortress, they find some records in the ruins that later lead the Inquisition to investigating the Blood Ravens. So, that's neat. I mean, heretical. Anyway, with them out of the way, I move into position to deal with the Eldar and end turn. I fight off a defence from the Orcs, but it seems the big army outside their doorstep is enough to keep the Eldar from having a crack too. Then it's time to boot the Eldar from the most redundant province and the last non-stronghold province on the map, the Ariel Highlands. As always, skip this if you want, I'm just doing it for completion's sake. I rush my honor guard straight at one of the Eldar bases and wipe it in the first five minutes, and since there's no possibility to play a defensive round on this map, why stop there? I push my rush around to the second Eldar base and wipe that too. Bing, boom, butter, butter. 
Then I end turn and fight off a last ditch attempt by the Eldar to take back a province before I annihilate them. Then it's time to boot them off Kronos for good. As always, the opening Eldar assault can be tricky as they have so many vehicles, but fortunately full honor guard and forward bases gives me the best possible tools to fend them off. After that it's the usual defense and build up, until I push out to the left and assault their closest forward base, then move north and trigger the Eldar's little whoops we teleport our buildings away, here's chaos trick and then proceed to earthshaker the chaos back to the warp they came from. If you're clever, you could honestly use the long range radar and the artillery to drop shells on the Chaos Sorcerer's head as the whole base dies instantly the second the Sorcerer does. Then I collect my bonus Lehman Rust reinforcements and move my army to the middle of the map and wipe out the Elder Webway gates and defense. I keep moving up the middle right where I let the Squigoths out to rampage and soften up the Orcs on top of the hill and then use the Earthshaker rounds to soften them up even further before assaulting their base and taking them out all together and getting my second bonus Lehman Russ. And let me tell you, running quadruple Lehman Russes absolutely rocks. Then it's time to take the perimeter on the outside of the main Eldar fortress and Earthshaker rounds and artillery make wiping out the mass defenses here. Fish, barrel, shooting. And because I never go for the mission objective here and capture and defend the critical points and instead take on the challenge of wiping out the Eldar base entirely, why well, stop there and I earthshake around the hell out of their main base too, which you must have seen coming. Because the guard really do have the easiest time on pretty much every stronghold with earthshaker rounds, then it's just a matter of assaulting what's left, taking on the mega super avatar of Kane. The guard don't have a great answer to the Mega Avatar, seeing as he has stupid amounts of HP. You don't want to be letting vehicles like the Lehman Russ or the Baneblade get into melee with him, but whatever guardsmen are plentiful, just kite him and fix enough guns on him until he goes down, no matter whatever losses you take with your guard squads. Then, it's just a matter of clearing up whatever buildings are left on the map and presto, the paragraphs of the Victorious. They say that the guards actually managed to capture the Farseer, drug her, and hand her over to the Inquisition for interrogation, which is a brutal fate for an Eldar. It mentions how this was actually the reason the guard came to Cronus in the first place before the commanders changed their mind and decided to recapture the entire planet instead, so it calls back to the intro. Then all that's left between me and that goal is to move into position and take the orc stronghold, the easiest and quickest stronghold of all. I'm wondering if you can guess how this goes. Well, apart from surviving the initial orc rush and building up my forces, it goes much like the other maps, except even easier. Do you remember how this map is all about taking out various banners that cause the orc factions to descend into infighting? Well, a well-placed Earthshaker round from well outside each orc encampment is the perfect, most easy strategy for achieving this. Just plop a couple of those bad boys on each banner, take the more of Gork Relic in the centre of the map, and hell, while you're at it, plop a whole bunch more Earthshaker rounds on the Squigoth banner and watch it go crazy, as the base around it changes faction and it doesn't. Then push forward and wipe out Gorguts' camp until the big orc himself goes down. The two paragraphs mention Gorguts escaping, and even goes for some humour. It mentions that a long clean-up of the orc swamp takes place long after the victory. It reveals the Ogrens particularly enjoy hunting the orcs and collecting their skulls, but the Imperials decide that that's not good and the Ogren's Commissar forbades them from doing it, and the Ogrens respond by beating him up. And with that, I get the victory cinematic for the guard. It outlines that after your forces stick around to pacify the planet, they are shipped off to the next conflict, while your governor militant Alexander stays behind to rule out the reconquered world. The tech priests build a bunch of infrastructure and study the big titan gun in Victory Bay. The cinematic ends, 
implying that Governor Militant Alexander will rise to become the imperial ruler of the entire sector of the galaxy. It's rather simplistic and not especially action-packed compared to the others, but probably represents one of the more stable endings in the game, which is about as close to a good ending as you'll ever get in Warhammer 40k. And now, at last, to the final faction for the video and the game. And my favourite faction to play the Dawn of War campaigns with, the Eldar. While Guard are my favourite overall for playing Dawn of War in general because of their scrappy, losses-driven, back-and-forth style of gameplay and just how that speaks to me, the Eldar are my favourite for the campaign because they are just so light, versatile and free in how they go about tackling problems. The Guard have a few answers to most problems, drop artillery on it or throw men and tanks at it. The Eldar have dozens of ways to approach most situations. They have lots of special abilities and the most complicated and interesting synergy. They are the army that has by far the best mobility, speed and stealth, at the expense of their toughness. With a couple of notable exceptions, their units are fragile and go down fast. They are technical as well as requiring good timing and careful planning, with the least forgiveness if you get it wrong. If you get it right with the Eldar, your enemies melt away, as if they are nothing. And if you get it wrong, you will find your entire army trashed almost instantaneously. I have a feeling that in the hands of a good player, they absolutely crush in the multiplayer, but in the hands of a beginner, they won't fly at all. But since I haven't really played multiplayer outside of LAN parties when I was a teenager, I can't confirm this, but let's call it a hunch. Not being a horde army, losses can be painful with the Eldar, and it can be easy to take losses. But thanks to their excellent speed, stealth and mobility, the Eldar maximise their ability to avoid losses too in the hands of a good player. On paper, a lot of Eldar units are the best units in the game, but if not handled well, they might not seem that great. I think you might be getting the picture with the Eldar. They are fiddly and require finesse, brutally effective, but liable to snap like a twig. They need the most micromanagement to be used well, but they are very effective when used this way. The most technical, the least forgiving. Because of their focus on speed and mobility, and Dawn of War's economy that relies on you capturing strategic points around the map, Eldar have an inherent advantage at getting to these points first, or disrupting them early in the game when capturing them. They don't have much of an advantage at holding points in the early game. This means a clever Eldar player can get their economy ahead early, and if they act decisively to take advantage of this, but it also plays into the Eldar's cunning, tricky persona. You might be able to get to a point first, but lose it when your tougher enemy arrives, but because you know this is likely, you might take advantage of the destruction and your speed to have other squads capping other points, or units building interesting surprises in unexpected places, or move units into flanking manoeuvres. It kind of never ends with the Eldar. You might capture some points right outside the enemy base and start contesting them early on, only to lose them on purpose because it bought you the time to capture enough other points on the map, and now your economy is so far ahead you can't lose. That's just a basic example. Many more possibilities open up when we get into some more detail with Eldar units and buildings. Before I do though, I'd like to make note of one special ability that the Eldar can unlock early in the game called Fleet of Foot. Eldar have the fastest infantry normally, but Fleet of Foot makes them really fast. It's a toggle on-off ability that reduces damage and accuracy in exchange for extra speed. It doesn't cost anything to use and can be on indefinitely, but you want it off once engaged in battle, as it does nothing but penalise you in that scenario. But you'll pretty much want it on the rest of the time when traversing the map. Perfect for capping points fast, or retreating out of trouble fast, or getting into position quicker than any other faction could. Once researched, every single Eldar infantry get to use it as an option, so it's less of an optional piece of research and more of a question of when are you going to research it for whatever strat you are running. It's early game research too, so a lot of the time you will be gunning for it out of the gates. 
Their vehicles don't get it, and they are fast enough not to really need it, but it's a great example of what makes the Eldar unique in this game. It's quite micro-intensive. The timing of it matters, so you need to plan its use and skillfully engage it and use it well. Using it well can be the difference between winning and losing. The Eldar commander unit is the Farseer. A bit more of a typical commander unit, more along the lines of the Space Marine Force Commander or the Chaos Lord. A single, powerful unit that can lead a squad or be used on their own. In typical Eldar fashion, the Farseer isn't quite as powerful or tough as the other commanders, although she's still tougher than most normal units, but is the fastest commander and has a whole swath of powerful special abilities. A lot of her powers are unlocked through expensive research upgrades so that she progresses up the tree as the game goes on, and also to prevent her from being OP in the very early game. She isn't going to win in a straight 1 vs 1 against a Force Commander or Chaos Lord, but she isn't going to fold to them instantly either. She's tough enough to do a bit of tanking, but needs a close eye kept on her and a readiness to pull her back once she's fulfilled her role. She can absolutely take anything in the game down, including a Force Commander, Chaos Lord, or Orcish War Boss. But not with Bruce Force directly. As with all things Eldar, you'll need to use synergies with the rest of your army. This may be just some simple kiting and concentrated fire like the Imperial Guard, or it could be a complicated bait and switch ambush flanking manoeuvre relying on special abilities. It all depends. Regardless of the strategy, so long as it isn't direct brute force, the Farseer has the tools to pull it off, so long as you don't leave her on her own to take down a war boss or tank heavy bolt of fire. Mechanically, she has the ability to boost morale recovery when attached to a squad. She can use the aforementioned fleet of foot ability, is prone to disrupting infantry and melee, has the guide ability that lets her increase an Eldar squad's accuracy and damage, she has Psychic Storm, which does damage over time to nearby infantry squads, Mind War, which damages and slows a single target, such as an enemy commander, and Eldritch Storm, which is the Eldar equivalent of an orbital bombardment and is basically a highly damaging AoE nuke that works on everything, including vehicles and buildings. The basic Eldar squad is the Guardian squad. They are ineffective in close combat, but do good range damage and can end up with a lot of useful special abilities. They get fleet of foot and a plasma grenade for some one-off disruption. Compared to tier 1 stealth suits, guardsmen, cultists and space marine scouts, they are quite a powerful early game unit, and thanks to their abilities and upgrades, they can remain useful in the late game. Orc boys will kick their butts if they get into melee, and they can trounce Necron warriors, but also can be trounced by them depending on how many models in a squad, upgrades and tactics. They aren't like cultists or scouts, and more like guardsmen or orc boys in that they remain a useful regular troop throughout all tiers of gameplay that can be factored into a tactic or strategy thanks to their abilities. They can really dish out the damage even against heavy infantry when in large numbers, although they are always fragile. They are quite cheap and once kitted out with a warlock leader, they can get abilities like detecting infiltrated units and entangle which immobilizes an enemy squad or unit for more than long enough for you to gun them down. Next is Ranger Squads, who are fast and have great range and damage against infantry, but a very slow rate of fire. They can use fleet of foot and infiltration and make for great scouts and point cappers, especially behind enemy lines. Like most sniper style units in Dawn of War, they aren't very good at wiping out enemy squads unless in large numbers, but are very good at breaking enemy morale. A useful and versatile support unit, but never going to be the spine of an army. I personally don't often use them, but I see their place in the army list. Howling Banshees are the Eldar's melee specialists. They do great melee damage and are very fast, despite being rather fragile, and they get a howling screeching ability called War Shout that damages enemy morale. They are fantastic at ambushes, and thanks to their speed and fleet of foot, can retreat from a battle and disappear as fast as they can charge in and engage. They are one of the Eldar army's absolute backbone units, but like most Eldar units, be warned, they can get absolutely demolished in seconds if used poorly or not kept an eye on. 
On the other hand, if used well, they are often the linchpin unit in a play that wipes out your enemy army. Especially good at quickly tying up the most dangerous enemy ranged units in melee before they get a chance to become dangerous. Dark Reapers are the Eldar's equivalent to a squad of heavy bolters, long range and high damage. They are quite a bit slower than other Eldar units making the timing of their use essential, but Fleet of Foot makes up for that. They only get 5 models to a squad, but have such good damage against heavy infantry that if they had more they'd be unbalanced. While not quite as essential to most strats as Howling Banshees, they are often my go-to unit for really dealing out the damage to enemy squads, and in large numbers are just as scary as massed heavy bolters. Warp Spiders are the Eldar's answer to Assault Marines, Raptors or Storm Boys, except rather than use a jump pack, they teleport. They aren't as fast as other Eldar units and can't use Fleet of Foot, but two teleports before a cooldown more than makes up for this. They aren't useless in melee, but they aren't really melee specialists. But they have great range damage, even if their range isn't the best. But hey, teleportation, so it doesn't matter. They are rather expensive, but they are so useful that it doesn't matter. They can unlock a haywire bomb ability that lets them do good damage to vehicles and buildings. Their teleportation, being superior Eldar technology, seems to be better than most other factions, as it doesn't involve a cooldown period after where the unit can't attack, and just takes damage for a few seconds, like pretty much every other faction's teleportation in the game does. So, if you're fast on your hotkeys, warp spiders can teleport behind an enemy squad, shred them, haywire bomb the vehicles, and teleport out again before the enemy can organise to hit them back, making them both effective and survivable. If used wrong, They'll die fast of course, but surely you are used to that with the Eldar by now. And I'm not saying the teleport doesn't have a cooldown at all, just that when they actually arrive at their teleport destination, they don't sit around and wait for a few seconds before you can use them, which most other teleports in the games do operate that way. Fire Dragons are the Eldar's specialist anti-vehicle and building units, and are an absolute must-have in any Eldar army. They are like Dark Reapers in that they are a bit slow for Eldar and get low model numbers, but make up for it by doing an absolute boatload of damage and in high numbers they are one of the most dangerous anti-vehicle building units in the game. Their real downside is that they have quite a short range and therefore have to expose themselves to be effective. They do appear to be a little tougher than most Eldar units because of this, but honestly not by much. It's fair enough, if they had the kind of range Dark Reapers have, they'd be so absolutely broken there'd be no point in playing any faction that isn't Eldar. The Harlequin is an Eldar disruption specialist. They dance into battle and basically jump from model to model, knocking them over and being next to impossible to hit while they do it. They can be incredibly annoying and a few of them is a great way to keep an enemy unit basically unable to effectively dish out damage almost like artillery without the artillery. But they can't be attached to squads, and as a single model unit are very prone to dying at the drop of a hat. I don't use them that often myself, but have been on the receiving end of them enough to see how annoyingly effective they can be. They are at their most vulnerable when travelling to and from the fight, as once they are doing their dance, they aren't just hard to hit, but hard for a human player with a mouse to accurately click on, to even target with a special ability, guaranteed to hit them. AoEs or artillery could knock them out of combat at the expense of collateral damage, and they have no effectiveness on opponents that cannot be knocked down. The final Eldar infantry is the reason why I said before, not all Eldar units are fragile, and this is another absolute linchpin of the Eldar army. The Seer Council is a squad of 15 warlocks, and are the Eldar's heavy melee unit. They get all the warlock abilities, and are just absurdly hard to kill, and extremely dangerous against everything they get into melee with. If upgraded with witch blades, even vehicles and buildings have a hard time against them. When the Eldar needs a highly survivable squad to tank damage while Dark Reapers, Warp Spiders or Fire Dragons deal the damage, these are your guys. They are fast and get fleet of foot, tough, do great damage and have good abilities. About the only disadvantage they have is that they are expensive and can't be built until the late game. 
They are undoubtedly one of the best units in the entire game by a long shot. It goes without saying that the Eldar vehicles are beasts. Their transport unit, the Falcon Grav Tank, is hands down the best transport and infantry support unit in the game. Orc trucks, Imperial Guard Chimeras and Tau Devil Fish are also quite good at this, but the Falcon has them beat. Not only can it carry two squads and has great anti-infantry damage, it also isn't that fragile. Especially in the early game. It can be upgraded with the Star Cannon to make it dangerous to heavy infantry, or a Bright Lance making it dangerous to vehicles and buildings. On top of this, it's very fast, and it can jump over obstacles and quite some distance too. Just two Falcons jumping into the back of your base while you are distracted fighting over some strat point can unload enough Fire Dragons to level it in seconds. It really is the closest thing to a does-it-all single unit in the game, and clever use of them can swing a match easily. Of course, in the late game, the armor can't stand up to big heavy weapons like twin-linked las guns or the tower hammerhead's main gun, but they can take a hit or two if you're lucky. And with their jump ability and speed, they have quite a lot of survivability in getting away from targets that can take them down easily. The Viper is a bit like a Space Marine land speeder, a fast light attack vehicle. It has decent anti-infantry weaponry and a missile launcher that causes disruption against enemy infantry. Like the Falcon Grav Tank, it can jump over terrain. Useful as an early game scout and throughout the game as a fast harassment unit. It's not especially good at dishing out damage and quite fragile, only able to stand up to early game infantry but it's really great for blowing infantry off strat points or defensive positions and getting out of there before a counterattack. although it does lose a lot of relevancy by late game. The Wraith Lord is the Eldar's walker unit. This thing's got a bit of everything. It's got a flamer, it's got star cannon, great melee damage, can get a bright lance, and you can build them in large numbers, and they are pretty tough. They aren't as fast or as mobile as other Eldar units, but are faster than most other Walker units in the game. I don't find they have the same survivability as a Space Marine Dreadnought, and nowhere near as much as an Orc Killer can, even if the game's manual says otherwise. But they make up for it by being faster, but otherwise they're roughly equivalent, especially good at taking out vehicles and buildings in close combat. Fire Prism is the Eldar's heavy tank, and behind the Lehman Rust, my second favourite tank in the game. They have the same mobility and speed as a Falcon tank, but are tougher, and boy do they have a more dangerous gun. Their Prism Cannon has great range and hits with a massive area of effect explosion that causes disruption on infantry and good damage on buildings. If hit directly, it can even disrupt vehicles for a moment. They aren't as precise or as heavily armoured as a Space Marine Predator, decked out with LAS cannons, and will lose in a straight up 1v1, but with some good micromanagement, some clever kiting and taking advantage of its jump ability, a Fire Prism can easily win a matchup like that. As part of an army, its hugely damaging disruption can blow apart enemy defensive lines, or death blobs, and renders closely built up bases to rubble very quickly. The fact it can jump over terrain and pop up in surprising places makes it even more deadly. Its biggest drawback is that its AoE damage affects your own troops as well, so it can be a double-edged sword if your melee units are in the fray, but the Seer Council are more than tough enough to cop it. The real risk with the Fire Prism comes when an enemy melee squad is attacking one of your buildings. If that building's on low HP, you're liable to accidentally blow it up yourself with a nearby Fire Prism. The Eldar also get two kinds of oddity units in the game, in the Shuriken and Brightlands platforms. While obviously a kind of mini vehicle, they count as heavy infantry, even though they count towards the vehicle cap. They can be attached to squads and provide either a little bit more anti-infantry or anti-vehicle or building damage, depending on if it's Shuriken or Brightlands. I don't make much use of them myself, but the option to fill a gap in your army is nice. They are great ideas that I think get implemented much better in Dawn of War 2, but it's cool that they are here. 
I just don't think they are really very well realised in this game, and as a result don't get much use. Although, I wouldn't be surprised if someone out there has some strat where they are king. And finally, for the Eldar's relic unit, is the iconic Avatar of Kane. And much like the rest of their stuff, it's very synergistic with their entire army. While it's alive, it increases the squad and vehicle cap, buffs the speed you produce units, and buffs any nearby infantry to be immune to morale damage altogether. It has a huge amount of HP and is an absolute monster in melee, but has the same big disadvantage that all relic units have in that it, he will be the biggest priority target on the battlefield until it's dead, which you use to your advantage for breaking huge defensive lines. But given the buffs it grants, it may be wise to look after the avatar and not risk overextending it until you've got the match sealed making it the only relic unit that disincentivizes you from frontlining it, although that's never stopped anyone in the past. Eldar buildings are also a little special. Well, one Eldar building in particular is very special and is the last very important linchpin of the Eldar army along with their builder unit. The Webway Gate is undoubtedly the crux of the Eldar game plan. It's cheap, it's what increases your pop cap and provides more valid build area. It can be upgraded to heal your units and to cloak itself and any of your buildings nearby it. It can also very slowly warp other Eldar buildings around the map into its build radius. Already a lot of amazing, useful abilities. But much like the Imperial Guard buildings, you can also garrison infantry inside of it and then with a very short cooldown, teleport them to any other webway gate on the map. Combine this with the Eldar Builder unit, the Bonesinger, that has an absolutely massive one-time teleport, the Eldar have access to all sorts of ridiculous strategies. The Bonesinger can also turn off enemy structures for a while using Wraithbone, but that's an ability I almost never use, but is conceivably useful with their huge teleport. Although, given Bone Singers have no real capacity to deal damage or defend themselves at all, that ability is almost always going to be suicide. But hey, a cheap builder unit in exchange for turning off a critical enemy structure at the right moment may be a very good deal. The Webway Gate, on the other hand, underpins everything the Eldar do and makes them the most mobile, stealthy and expansive faction in the game. It's not just that they are the fastest army, they can teleport Bone Singers all over, knock up cheap, invisible webway gates, and then have them nearby to fall back to or pop out of at a moment's notice. They can be incredibly good at locking down lots of strategic points and creating a whole network of webway gates to defend them. It also makes it easy for them to commit large forces on the offense, knowing that they can fall back to their webway gates and teleport back to their bases should it come under attack. It also means that they can sneak one into the back of your base, and just when you think you've got them on the back foot, suddenly they have an entire army destroying your base, and unlike them, you have no way to get back there quickly. This makes them masters of deploying feints to try and lure you into making such mistakes. Given they can teleport structures and cloak them once they've got a webway down, it makes it very easy for them to turn their original base into a feint, or suddenly have a forward base where they didn't have one before, or simply just having a forward reinforcing point just because they have a webway gate parked next to their aspect portal, which is their infantry producing structure. There really is no end to the possibilities, and I can remember more than one land back in the day where the game dragged on for hours while we hunted down every last cloaked Eldar structure hidden in every corner of the map. Well, the Eldar player laughed maniacally from behind their CRT, enjoying our frustration. Which is why it's best to play in the mode where you have to destroy just the enemy's HQ building and not every single structure. The other Eldar structures are typical. A HQ, a generator, turrets, a research structure, listening posts, minefields and a structure for producing infantry and one for making vehicles. The infantry and vehicles each require you to build an aspect stone that then unlocks it just for that structure, which means you can teleport a structure to a forward base that's fully kitted out and ready to produce the best units, or you can send one out to an obscure corner to safely build up. 
They have the usual upgrades and gates to unlock as they progress up the tiers and are otherwise very similar to Space Marine or Chaos or Imperial Guard. Although their buildings are very slender, which makes it easy to cram a lot of them into an awkward area and cloak them with a webway gate. Now to the playthrough. The opening Eldar cinematic basically details that the Eldar have a big stealthy ship hiding at the edge of the planetary system and they flew a sneaky shuttle to a remote frozen part of the planet and erected a big webway gate connected to their big ship that lets them march an entire army onto the planet without being seen. Normally they just manipulate and play games, but since the Necrons are on the planet and the Eldar have some serious concerns about them, they deem that it's all out war time. Since no other faction can be trusted to deal with them, this follows on from the campaign of Winter Assault, the previous expansion to Dark Crusade, and maybe one day I will cover that if you really, really ask me nicely, but now all you need to know is that the Eldar both hate and fear the Necrons so much they've decided to actually mobilise on Cronus, something they almost never do, conquering the entire planet just to make sure the Necrons are beaten so badly they never pop up on Cronus again. And because they are so arrogant, they are sure that none of the other factions are capable of achieving the same thing. Which, if they knew a player was controlling them in a video game, they might not be so quick to assume. But since I am controlling the Eldar, let's just roll with it. So the Eldar are the only faction that can make just the one move out of the gate no matter what. For them, the Tau hold most of the map to the south with five territories and everyone else has four territories except for Chaos, who only get three. The only move that the Eldar can make is to attack the Deem's Northlands held by the Space Marines, which only has a defence rating of one and is a large map so long as I play aggressively. Keep my squads together and push them in the early game, they should be spread far too thin to be able to do much about the speed I can get in their face with. This turns out to be true, and once I have a sizeable army locking them into their base, I fortify the map for future defences, then watch the fireworks fly as I annihilate them. I get two pieces of war gear for this victory and get a veteran ranger honor guard squad. I pick the rune aura for increased health for a generation and the runes of witnessing that reveal infiltrated enemies and increase my ability recharge rate. I end turn and fight no defences because no one is positioned where they can attack me. With my next turn I continue the old reliable opening strat and take the next province on my road to the spaceport. This is the Panrea Lowlands, also held by the Space Marines. This time it's a small map with a defence rating of 3 so I get rushed but my honour guard rangers plus a few guardians concentrated together are enough to fend it off and I press a counter attack on their forward base. Unfortunately, they've got a turret emplacement down, which will make the cost of really bottlenecking them into their base too high with such low armoured infantry. So I focus on getting some fire dragons and warp spiders out in time for the enemy to attack me. When they assault me with a dreadnought, I have the guns to take it down. With their big mid-game push broken and the majority of strategic points under my control, the chances of them being able to out-economy me and field a comparable army is next to nothing, so I'm free to fortify to my heart's content and destroy them at my leisure. Also, economy me is a really funny phrase, <laughs> now I come to think about it. Once I have some heavy armour out, I start my attack and get treated to a great Tier 3 battle, with the enemy even fielding a land raider. Fortunately for them, the Eldar just have all the answers to their assault and they fall back. We have some scrappy back and forth for a while, but in the end, my economy is just too strong and I'm able to keep the pressure up, mostly by spamming Wraith Lords until their backbone collapses and their base starts going down. Then it's just a little bit more fortifying and the province is mine. I get another set of Honor Guard Rangers and end turn. With no counter-attack from the Space Marines and no one else in a position to attack me, I fight no defences and I'm free to go to the Tau held spaceport. The Eldar being so fast have very little trouble. They nab all the servitors well before facing any major enemy forces, so the map ends quickly in my victory. This time on my turn's end, I have to face the Space Marines trying to reclaim the Panrea Lowlands. This is a great time to point out that the Eldar webways 
don't get their infiltration or healing upgrades out of the gates on a defense map. So sometimes your forward bases might be exposed to enemy fire on small maps like this one in the opening minutes. Fortunately, you can use the webways to have troops out and wreaking havoc before they do. And with such huge economic advantage, the enemy is toast in no time, despite it being a two-base assault so early in the game. I win war gear and choose the Witchblade to make my Farseer a bit more deadly in melee. Now, with the spaceport under my control, it's time to go grab Fury, safe in the knowledge that the second move it will earn me will allow me to come back to defend the spaceport. The Eldar really do have a great matchup against the Necrons, when used well. Necrons are just so slow in the early game and weak to concentrated fire from numbers, and the Eldar have such an easy time with their speed taking advantage of this, that so long as I play aggressive, it's very hard to lose this scenario. So long as I remember to fall back and regroup whenever the Necrons start getting some kills, there's no way for them to hit the 70 kills before I do. And when I do hit the 70, I have only taken 8 losses to them. A 70 to 8 KDR is pretty good in my book. With the unbeatable meta strat secured for the Eldar and no immediate threats to the spaceport, I use my second move to grab the Seer Council Honor Guard from the Chaos Held Rian Jungle. The reason I want to do this is because the Seer Council really are the biggest gun of a unit any faction in the game can boast. They are so durable, so versatile, I want to prioritise getting them early. It really hammers home how completely ripped off Space Marine and Chaos are in their honour guard. Like the Eldar get a whole Seer Council squad and Space Marines on Chaos just get single buffed models. It's not even remotely fair. So I kite the opening Chaos Rush into defeat, then I focus on getting out Warp Spiders and a Seer Council early, and just capping the map to out economy Chaos. When the Chaos Assault comes to break out of their base, I fall back after taking some losses and then pop my Warp Spiders and Seer Council out, who turn the tide and slaughter them once they just appear amongst them. Damn, it feels good to pull off Eldar strategy well. They often seem like they're losing when really they have it completely under control. Then I produce the Avatar of Cain to give my whole economy and population cap that extra edge and at this point I know I've sealed the deal and all there is to do is fortify until I'm ready to take them out. Some fire prisms, dark reapers, fire dragons later and this is what it looks like when the Eldar are coming for you. With them out of the way, I get some war gear and choose the Wraithbone armor to make my Farseer a little more durable. I end turn and have to fight no defenses this round and I decide, fuck it. Chaos have no provinces left and I'm in the perfect position to take them down, so I go for their stronghold nice and early. A strat I highly recommend doing if you want your campaigns to go a bit quicker. The opening rush is nice and weak, because I've attacked them so early. It's like a marine squad, a corn berserker and some cultists, and while it still requires some restraint to avoid losses, I have little trouble dealing with it. I do the usual camp and build up my base and army, making sure to build a massive defensive line on the eastern side of my base. Then once I'm built up, I use some falcons and fire prisms to jump over the chasm into the chaos forward base to the north. But the Bloodthirster shows up, so I retreat. It doesn't take long until the Bloodthirster's thirst gets the better of it, and when it decides to attack my defences, I jump my Warp Spiders and Grav Tanks back into the base and wipe out their HQ. Their Bloodthirster falls back to try and deal with it, but it's too late, the cracks in their defences are open and weeping now. I fall back one last time, and the Bloodthirster predictably comes running and goes down against my defensive line. With the brute taken care of, there's nothing to stop me jumping my troops in and wiping out the rest of their forward base, and thus begins my march across the west side of the map toward the relic where the prisoners are waiting to be freed. I set up my army on the hill outside the relic base, and they've got another bloodthirster on the field. 
Fortunately, without my own base to simultaneously defend from it, I'm free to just tie it up with my seer council and concentrate my whole army's fire on it. Then I'm free to storm the base and the prisoner and relic are mine before a chaos cultist can say, please whip me with the barb chain master. With the relic secured, I can pump out the avatar and build a forward base of my own at the relic. Then use that as a staging ground to assault the center of the map with fire prisms and falcons stuffed with fire dragons and shut down the annoying blood pulse gimmick. With that secured, I use the same falcon and fire prism combo to assault the vehicle heavy verge outside of the chaos main base. As always, ignoring the entire right side of this map as it's a waste of time. I have to fall back once, but then my main army can move up. Then there's nothing left to do except for the big assault. And I use a pincer movement led by the avatar on one side and the fire prisms on another to tank most of the damage while my army wipes out their highly dangerous units. It's a glorious battle for a moment, but as always, when a plan comes off with the Eldar, they go down like butter under a blowtorch. I destroy the gate and I get to taste my first two victory paragraphs for the Eldar. The paragraphs say Eldar hate the Chaos almost as much as the Necrons. You know, because of the whole Slanesh thing. After they kick their asses, they paint giant kilometers long cleansing runes out of fire that you can see from orbit to, well, cleanse the area. That's pretty cool. I get some war gear and go with the singing spear to give my Farseer good damage against any target armored or otherwise. Then back on the world map, I still have a move left, and with none of my key territories directly under threat, I attack the Arceria Forest to get me that sweet increased manpower bonus. As always, this tiny Necron-held map is very easy to simply rush and lock down their base while I turtle my way to heavy fortifications. General tip prioritize Necron scarabs and power plants, seeing as there's nothing you can do about their unit-producing HQ if you want to maximize turtle time. I end turn and fight off the Space Marines at North Vandia. With no other defences on my turn, I notice that my other favourite faction to take out early has lost all of their provinces and I barely had anything to do with it. So I move to North Vandia with my first move and attack the Tau Stronghold with my second. Well on the way to a fast wrap up of my final campaign here on Cronus. The initial rush from Tau is a lot less than a late game assault would produce. It's still one of the hardest ones to fight off with a small honor guard. Luckily, I have the Seer Council, and I waste no time in making sure that maxing out their models is a priority. Then, they attack with a pincer maneuver with Skyray gunships, battlesuit, fire warriors, pathfinders, and crew. But I don't panic. My HQ is more than enough HP to weather this storm, and by focusing on one side of their attack and then the other, taking advantage of my Farseer's singing spear which can damage armor, I am able to avoid losses and take down their opening rush. It's important when your forces are so weak not to split them up to preserve the ability to concentrate damage and utilize my beefy buildings to split the tower's damage instead. With that out of the way, I do the base building and the army arming, and soon I'm ready to strike out and take down the troublesome Tau stronghold. I take a little sortie of two fire prisms, the Farseer, a warp spider squad, and a bone singer for healing my fire prisms, just to cause some trouble. The Farseer can detect stealth suits, and the warp spiders have no problems teleporting to their hard to reach spots and taking them out. The fire prisms provide the heavy building toppling firepower, and thanks to their range, even the Tau relic unit, the Greater Narlak, is a solvable problem with a small force. Soon I've wiped out one of the three in a ring of Tau forward positions, and started the first of my own ring of webware gates, which will allow me to counter anything the Tau throw at me anywhere. Now, rather than concentrate on getting rid of the rest of those forward positions, I'd rather get rid of those very annoying Greater Narlax and Crutoxes. So I use a webway to position an army on this normally inaccessible bombed out building and attack their Kaon Quarter, based over here in the east. Using the Warp Spider's Haywire grenades to put a dent in their heavy armor before moving my fire prisms up. With that base gone and my own webways in place, I then jump up onto the burnt out building into the middle of the map 
and use another webway to get my army into position up there too, and use that to launch an assault on the Tau inner ring, forward base in the middle. And from there, take out the last inner ring base in the west. Then I clear out the buildings and alleys with the Warp Spider Farseer Seer Council combo, and then attack the Montcar based in the northwest. This is probably the easiest and most masterfully the Tau defense has come undone, other than, you know, lol Imperial Artillery, or lol Orc Death Ball, or lol Necron Grim Reaper. Eldar have lots of great answers to all the Tau problems when you know what you're doing with them, especially as so many of the Tau problems are just a few units standing in hard to reach places, and the Eldar are the masters of appearing in hard to reach places. All that's left beside the main fortress is the relic base in the dead centre of the map, which by this point I just outright assault. I lose a warp spider squad this way, but hey, easy to replace with so many nearby webways. Then it's time to go hunt down that ethereal and boot the tower from the game. I jump my fire prisms into the bottom of their fortress and back them up shortly after with warp spiders. And then seer council. With a bit of space cleared, I build a webway gate, and that seals the deal. As now my whole army is in their inner fortress without having to charge up their very well defended stairs. Chaos ensues, but now I have somewhere to fall back to without losing ground. It's only a matter of time until the defences are overwhelmed and the ethereal is toast. The Eldar turning the hardest map into the game into a breezy, technical whirl. No wonder I enjoy playing them so much. The two paragraphs outline how once the Eldar kill the Ethereal, they just wait for the Tau to withdraw and then abandon the city, where a bunch of the humans decide to get revenge on the Tau and end up setting the whole city on fire, and the Eldar just don't give a fuck. They here on a mission, not to add a city to an empire they don't have. I end turn and fight no defences. But the Imperial Guard have moved into position to assault the spaceport, very worrying. But I have two moves this turn, so I decide to snap up a choice bit of Honor Guard and nab me a Wraith Lord by taking out the Orc Heldrian Floodlands down here. At this point, I have the Honor Guard to fall back on the old Russian Bottleum and Fortify, so not much to say, as with only one opponent on the map, it goes without a hitch. This territory being next door to the Orc Stronghold, I know I'm going to fight a few defences here, as it's my habit not to attack the Orc Stronghold till last, so I make sure to build lots of webway gates in little corners of the map that might give me quite the advantage in later engagements. Then, it's HQ bulldozing time, and the province is mine. Then I use my second move to attack the guard mustering outside the precious spaceport in the Oriston Plains. I rush them this time, and have to fall back once I encounter some serious resistance, but I'm able to re-engage them, draw them out of their base and pick off their hellhound. This becomes a bit of a scrappy, endless back and forth on the verge of their base for some time, but it does keep them locked down while I get a few strat points capped until they spill out round the back way and force me to withdraw all together. Then it becomes more of a scrappy back and forth between our two bases, and to be honest, if the AI had rushed me with all they got at this point, they would have won. Fortunately, we just clash and withdraw a couple of times, while I'm able to get a few more structures out and advance up my tech tree. Once I've got some warp spiders on the field, suddenly their massed infantry has a lot of their advantages evaporate. Soon after that, I've got Wraith Lords and Falcons on the field, and I'm back at the doorstep of their base, giving them a hard time. Then I get some Fire Prisms and the Avatar out and catch them in a two-pronged attack. While they make me fall back on one front, I take out a bunch of their base on the other. Then, when they turn to deal with that, I try and hit them in the back with my Fire Prisms, but find that they've built a huge amount of defences and have a ridiculous massed army. The Guard really doing what they do best here. So I need to hold the line a bit longer while I get out troops to deal with that, including Harlequins and Dark Reapers. When they finally attack me and try and break out of the pincer I have them surrounded with, my economy is too strong and I'm able to pump out Wraith Lords at one end from nearby support portals and hammer them with my main army at the other. And this finally marks the end of our stalemate and I start carving out their army and wiping their structures. The province is next to the Space Marine Stronghold, so I take my time turtling out and fortifying what I haven't already before landing the killing blow. With that taken care of, I end turn and fight off the Space Marines from the Panrea Lowlands again and get myself some more war gear. 
I pick the Runes of Warding, which protects against ranged attacks and increases the Farseer's health. With no more defences, it's my turn again, and I attack the Murad Swampland to get some sweet Warp Spider Exarchs. My opening rush cripples them, and this one is straightforward, and I just wipe their HQ because I don't even expect to have to ever defend this province with Chaos wiped from the map. With my second move, I attack the Vandian coast to secure me that amazing industrial production bonus, another province I'm not planning on having to defend. I rush the Space Marine base and turn it into firewood in no time. Then I wheel back to defend my own base before pursuing my enemy into the north part of the map. And before I know it, I've collected enough power to fulfill the mission objective and won the day. I end turn and fight no defences. Next, I move to attack the Pavonian Heartland, and my honor guard at this point is wiping the enemy base on my initial rush with very little resistance, as I have a decent spread of anti-vehicle and heavy melee units. Then I camp outside their second base until I have a good army and powerful economy. With most of the map fortified, it's time and I get a spectacular battle. Whoa, would you look at that? Oh my god. God, I love this game when it's in full swing. This is such a cool fight. It comes to an end where my Wraith Lords simply stomp past it all and wipe their HQ, which they didn't seem to be trying very hard to defend. Ah well, that's old school AI for you. So next up, it's time to take the infamous Hyperion Peaks. The Eldar don't get a bad spread at all, with three whole Seer Councils if you've got an Honor Guard, an Avatar, four Wraith Lords, and two Falcons. They have the tools to actually be especially effective on this map. Although, I'd warn you not to tackle it until you have the two Honor Guard Warp Spider Exarch squads like I do. I use them to immediately teleport and use Haywire Bombs to take out the Orc Mech Shop while I simultaneously jump my Fire Prisms and Vipers into the back of one of the other Eldar bases to wipe out the production buildings in there. Don't forget to jump your Warp Spider Exarchs out again before they get killed. In the meantime, I move the rest of my army to hold the center critical point, using the Falcons to get the Seer Council squads there ASAP. Then I jump my Warp Spider Exarchs into the base again and wipe out Du Bois Hut before getting them to join the army in the center. Then I charge my Avatar and Wraith Lords into one base and then the other to wipe their HQs leaving only production buildings in the Southern Relic base to deal with. This is where the Warp Spider Exarchs come in handy again, Haywire bombing each production building in that base and warping out before they can be killed. Having repaired my Fire Prisms after their initial assault, they then jump into the base and with the help of the Seer Councils they wipe the remaining HQ. And after that the map is nothing but leisurely clean up. There's definitely still Orc units on the map, but with no way to replace them, when they die, I'm free to engage them on my own terms with no fear of being overwhelmed. Eldar honestly have one of the easiest times on this map if you take advantage of their mobility like this. I have a feeling if you tried to brute force it and death blobbed in on this difficulty, you would be overwhelmed by the green tide and dead in no time. I make sure to build listening posts on every strat point before I destroy the final orc building, as there is a chance I may fight a defence here, and it's an awkward map to play defence on, as the listening posts is the only structure you are allowed to build on this first play. Then I blow the last building, and that's a win. I end turn and fight off the orcs in the Rian Floodlands and the guard in the Pavonian Heartland, where I win war gear, and pick the gauntlets of Isha, which increase ability recharge rate and health. Then I decide to use my two moves to move into position and then attack the Space Marine Stronghold as they are out of provinces as well, so I may as well knock them out of the game. Because I have forward bases from the Hyperion Peaks, I start the map with turrets, power and research facility and an aspect portal. This puts me and my Honor Guard army into a great position to defend their opening rush and it goes down with minimal fuss. I caught the Marine Stronghold early enough that the defense score wasn't high enough for artillery units to be bombarding me from the get-go. Big win there. But if it was being bombarded, those Warp Spider Exarchs and their Haywire Bombs would deal with it quickly. It's a rather relaxed time building up my base and forces as the Marines just don't throw that much at you. 
I sortie out with fire prisms and my warp spiders to soften up my enemy positions before bringing in falcons loaded with fire dragons and my regular warp spiders to get the jump on the space marine forward base with the orbital relay. With that base and the orbital bombardment power under my control, I move forward and attack the reinforcement position, which barely even puts up a fight. Then I sweep the minefield on my way to taking out the strat point in the centre of the map, and then assault the forward support base just to the north of my own before turning around and assaulting the relic position from the rear by jumping my forces in. Even Terminators and a Chaplain go down fast to good Eldar force composition. Then I assault the Outer Fortress, just taking my time, taking out the Well Space Marine defences, and being careful not to stray too close to the Inner Fortress, and to hit any super dangerous heavy bolter squads with the borrowed orbital bombardment if I do. Then it's the Inner Fortress's turn, and it's a spectacular battle, but it doesn't really last that long. And before I know it, their HQ is down and I have my victory paragraphs. They tell me that the Eldar steal any chapter relics the Space Marines don't destroy, and then go out of their way to burn the corpses of any fallen Space Marines, which really pisses the Space Marines off, because that means they can't claim the gene seed back and replenish their numbers. I'm not exactly sure why the Eldar do this, but it's probably just insurance. They take the opportunity to cripple any Space Marine chapters when they can, just so they are weaker in the future. That's my best guess. Maybe someone out there knows better. I win a massive three bits of war gear for this victory, which are the remaining bits I don't have. I get the Ghost Helm, which increases ability, recharge rate and health, the Shuriken Pistol and the Twin Shuriken Pistol, which increase range damage. I end turn and fight off the Imperial Guard at the Pavonian Heartland but nobody else. It's interesting that the Necrons haven't attacked me once, despite the fact I hold so much territory on the map. Then I decide to attack the Agamar Desert, held by the Orcs. My rush does its job and one of the Orcs HQ is down in no time. I'm expecting to fight defences on this map as it will be locking the Orcs into their stronghold. I rush the choke point outside the second base and take my sweet time building a nice big turtle fortress. Once I'm satisfied that any future attacks will be very easy to swat away, I assault their remaining base. And boom, that's some dead orcs. I'm not sure what happens to my two moves here. I must have accidentally skipped one or something. I couldn't figure it out from my footage, but I end turn, fight no defences, and get a fresh two turns anyway. I attack the Western Barons, which has 10 defence score and is held by the Necrons who have apparently been spending all game just fortifying their couple of pieces of desert in the middle of the map. I weather their initial rush and build up my forces because it's the Necrons and they are kind of slow so I've got a bit more time than usual too. I assault their first base and it's a hell of a battle and I take some losses but come out on top. You really got to watch out for those pariahs, they are one hell of a unit. Still. Eventually, I overcome them and blow their monolith HQ. Then it's the same tired old story of me being the Turtle King, and I crush the remaining base when I'm good and ready, and get some nice Howling Banshee Exarchs. Then I use my second turn to kick the Orcs out of the Janus Savannah. This is a nice small map, so one big rush and the Orcs' first HQ is dead. The second rush is just as effective, and before I know it, I've got a shiny new Viper in my army. I end turn. Rebound the Orcs off the Agamar Desert, the Guard off the Pavonian Heartland, and then on my turn, assault the Necron at the Vandemar Mountains. Another small map, this means old Rushy Rushy is very effective, and I think because it's time for the Necrons to say goodbye, I don't even bother to build anything and simply assault their second base as well. It's a bit scrappy, but I come out on top and then Monolith is ash before you can say Timbuk 2 and I have me another new Viper. Then it's time to boot them from the game for good, and I attack their stronghold. With such powerful honor guard, their opening attacks don't amount to much, and I take my time erecting a lovely base. I use a webway gate and some warp spiders to skip a bunch of terrain, and assault the monolith graveyard to the south of the starting base before even leaving it properly. And with a webway gate erected in it, I soon have an army methodically reducing it to ash. With that out of the way, I attack the centre of the map next, to reclaim the relic without even having to deal with one of those pesky Necron Beacon Power Pillar things. God, I love the Eldar. 
Then I push the little path to the southwest corner with fire prisms and wipe the beacon and turrets there. Then because I'm going for completeness, I double back towards my base and take out the darkness beacon on the hill and continue to push toward my own base and take out the resurrection beacon that's right out the front of it. Then, after a bit of mucking about, I attack the one in the southeast that takes over vehicles. After a bit more cleaning up around the map, then it's time to take out the Necron Fortress. And down goes one awakened monolith, and then the other. Then, all that's left to do is plant the bomb and get out of there. Which, thanks to the elaborate Eldar webway gates, is as easy as it comes. The two paragraphs are three paragraphs this time. Outrageous. They are shorter than the usual ones, however. They say that the Eldar accidentally bury a bunch of their own troops when the cavern collapses on the Necrons, which I find hard to believe given their webway. Farseer Taldir leads the recovery effort herself and they uncover an ancient Necron tomb with the remains of truly ancient Eldar artifacts from their original war with the Necrons, way back in prehistory, presumably when the Eldar were young Dar and the Necrons were alive Rons. Apparently, despite defeating the Necrons, these artifacts are the motivation the Eldar need to continue to conquer Cronus, lest the Necrons rise anew on this world, which makes no sense, but whatever, it's mid-2000s Warhammer video gaming, so it gets a pass. I end turn, fight off the guard on the Pavonian Heartlands, and decide it's time for them to get off Cronus too, and move into position to take their stronghold by attacking the Mariah Coast. My rush has their first base shredded in the opening few minutes, and because I'm booting them from the game, I rush their second HQ as well, and it lasts about as long. Then it's time for the guard to get the boot in Victory Bay. Their opening assault gets absolutely shredded, and in no time my base and army are a thing of glory. I start sortying out with my fire prisms and warp spiders, then it's time to push north to the base across the river. Once that's cleared, I sweep my army through the Titan Cannon Trench and take the Western Guard base from the rear. With it destroyed, I'm safe to flank the Guard artillery positions. With them destroyed, it seems I decide to skip the air support and Baneblade base in the bottom southwest of the map, and instead just jump the trench and attack the Titan Cannon Power Base in the northwest. I kill the Commissar keeping the Rebellious Guard in check, and they flip to my side. Then I take over the power grid and take the Titan gun for myself. With that under control, I do decide to take out the Guard Air Command and Beyblade production after all, as their strafing run ability is very, very annoying. And following on from that, the little defensive outpost at the mouth of the bridge. Then it's showtime and I go for the final assault, crossing the no man's land and attacking their Baneblade defending the entrance to their last fortress. With that disposed of, I warp some of my structures outside their base and start spamming Wraith Lords at them to wear them down. Then it's time for an all out assault and despite their best efforts, the guard did not last long. The two paragraphs touch a little on something that happened in the previous expansion Winter Assault and explain that the Eldar go to town blowing up the Titan gun just to keep the Imperium from getting their stinky banana covered Mon K hands on it. With that done, I end turn, fight no defences and all that's left is the Orcs. I start with the Aerial Highlands and its skippable redundant power. Yeah. This goes like the last couple. My Honor Guard rush wipes their first HQ, then it's just a race to wipe their second HQ, whole thing's over in less than eight minutes. Then I use my second move to move into the stronghold attacking position. In turn, thank the gods I don't have to fight a defense and make my final assault for Dark Crusade and for the video. The opening orc assault is summarily dispatched by my troops and the obligatory build-up goes off without a hitch. My warp spiders make a dramatic exit from my base to their forward base, and guess how I'm going to take out the orc banners this time? That's right, warp spider in, haywire bomb the banner, warp spider out. This takes them down cleanly and with little effort. I'll save showing you all of them. Then I assault the Noor of Gork with the relic at the centre of the map, and the Eldar really get to show off their superior firepower and tactics in this battle. Wow, would you look at that go. Just sitting back in awe at all the fun sink kills and stuff happening. What a game. I bomb the remaining banners, 
and watch the Squigoth get to work before deciding it's too slow and taking it down myself. Then all that's left for Dark Crusade is the final assault on Gorgard's last remaining base. The two paragraphs explain that after the Eldar leave, they leave behind just some rangers and a warlock who proceed to assassinate any powerful orc chieftains that emerge and give poisonous advice to any remaining clans so that they fight amongst themselves and never Wah! again. The final Eldar cutscene explains that, despite our previous paragraph saying otherwise, that they just vanish, all of them, after the successful conquest. They return to their ship and leave the system. It says their actions ensure the place remains a chaotic, small-time backwater for centuries, and that perhaps that was always their intention, to thwart the possible warlords who might have used Cronus as a launching point to conquer parts of the galaxy from, which is fair enough, because that's what most of the other factions winning cinematic describes them doing. So good on you, Taldir. Maybe this is the happy end. I'll let you decide on that. And that, my friends, is victory with every faction in Dark Crusade. I believe, canonically, the Blood Ravens won, which is no surprise with the Space Marines being the old poster children of Warhammer, but personally, I like the Eldar victory the most, as I love the idea of them kicking everyone's ass and then just pissing off and leaving the place trashed so that it becomes part of the interplanetary boonies for centuries. It appeals to me as the funniest of all the conclusions. Gotta love that Eldar arrogance. In conclusion to this massively long, boring and gushing video, Dawn of War rocks. It opened up my eyes to how 3D could benefit RTS. And while it never fully exploited the differences between a 3D rendered world and a 2D one, it certainly went part of the way there. For example, differences in elevation and terrain being able to be exploited by teleportation or jump pack units. Even if the game is full of jank where models shoot through hills and other objects, where later 3D strategy titles would explore that line of sight layer as an extra tactical gameplay element. Where the game ushered us into the world of 3D strategy was in its presentation above all else. The care and love poured into the models, the animations, the textures, and just every little detail is exquisite and puts the game to me in the same ballpark as early Total War titles, Warcraft 3, and the Homeworld series in terms of the late 90s, early 2000s transition from 2D to fully 3D strategy. Dawn of War, more than any other title, for me at least, brought together all the elements of its presentation and delivery to hit me with a package so compelling I can't put it down to this day. Every moment of this game is just dripping. Whether it's the fonts used, the little imperial sayings down in the bottom left-hand corner of the main menu, the incredible sounds, voice acting, writing and music that set a standard for Warhammer 40,000 games that is still echoing today, and not just the aforementioned models and animations, but the extra mile touches, thought and care that goes into each faction having different HUDs and ways their buildings deploy and construct. The little touches like screaming souls being visible in chaos power plants or the snotlings crawling around inside the orc pile of guns. Or just the fact that the orc's classic research building is a pile of guns. It's stuff like this that really sells the experience of the game and the good feelings it brings. It feels like almost nothing was overlooked and even the things that aren't accurate and don't quite match Warhammer, like the Bolters or the Blood Ravens relics or the incongruities of the cavern level, even those feel like loving compromises made so the technology and constraints of game development at the time could facilitate a better experience for the player. Stuff like the army painter, the skirmish mode, the multiplayer, it all says that we respect that one of the things that makes Warhammer 40k so compelling is that you get to come in and use your own imagination and do your own thing with it 
and that they want to, in some limited degree, provide you with a way to war game with your friends like you might at an old game store. The development team here had a clear vision and ethos, and when they set out to make a Warhammer 40k game, they were going to make the finest damn 40k game that could be made at the time. As mentioned at the start of the video, I certainly would not begrudge anyone who said it wasn't the best 40k video game these days, but for the better part of a decade, there was nothing even remotely in the same ballpark for quality 41st millennium entertainment. Even if you were to somehow magically strip the Warhammer 40,000 away from this game, it would still be one of the best strategy titles of the noughts. And in my view, it in every way holds up beautifully to this day. Dawn of War feels like an army of miniatures where every individual model has been cradled in hands and had every skerrick of detail examined, painted, touched up and finished. It's had quirky custom hot glue sprue, green stuff and spare parts modifications grafted on in the name of fun and a greater vision. It's like sitting down at the tabletop and gazing down on a cohesive painted army where every single model is not 100% perfect, but when taken as a whole, communicates such a powerful, unique, passionate personality and character that it just sings out to you. It says it's time to pick up some dice and play, and that you don't care too much what the outcome is, because there will be such joy to be had in the dance of life and death of the little models as they battle in the grim dark future of war, that you just can't wait to set them all up and do it all again. There's just honest to goodness fucking love and passion here. And when you find it so palpable, it is timeless. And I implore anyone that it is worth trading their time for. I have traded so much of mine to make this video just because it has been so worth it to me. I've never played the tabletop game for real, but in its own way, the magic at the heart of the now titanic phenomena that is Warhammer 40,000 has touched me too because of this game, and I am so much the better for it. Dawn of War stands atop a pile of games, maybe not as the greatest ever, but as one of the most worthwhile. Games for the game god, fun for the fun throne. Thanks for listening. I'll see you for part two, Soulstorm.